To properly frame what happened in Afghanistan after September 11, two military campaigns must be divorced despite their proximity in time, Operation Enduring Freedom, which brought about the fall of the Taliban in 2001, and Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003, which toppled Saddam Hussein. For unlike the Iraq War, the war against the Taliban was not yet under the influence of the neocons and what the 2002 U.S. security strategy called their American internationalism. Neither Operation Enduring Freedom, which was declared over in 2014, nor the International Security Assistance Force, or ISAF, which began from 2001 to 2014 as a NATO stabilization mission for the Gross Round Kabul region, pursued the goal of creating an Afghan nation. Operation Enduring Freedom, which at its peak involved as many as 70 nations and whose areas of operation extended beyond Afghanistan to the Philippines, Somalia, or the Horn of Africa and the Sahara, was preceded in the case of Afghanistan by some 30 unsuccessful U.S. requests to the Taliban since 1996 to extradite Osama bin Laden. These requests represent the fact that, despite the uncompromising announcement after September 11 that it would no longer distinguish between terrorists and their harbors, the Taliban was never viewed or treated as an enemy on par with al-Qaeda. The fact that Operation Enduring Freedom did not operate as Operation Infinite Justice, as planned, also indicates that the United States did not want to completely antagonize the Taliban and other radical Islamic regional powers from the beginning. As early as September 26, 2001, the New York Times reported, Islamic scholars complained that only God was capable of dispensing infinite justice, and administration officials feared that allies in the Middle East would take offense, September 26, 2001. This kowtowing to Islam names a fundamental birth defect of all American efforts after September 11. Even the neocons agreed that the terms terror and Islam should be kept as vague as possible. Already in his first two keynote speeches to the U.S. Congress on September 14 and 20, 2001, George W. Bush set the tone. The enemy was, not a single political regime or person, not a religion or ideology, but, terrorism, and it was at home everywhere in the world, in North America as well as in South America, in Europe as well as in Africa, the Middle East and throughout Asia. With the mention of South America at the latest, it became clear that the concept of terror should also include groups such as the Colombian FARC, which operated in a country and on a subcontinent that is in any case not Islamic. The axis of evil, propagated a few months later accordingly also included the largely isolated North Korea, in order to absolutely put a non-Islamic villain at the side of the Islamic states Iraq and Iran. In his speech of September 20, 2001, Bush made it clear who was explicitly not meant as an enemy. Groups such as Al-Qaeda had perverted the peaceful teachings of Islam through a fringe form of Islamic extremism, which was tantamount to a betrayal of one's own faith and had to be seen as an attempt to hold Islam hostage. This unwillingness to define the enemy is not only due to the pragmatic motive of not completely turning the Islamic world against itself and keeping rentier states like Saudi Arabia in line. It also goes back to a fundamental moment of American self-image, according to which the idea of freedom and the pursuit of individual happiness are central guiding principles in every religion. After September 11, this belief in the equality of all religions turned out to be both a weakness and a strength of U.S. society. The inability to imagine Islam as anything other than a variety of Christianity and its secular practices clashed with the idea that the idea of individual freedom and happiness as a universal one should also take hold of the masses in the Islamic world. In his speech of September 20, President Bush asked the question, why do they hate us, to which a wrong answer and an ineffectual strategy had to be given because Islam as the central cause of this hatred was not allowed to come up. This is testified by an episode from Konstantin Schreiber's 2019 book, Children of the Quran. Schreiber had examined teaching materials from various Islamic countries and also took on an Afghan textbook for 10th grade entitled, Interpretation of the Holy Quran, which was published in 2011. According to the imprint, the Afghan Ministry of Education was responsible as publisher. Until the Taliban took power in August 2021, the ministry was responsible for a country in which, according to figures for 2018, only about half of all those working as teachers even had the official qualification to do so and 83% of all women are illiterate, in the population as a whole, the rate is 69%, right from the first chapter, which is entitled, Man was not created in vain, Schreiber says, it strikes me that the Muslim God is portrayed as an angry God. He demands accountability, he punishes. 
Whoever invokes another god besides Allah, for whom he has no proof, will give account to his Lord, it says. These threats are a common thread throughout the book. Another lesson of the textbook particularly irritates me. It is about the Surah al-Baqarah, verses 42-46, about the topic of truth and falsehood, and about open antisemitism. For in the interpretation of the verses it says, especially the Jews, who had known about the right, but on the basis of prejudice and revenge changed the right in order to prevent people from the right way, by covering up the right and mixing it with void things, knowing that the truth is that which Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, brought. In the book of religion there are also references to secular life, to the state and to society. In the back, in the chapter, Trust and its meaning in Islam, I notice a passage, for this, Allah Almighty commands the believers to obey and follow their commanders and their Muslim rulers. But if the command and judgment of the commanders and the rulers are against the law of God, no one is allowed to obey or follow them. There is no separation between state and religion, otherwise I cannot understand this passage. Muslim leaders are to be obeyed as long as their orders are in accordance with Islam. So Muslims do not have to follow non-Muslim leaders anyway. Further, I am struck by the fact that the texts are repeatedly about the sublimity of Muslims vis-a-vis the infidels. In his final verdict on the content of the textbook, Schreiber states, it divides the world into good and bad, and good are the Muslims and bad the others. Overall, I wonder how such a textbook can be used in the classroom at all. From the way it is laid out, it is designed for a teacher or a student to read the book aloud and for the others to listen and internalize it. Transfer tasks, discussions, classifications that explain to me the meaning of the religious texts for life here and now do not take place de facto. If a student is exposed to these texts not only once, but over and over again, then one must be very consolidated and also well informed about sources outside of school, so that something of the crude religious content does not stick. As a teenager, I attended a Catholic school for nine years. The teachers there were nuns, priests, but also lay people. My school experience was above average conservative by German standards. We also learned the basics of the Muslim faith, also read in the Quran. We were all surprised at how difficult it was to understand. We had expected the Quran to be more like the Bible, a book full of stories. And I can't remember a single situation in which we were told that we had to proselytize people and be afraid of God. Religious education, and that was 25 years ago now, did much more for us than the exposition of Christian dogmas. The book from Afghanistan does not mention Christians at all. If we had been presented with something like that in my school days, we would have given the teacher a pretty uncomfortable time. Our parents would probably have run up a storm. Schreiber 2019, page 13ff and page 39f. No one knows how many Afghans and thus also so-called local forces coming to Germany have been indoctrinated with the help of this textbook at state-run Afghan schools, where so-called Islamic education does not have the status of religious instruction taught once a week, but is a central part of the curriculum as a main subject. Since the content of this work hardly differs from what is preached in most mosques around the world and is thus also the doctrine of IS and Al-Qaeda, the question arises as to how something like this could be published by an Afghan Ministry of Education ten years after the fall of the Taliban, a ministry that one would have thought, under Western curatorship, would have had other goals than to shape state schools along the lines of a madrasa, where compliant Quranic students are bred who hardly differ in thought and action from a Talib, literally, knowledge seeker, knowledge seeker, in thought and action. At the very least, it explains why, despite talk of the radical Islamic, Taliban, not only does no one know what this designation is supposed to stand for, but why people act as if the Taliban were an Islamic industrial accident that had nothing to do with the teachings of the legislating and punishing Allah. Apparently, no one had a problem with the fact that the proclaimed new and modern Afghanistan had to call itself an Islamic Republic, of all things. When the Ministry of Education of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan is the publisher of a manual on jihad, the suspicion is obvious that, from the West's point of view, nothing really failed in Afghanistan, because no serious attempt was made to build something that could have failed in the worst case. This suspicion was substantiated by Konstantin Schreiber, who researched who had commissioned the textbook and who contributed to its financing. 
The results of his research testify to institutionalized disinterest in the future fate of the Afghan population, for which the term aid from the international community has become generally accepted, and in Germany in particular, the term networked approach. An initial inquiry by Schreiber to the German Society for International Cooperation, GIZ, revealed that while the GIZ is largely responsible for the training of Afghan teachers, the donor of textbooks in Afghanistan is UNESCO. An inquiry there led to the conclusion that UNESCO was not responsible for such financing. On the internet, Schreiber came across a UNESCO statement from 2002, which stated that a trust fund had been set up for Afghanistan in cooperation with Germany to finance the modernization of textbooks and the renewal of curricula for around 3 million students. Because no one at UNESCO headquarters or the German branch knew anything about the existence of the program, Schreiber suspected that it could only be a phantom program. The next inquiry went to the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. There, Schreiber learned that Germany was also contributing to the financing of teaching materials such as textbooks and that everything was handled through the UN Children's Fund UNICEF. Inquiry at UNICEF, they were not responsible, everything was the bilateral responsibility of the Afghan Ministry of Education and the respective individual partner organizations. Schreiber now tried to reconstruct the financial flows within the Afghan authorities and found this out. In its EFA report, Education for All, the Afghan Ministry of Education concluded in 2012 that it received far more money than it was able to spend. According to the report, only 32.3% of the budget flowed out in 2012. The many billions of euros in foreign funds have led to an oversupply because, according to the Ministry of Education, you can't spend all the money that fast. Quote, end. Since the Afghan Ministry of Finance refused to provide any information about foreign donor contributions to the Afghan national budget, Schreiber turned to the German Federal Ministry of Finance to find out what Germany's share of Afghanistan's overfunding was. The ministry declared itself not responsible and referred the matter to the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. From the latter, one learns that Germany does not pay directly into the Afghan budget, but through the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, which is administered by the World Bank. After all his inquiries, Schreiber now felt he was at least halfway in the picture, the generous financial aid to Afghanistan via international organizations or the country's national budget is one thing. The other is the work that German development aid does directly and on its own, such as the training and continuing education of Afghan teachers by GIZ. Quote, end. Reason enough for Schreiber to check with GIZ again. There, he learned from a local project manager that in the eyes of the German Society for International Cooperation, which acts almost exclusively on behalf of German federal ministries, everything is going in the right direction, in terms of Afghan education policy. After all, he says, 17,000 teachers have already been reached with training and continuing education to date, 2019, the content is deliberately kept out of it. The Afghan Ministry of Education is responsible for the textbooks, says the GIZ expert. Schreiber insisted, and if problematic content appeared in the textbooks, such as that which I came across during my research. The project manager explained to me that a manual for teacher training had been developed precisely for such things. In the future, the book Gender and Humanity will be used in a course that is mandatory for all prospective teachers. This book would also be well received, because, it was checked that this manual does not contradict Islamic values, the GIZ representative said. After Schreiber expressed his astonishment that, Afghan teachers thus come across anti-Semitic textbooks co-financed by Germany on the one hand, and on the other, learn from the Islam-compliant manual given to them by German development workers how they should behave in this regard, he insists on taking a look at said manual, and is then told, unfortunately, this is not possible the GIZ informs me, because it is not yet available. Quote, end. After presenting the Afghan textbook to the educationalist Suzanne Linklitzing, who, after examining the contents, concluded that it would be better to do without education altogether before teaching the contents of the book to young people in Afghanistan, Konstantin Schreiber drew his conclusion, after all the years, all the billions, all the work of development workers and political summits. One of the results is that children are taught with a textbook like this one. It really does give the impression that, with the multitude of projects, organizations and partners for the reconstruction of Afghanistan, one hand does not know what the other is doing.
Germany is transferring billions of dollars in aid to Afghanistan without knowing exactly what is being done with it and without examining its use critically enough. It can be assumed that the anti-Semitic textbook at hand will reach Afghan schools with German financial aid and cause damage there. Schreiber 2019, p. 41 ff. Schreiber's descriptions do not only lead all left-wing and right-wing accusations ad absurdum that an imperialist or neo-colonial project has been pursued in Afghanistan since the fall of the Taliban in 2001. Anyone who, like Sarah Wagenecht, proclaims via YouTube channel as the truth about Afghanistan, that the West was concerned with economic and geopolitical interests there for 20 years, August 26, 2021, is, in the manner of left-wing self-righteousness, unwilling to grasp the difference between the haphazard overthrow of the Taliban in 2001 and the Iraq War of 2003, which was committed to the neoconservative domino theory. Obviously, the widespread lack of interest in the fate of the country and its people was the reason why a Ministry of Education was able to act like a Ministry of Islamic Affairs and why the Afghans in charge were apparently given far too much freedom instead of being taken seriously by the civilizational curb. A devastatingly effective multilateralism, which carried all the ugly outsourcing NGO ingredients of the globally, MIS, managed UN world, replaced and prevented a bitterly needed unilateral approach, a delusion that did not even stop at the US Army, which delegated sovereign army tasks to private security service providers. In Afghanistan, in the slipstream of the US troops, with their express tolerance and support, a majority of the caritas crowd, intent on self-sufficiency, was able to do what it wanted in the name of gender and humanity by distributing money and recruiting so-called local forces, always in conformity with Islam. The far too few Afghans who really wanted more than a perpetuation of Islamic misery systematically promoted by overall imantacion were cheated of their hopes from the outset by the encouragement of corruption and well-paid tribal loyalties. All the political and feature pages talk about the establishment of a strong Afghan civil society in some sectors and other advances in the last 20 years is embarrassed by Schreiber's descriptions of internationalized development aid, which is accused of criminally favoring an education to immaturity. Schreiber's research is proof that for 20 years Afghanistan was not about establishing basic civilizational standards, according to which one does not need to fear God, Muslims are not above all other people, Jews are also such other people, religion is primarily a private matter and not a state ideology, and jurisdiction should not be a sacred but a secular matter. All these failures cannot be explained by a general reference to the ideological, but not material weakness of the West, which is expressed in 20 years of multilateral disinterest in Afghanistan, if this weakness has to be used defeatistically as an excuse that not much more has been done in Afghanistan. To paraphrase Margot Kasman, nothing was good in Afghanistan. Kasman had, of course, spoken this sentence during her New Year's service 2010 in the Frauenkirch and pointed out that the people in Dresden knew particularly well what civilians in Afghanistan had to go through, for which she was awarded the Speech of the Year 2010 by the University of Tübingen. She was concerned with serving the particularly infantile need in Germany to ontologize the, in Kasman's own words, logic of war. There is no place for the preconditions for a better life for the Afghans, which can only be enforced by force, in such pacifist peace messages, about which Hannah Arendt once stated that they had in common with the Nazis, to equate war per se with sheer slaughter. In an inimitable blend of asserted natural law and ethnology, the Bundeswehr Handbook Afghanistan, military country information for operational contingents reinforced the Kasman discourse thus. Quote, Although the Afghan people have suffered greatly under the Taliban, their attitude remains a deeply Islamic religious one. Any form of democracy in the sense of popular representation in Afghanistan must therefore satisfy the Islamic understanding of law if it is to be supported by the people. An Islamic understanding of law means that every legal decision is embedded in the divine order, i.e., a separation of religion and state is inconceivable in an Afghan form of government. Afghans do not define themselves as individuals with their own personal interests and the goal of personal self-realization. Family and kinship are the socio-economic basis of social life. Theological discussions are to be avoided, in particular, criticism with religious connotations or on religious issues is inappropriate. Openly professing to follow no religion should be avoided. Godlessness is unacceptable to Afghans. Handbook 2012 186, 192, 201. Such fate-link certainty is contradicted, apparently, 
by the anti-racist insight according to which an Afghan who crosses the German border sees himself in a flash as an individual and perceives godlessness as acceptable, which is why, in the consequence of such progressive and cosmopolitan logic, any urgently needed civilization assistance is denied to him in advance. Obviously, no one has found it necessary to prove that Afghan conditions are not and certainly do not have to remain unchangeably as described in the Bundeswehr manual. Far beyond the Bundeswehr, there is a consensus that it should not even be possible to imagine what should have been the starting condition for any determination of goals and strategy, to leave behind a fundamentally secularized country with recourse to the Enlightenment, whose social makeup would enable the Afghans to disenchant their existence, which had fallen prey to clan and tribe, and to finally look at it with sober eyes. In the words of Max Horkheimer, if it were necessary to determine what the emissaries of the West should transmit spiritually, all those who deal primarily with average tribesmen, nothing better could be desired than the image of man who has his own judgment, respects man in every other man, hates injustice and subjugation, the gesture of freedom. To implant such tendencies in foreign peoples, the man of the West would have to be capable there, beyond the sincere respect for his industry and the double-edged admiration of the wealth of his country. Only in so far as wealth and industry are connected with that which is spiritual, does aid transform itself into mission. Quote, end. Even if Afghanistan's tribal society was never what Whitfogel called an oriental despotism, because it never fulfilled the criteria of what he called the specific character of an upper class equals sovereign plus bureaucracy, the country today nevertheless stands on a similar level of history, lying below industrial capitalism and above primitive agrarian society, as Whitfogel claimed it did for oriental despotism. It thus embodies a pre-bourgeois society without sufficient primitive accumulation having taken place, which Marx determined as everything else but idyllic precondition of the rule of the social relation between persons mediated by things that he called capital, a rule that in turn would be inconceivable without the, as the Communist Manifesto puts it, highly revolutionary role of a pre-emerging or emerging bourgeoisie. For Marx, who was never an anti-capitalist, it was considered a foregone conclusion that subjectless capital rule would lead to the formation of a functioning national economy, despite the boundlessness of capital, which he determined to be an imminent law of motion. In his Grundriss it says, an internal market is rapidly formed by capital by destroying all rural sidelines, i.e., spinning for all, weaving for all, clothing for all, etc., in short, by bringing commodities formerly created as immediate use values into the form of exchange values. A process which arises of its own accord through the detachment of the workers from land and ownership of the conditions of production. Quote, end. With this, Marx did not take the word of the all-judging invisible hand of an Adam Smith, he recurred to the emergence of a national economy under capital conditions of commodity and legal form. One can read about the economic parameters in the 2012 Armed Forces Handbook, in Afghanistan, one must distinguish between the legal and illegal economy, 80 to 90 percent of all economic activities take place in the informal and illegal sector. The state's tax revenue is one of the lowest in the world. The most significant employers are governmental and international governmental and non-governmental organizations. Agriculture provides a livelihood for more than 85% of the population. The farm structure of Afghan agriculture is characterized by small-scale family farms with subsistence farming. Handbook 2012, 218F, U, 220F. No one should be under the illusion that the West's condition, which has long borne anti-civic traits a major reason for its ideational weakness allowed it to turn a pre-modern society into a modern one supported by citoyens and for which the rule of law is characteristic. But creating social conditions under which Afghans could no longer experience themselves as the great exception at all, as individuals with private interests, the precondition for which would be the destruction of all, feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations, as the Communist Manifesto puts it, would have been a perfectly feasible undertaking had it been seriously pursued, a bourgeois Afghanistan, whose export products would then no longer be opium, hashish and refugees, but in which state end. Social conditions would prevail that would allow a necessary bourgeoisie worthy of its name to emerge in the first place. But in Afghanistan, not even an attempt was made to create an internal market that would push back the pre-modern subsistence system. In truth, the intention was never to transform a Taliban-ruled failed state into a non-Taliban-ruled failed state. The GIZ Germans and their ideological UN friends have called what they are doing the networked approach to nation-building, 
and with their accompanying alimentación of the country and its people on the terms of their traditional oppressors, they have done far more massive damage than any U.S. Army operation that got out of hand, or even the Bundeswehr-initiated airstrike near Kunduz, which killed dozens of civilians, ever could. The Americans could be blamed for having allowed themselves to be talked into a destructive undertaking, and, to make matters worse, as a kind of appeasement gesture for the German, no, to the Iraq War. This could only happen because German and other civil society activists were able to fill the void resulting from American lack of plan after the military victory. There was never any conception on the American side of what victory in Afghanistan, let alone what the liberation of the Afghans, was actually supposed to mean. In the words of neocon Robert Kagan, Bush had no idea what he wanted to do with Afghanistan. In truth, the Bush administration would have been satisfied with any stable government capable of fending for itself and preventing the return of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, Washington Post, August 26, 2021. The Germans, who only participated in Afghanistan because they could not do otherwise, were in any case willing to use any means that helped to avoid the impression at home that the defense of Germany's security in the Hindu Kush had anything to do with the logic of war, Kassman. For this reason alone, President Kohler had to take his hat off in 2010, having dared to point out to his compatriots, who have learned to rely on the Americans, who are still wedded to the logic of war and at the same time hated for it, that in case of doubt, in case of emergency, military action might be necessary to protect our interests in Afghanistan, Deutschlandfunk, May 22, 2010. At about the same time, in a Bundestag session, Frank Walter Steinmeier, who served as Germany's foreign minister until 2009, proudly announced in a kind of Kohler counter-speech as a legacy of his time in office that it had taken far too long to convince others that we must give top priority to civilian reconstruction and the protection of the civilian population in Afghanistan. In order to be able to cold-shoulder people who thought even remotely like Horst Kohler, even the astonishingly realistic Afghanistan analyses of the otherwise always well-liked quasi in house Stiftung Wissenschaft UND Politik, Science and Politics Foundation, were ignored. In May 2010, the foundation not only criticized the German debate on Afghanistan as strongly self-centered, but also warned urgently against the possible destabilizing effect of network development aid. One person who demands an honest discussion about Germany's role in Afghanistan from the destructive power that is eager for foreign trade surpluses and thus proves that he has understood very little about the workings of Germany, which is open to the world, always honestly makings, and never at a loss for strong symbols, is Joseph Verbovsky. This doctoral student at the Munich University of the Bundeswehr would nevertheless have to be agreed with in his conclusion about Germany's role in Afghanistan. German policy did not want to realize that the demands of stabilizing the entire country of Afghanistan through a networked approach required significantly more resources and, above all, the willingness to also fight for these demands. Germany further hoped to set a strong symbol of German responsibility between the military and civilian actors without actually being involved in the war, Tejas Spiegel, September 7, 2021. Quite a few American politicians and experts are of the opinion that, as a path of least resistance, it would have made more sense to leave Afghanistan again just a few years after 2001, when the Taliban were largely defeated and ready for a peace agreement, instead of letting the Germans in particular foist upon them a nation-building venture that was devoid of strategy and purpose but sounded all the loftier for it. In particular, then-Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld is said to have been strongly opposed at the time, as one learns from Carter Malkasian in Foreign Affairs, April 5, 2020, who even states for the period immediately after the fall of the Taliban, the first mistake was the Bush administration's decision to exclude the Taliban from the post-invasion political settlement. Senior Taliban leaders tried to negotiate a peace agreement with Afghan President Karzai in December 2001. They were willing to lay down their arms and recognize Karzai as the legitimate leader of the country. Quote, end. Several more times between 2002 and 2004, the Taliban would have approached Karzai with requests to participate in the political process. Without question, a peace deal would have been an extremely fragile one that would have resulted in a loss of personal freedoms, particularly for women, which demonstrably existed in relation to Taliban rule under both the Karzai government and his successor, Ashraf Ghani. The Americans apparently decided against including the Taliban in a post-war order because they still adhere to the false notion of the Taliban as an anti-Afghan foreign body, which is largely the consensus in the West. The German defense minister at the time, 
struck, for example, was carried away by the claim that the Taliban had only occupied Afghanistan until 2001, i.e., that they were basically nothing more than a kind of occupying force. The journalist Richard Herzinger, who likes to be passed around as a model liberal, reinforced Strzok's thesis when the Taliban took power in August 2021, saying that the Afghans were exposed to the arbitrariness of the Islamist extremists. In 2001, the Americans' most important Afghan allies were not only a desolate collection of tribal leaders and warlords, but at the same time explicitly anti-Pashtun interest groups. The very name, Northern Alliance, refers to this because, in contrast to the south and east of Afghanistan, hardly any Pashtun live in the north. The Pashtun south and east form the region to which Afghanistan owes its name, Afghan means Pashtun in Persian, where about 40% of the total population lives and from which almost all Taliban are recruited. That the Taliban, and with them an important part of Afghanistan, should not participate in peace in Afghanistan during its weakest phase is part of the prehistory of its resurgence. This is also linked to the worsening security situation and mood among the Afghan population over the years. Until their demise, the ranks of the Afghan security forces included only a few recruits of Pashtun origin, who had to live with the fact that Karzai, for example, who always ruled as a patron, spoke of the Taliban as our brothers, whom the Afghan army and police nevertheless had to fight. When the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP, stated in the spring of 2006 that the security situation in Afghanistan had deteriorated alarmingly, Karzai was attested in the same breath that he had not succeeded in eliminating one of the most important obstacles to security and stability in the country, the alienation of Pashtun population groups. In 2007, the Taliban already felt strong enough to boycott an attack with missiles the so-called Peace Jirga convened for early June with 1,600 participants, at which a peace and reconciliation plan was adopted in coordination with international partner countries, including the US and Germany, and which primarily envisioned negotiations with the Taliban. Since then, the Taliban have rejected all attempts by the Afghan government to enter into direct negotiations with them. Karzai also drew increasing domestic criticism for his advances, which in 2010 led to a rift between Karzai and the head of Afghan intelligence, Amrullah Saleh, who later became Saleh's deputy in Ghani's government and has seen himself as the legitimate successor to his boss since Ghani's abrupt departure. In 2011, it was revealed through Karzai's channels that, the US, in particular, was pushing negotiations with the Taliban. Under Barack Obama, the US thus adopted a demand that had already been vehemently made by the UN envoy to Afghanistan, Kai Eid. Both Obama and I do not want to be reminded of this today, if only because Obama's successor Donald Trump, who is not fit for society, put into practice what Obama and I had intended. In 2011, W. George Bush's successor had already been in office for barely two years, and the SWP described the initial situation Obama faced in Afghanistan as follows what had begun in the fall of 2001 as a model for a successful military intervention with low costs of its own had turned into an asymmetric war by the end of the Bush era. Quote, end. Under Obama, they adapted what had been tested quite effectively in Iraq in 2006 as a counterinsurgency strategy, FM 3-24 counterinsurgency, as a triad of clean, hold, and build to contain attacks. The new strategy officially announced by Obama was accompanied by an immense troop surge and a rapid increase in targeted killings of Taliban fighters by drones even in the Taliban's traditional Pashtun backwater in Pakistan A strategy, incidentally, that Obama's running mate, Joe Biden, was never comfortable with. Poppy cultivation, whose rigorous crackdown drove people to the Taliban in droves, was barely sanctioned. On the other hand, it was Obama who first announced, and, without taking into account the previous agreements in the alliance, as one lamented at the SWP, Teja Spiegel, May 24, 2012, that his main goal was to bring the troops home as quickly as possible. This premise of Obama's transformed the troop surge and intensification of targeted killings into a means of withdrawing troops as quickly as possible, thus limiting in advance all chances of success in the fight against the Taliban. The means to an end thus also became the simultaneously declared priority of building up the Afghan security forces, euphemistically called Afghanization. The three elements of counterinsurgency were simply supplemented by the addition of the transfer of military command and control to Afghan military personnel. 
the same strategy that had been employed in Iraq to contain the civil war in order to strengthen the central state led, in the words of the SWP, to the undermining of the central government's monopoly on the use of force in Afghanistan, where, to make matters worse, there had been an increased reliance on tribal militia support. Under Obama, not only did the realization mature that the Taliban could not ultimately be defeated crushingly, it prevailed under him. The Afghan security forces were built up in the hope that the central government would be able to rely on them, although no one believed this. At the SWP, one noted of Obama's entry to exit, American combat troops should not remain in Afghanistan indefinitely, that is the core of Obama's cloudily packaged message, which proceeded according to the principle of hope or contained a bet that after the withdrawal of American troops, the Afghan side will be capable of good governance and administrative performance. Because the SWP is a German foundation, this correct assessment of the Obama doctrine was coupled with complaints about typical American lack of culture. The American debate was very much tied to technocratic thinking, which stood for a downright apolitical and ahistorical ideology of feasibility. In 2014, not only Operation Enduring Freedom, which was not allowed to be called Operation Infinite Justice, but also the UN-mandated deployment of the International Security Assistance Force, ISAF, ended in a completely apolitical and ahistorical manner. The final troop withdrawal of all international forces, including the Bundeswehr, began, which as of February 2021 had reduced the total strength of all international military forces to a good 9,500. Since then, the focus has been solely on building up the Afghan security forces under the title Resolute Support. The fight against al-Qaeda remnants and the newly emerged IS groups in Afghanistan continued to fall exclusively to the US Army, which christened this fight Operation Freedom Sentinel, which also saw the use of the mother of all bombs, the US Army's largest conventional bomb, against a tunnel system suspected of being IS in eastern Afghanistan in April 2017. One year after the start of resolute support, the SWP gave a devastating report card to the Afghan security forces senior personnel in particular. The army and police, as well as the intelligence service, were part of a patronage system that encompassed the entire state apparatus, enrichment and embezzlement were the order of the day, many subordinates existed only on paper, and kidnappings and extortion for protection money were common. There are informal ceasefires with the Taliban and, around 70% of the losses in the security forces are not due to dead and wounded, but to voluntary departures such as desertions, Handelsblatt, January 20, 2015. A particularly fraught moment in the relationship between NATO forces and local forces that illustrates the Americans' dilemma in all its ugliness was made up of so-called internal assassination incidents, in which uniformed Afghans used their freedom of movement within the international forces' barracks to carry out assassinations. The English edition of Wikipedia is not likely to be wrong in its assessment that these incidents were primarily due not to infiltrated terrorists, but to cross-cultural misunderstandings, social insults, and personal revenge. The SWP assessment of the state of Afghan security forces, published back in 2015, reads almost identically to those published in August 2021 on the occasion of the Taliban's victory march. Over the years, the overall situation has ultimately changed only in that the Taliban has been able to conquer more and more territory. This is particularly bitter for the minority among the local forces that wanted more than to be part of the system of a shithole country called the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan and had to endure Joe Biden's invectives on the occasion of the Taliban's conquest of Kabul that the Afghans did not want to fight, in all their insulting harshness. Against this background, the SWP was able to reuse a text module it had used, for example, on March 24, 2021, year after year, and was unfortunately always right, NATO, and thus also the Bundeswehr, are a long way from a successful conclusion to build up Afghan security forces that can independently and effectively provide security throughout the territory, Spiegel, March 24, 2021. Undeniably, Trump's February 2020 agreement with the Taliban, which knows only the one purpose of finally making the final American withdrawal irreversible, has further deteriorated morale among local forces and lifted that of the Taliban immensely. However, anyone who, like the writer Naveed Kermani, puts out the fake news that Trump's America First policy is to blame for the escalation of violence and the strengthening of the Taliban is knowingly underplaying the fact that Trump only continued the Afghanistan policy of his predecessor with the Nobel Peace Prize and brought it to a conclusion. 
Even the trivializing talk of violence that escalated as if it were a pub brawl makes it clear that Kermani is not concerned with the truth but with the cultivation of the German enemy image, FAZ, August 26, 2021. When it was reported in mid-August 2021 that CIA Director William Burns had gone to Kabul for talks with the Taliban, the FAZ, among others, rubbed its eyes in puzzlement. Were the Americans interested in making the Taliban a partner in the war on terror? August 27, 2021, what seems absurd at first glance is not so ill-considered from a strategic point of view. The U.S. has soberly observed what distinguishes the Taliban from their competitors, who also adhere to the Uma ideology, from the Islamic State and also from Al-Qaeda, and why they are enemies of IS. It is true that the Taliban adhere to the teachings of the Deobandi University, the second most influential Sunni ideological school after Cairo's al azhar University, which proclaims that the Ummah idea should be above any national idea. Nevertheless, they differ considerably from IS and Al-Qaeda in that they are strongly ethnic. Contrary to Matthias Kunsel's assertion, the Taliban movement's internationalist or anti-national character, if you will, is marginal in relation to the IS, despite its cross-border affinities with its Pashtun siblings in Pakistan, and with it the revolutionary momentum of wanting to establish a borderless caliphate regardless of losses. In comparison with the IS, it becomes clear in all sharpness what has always distinguished the Taliban as a quasi-national liberation movement from Al-Qaeda. Unlike the IS and Al-Qaeda, the Taliban see themselves first and foremost not as the elitist, subversive vanguard of a borderless Ummah, but as the guardians of threatened Islamic values in their ancestral homeland. Although the three fighting alliances are results of the deep crisis of Islam, the IS supporters embody the Mujahideen of a new type, who are mostly urban and thus more uprooted than a Talib. Al-Qaeda, which under bin Laden always aimed at conquering Saudi Arabia and thus the home of Islam and only then at the borderless caliphate, stands strategically between the IS and the Taliban. The different interpretation of the Ummah doctrine is also reflected in the appreciation of these murderous gangs among the followers of a jihadist international in the West, radicalized, predominantly migrant youth will not travel from the West to the Hindu Kush to join the Taliban, which are perceived as old-fashioned, peasant and uncool. Far more attractive in this milieu is the IS, whose protagonists, not coincidentally, stage themselves like the real gangster rappers and promise endless murder, robbery and rape as the internationalist avant-garde of Islam. All over the world, but especially in sub-Saharan Africa, where for years a jihad of unimagined dimensions has been raging against the Christianity there, which in the West is mostly acknowledged with a shrug of the shoulders or, as for example in the case of Mali, is covered up with some military political cosmetics, the murderers are ideologically oriented to the IS. It is not at all a matter of digging into the question of whether the Taliban have changed. What changed after September 11th was jihadism, which has since become so radicalized that it only knows national borders in order to eliminate them. The pop factor of the latter makes the Taliban, who are still struggling with the modern means of communication of the infidels instead of using them fully for themselves as the IS does, look old. At least an inkling of the split in the jihadist scene and its consequences is reflected in Joe Biden's remarks this August, when he stressed that it was about today's threats, not yesterday's, and talked about how we live in a new world in which the terrorist threat has spread across the world. Biden, who was merely following up on what Obama and Trump had put in place as an exit strategy, also asked the rhetorical question in his August 31st speech of whether one would ever have gone to Afghanistan if we had been attacked from Yemen on September 11, 2001. His hardly surprising no, however, includes a yes in the case of Iraq. For in Iraq, under the influence of the neocons, at least according to their own claim, it was really about nation-building right across an entire region, so that one must logically speak here of a failure. Against the background of the different goals for Afghanistan and Iraq, especially in the case of a not-at-all-improbable anti-terror alliance between the Americans and the Taliban, the question of the meaning of the Afghanistan enterprise arises in a fundamental way. In 2001, the Taliban were the friends of the once most important terrorist group called Al-Qaeda, today they are opponents of the most important terrorist group called IS. And that is supposed to be all after 20 years. The Taliban were at least as surprised by their march through to Kabul as the rest of the world was. This is closely related to the fact that large parts of the Afghan security forces who were willing to fight did not lay down their arms before the Taliban, but simply gave up in the face of the self-fulfilling prophecy of Western policy. 
Whether the Taliban will really be able to hold on to power in the long term is irrelevant, because there will hardly be any Western support for those Afghans who want to remain in the country to fight the Taliban. This is not only because, after the experience of the last 20 years, the US priority is to prevent a second Afghanistan from happening again, but even more so to recalibrate its own interests. Joe Biden, in both of his August speeches on the occasion of the hasty withdrawal of US troops, was unequivocal in stressing why that era of major military operations to transform other countries must end. The real strategic competitors, Biden said, are China and Russia, with China in serious competition while Russia is confronted on multiple fronts. Obviously, one does not want to seriously compete with the Chinese for spheres of influence in Afghanistan. It is not at all unlikely, however, that against the background of the disastrous Afghan investment conditions, the Chinese action against the Uyghurs on the border to Afghanistan and the huge opium problem that Afghanistan is causing China, even the Chinese, who are known for their unscrupulousness, will ultimately be better off leaving the country alone and routing the Silk Road past the country. The fact that China is now consensually identified in the United States as the great competitor whose containment and repression must be subordinated to all strategic considerations also has to do with the disastrous American misjudgment of the country's development, which has decisively favored China's rise. Relying on the invisible hand of liberalism, for example, the 2002 national security strategy dictated by the neocons, which enshrined preemptive interventionism for the Iraq war, states that China is well on its way toward social and political freedom under the power of market principles and the requirements of the WDO. The fact that the Americans, unlike the Europeans with the Germans in the lead, are now prepared to prevent the possible hell of a Chinese world domination, as Max Horkheimer once called the threat on the occasion of his partisanship for the Americans in the Vietnam War may also have persuaded the Australians to trust the reconstruction of an old Western Antifa alliance with Great Britain and the US more than the submarines of Canton France, which has been proven to be always insecure in. Matters of Anti-Fascism For Afghanistan, the conclusion, recalling an SWP phrase, is For 20 years, rather than being tangled up in a networked approach, Afghanistan has constantly operated in a state of strategilessness. The main reason for this was that if Afghanistan had been serious about building civil society or nation building, it should have been primarily about how to create conditions that would make both possible in the first place. This would have meant defeating not only the Taliban, but an entire society, which would not have had to be rebuilt, but would have had to be created from scratch, not by re-educating, but by educating for the first time, so that the local forces of all shades would have an idea of what they would have to fight against if something better were to emerge than choosing between an Islamic Republic and an Islamic Emirate. One would be mistaken to imply, in the manner of Peter Scholatour, that too little was known about Afghanistan, which is why they failed. Rather, one did not want to admit the abundant knowledge about the social role of Islam and talked it up, such as Ahmad Milad Karimi, a guy with a professorial title who is considered one of the formative heads of Islam in Germany, Deutschland Radio, and is therefore supposed to say what everyone wants to hear, the Taliban engaged in massive abuse of religion and had perverted Islam beyond recognition. Deutschlandfunk, August 25, 2021 Not only did no one want to see the necessity of radically pushing back Islam in Afghanistan, it was also difficult to do so thanks to an exuberant production of morals and ideology, which for years has made the refugee into its civil society fetish, on which the contempt for the Western bourgeois nation-state and, as a consequence, the aversion to any form of genuine nation-building are acted out as objects. This fetish of cosmopolitanism is proof of how literally finished those are with the world who no longer want to waste a thought on effectively combating the causes of flight and who certainly do not ask themselves whether perhaps not everything was bad about the idea of national liberation. What remains is a view of the world that only reaches as far as the Libyan Mediterranean coast and the necessary rescue at sea there, combined with the devastating message that anyone who fights for a better life on the ground instead of becoming a refugee has only himself to blame for his fate. With such enemies of humanity, there is no need to argue about whether the Americans should be reproached for not even considering the possibility of establishing a walled American protectorate in Kabul a civilizational enclave of freedom, in whose schools only non-GIZ trained teachers would be on duty, no Islam-compliant textbooks would be used, no networked approaches would be allowed to have their destructive effect, and a completely apolitical and ahistorical approach would be taken to an American ideology of feasibility, 
which would enable all cobblers and those seeking refuge there to lead a halfway good individual life. If one wants to make such an accusation to the Americans, then one should always have this warning in mind, it can lead to grave errors, when the promise of the USA is confused with the reality of the USA, when the promise of civilization is confused with the reality of civilization. No one should be under the illusion that the state of the West, which has long since borne anti-bourgeois traits and is weak precisely because of this, and which not only expresses itself in the ideology of anti-racism and anti-colonialism in the diversity fetish or in the climate historical call for authoritarian solutions, but quite currently also in the social ostracism of so-called unvaccinated people and in dealing with so-called unconventional thinkers, allowed it to turn a pre-modern society into a modern one supported by citoyens, for which the rule of law is characteristic. But creating social conditions under which the people there could no longer experience themselves only as the great exception, but as individuals with private interests, the prerequisite for which would be the destruction of all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic conditions, as the Communist Manifesto so beautifully puts it, would have been a thoroughly feasible undertaking both in Iraq and in Afghanistan, had it been seriously pursued. However, this still does not answer the question of how it is possible for a sufficient civic consciousness to develop in Islamic societies, also known as common sense, which is still regarded as a condition for the possibility of an urgently needed secularization of social conditions. So has the West lost the war on terror? If, like the neocons at the time, it is understood to mean more than purely military, police or secret service action, then the West can only ever lose this battle as long as, for example, a new German government coalition with the motto, dare more progress, can succeed socially. So if a majority of the population finds nothing scandalous about the fact that a new German government with the former manager of, Tunstein Schurzben, as Minister of State for Culture, which, citing the further so-called diversification of society, is committed to cultural relativism and further ideologization, can hijack the concept of progress for itself, as the Biden administration in the US is similarly doing. As long as the hegemony of these self-declared progressives is not broken, it will not be possible to hear from the West what Max Horkheimer once understood as its civilizing task, which in the present would have to be a central component of any fight against terror. Quote, if it were to be determined what the emissaries of the West should transmit spiritually, all those who deal primarily with average tribesmen, nothing better could be desired than the image of man who has his own judgment, respects man in every other man, hates injustice and subjugation, the gesture of freedom. Such inclinations to implant in foreign peoples, the man of the West would have to be capable of there, beyond the sincere respect for his industry and the double-edged admiration of the wealth of his country. Only in so far as wealth and industry are connected with that which is spiritual, does aid transform itself into mission. Quote, end. In the course of the most recent Gaza war, Triggered by the largest anti-Semitic massacre since the founding of the Israeli state committed by Hamas, allied terror groups and Palestinian civilians on October 7, 2023. In the course of the most recent Gaza war, triggered by the largest anti-Semitic massacre since the founding of the Israeli state committed by Hamas, allied terrorist groups and Palestinian civilians on October 7, 2023, it was repeatedly said not only by the Arabs and the UN, but also in the West that the two-state solution must finally be implemented as quickly as possible, as if it were a matter of course that the Palestinians should be rewarded with their own state for the massacre so that both sides could finally find peace. But it is also clear that the future of the Palestinians must be better than their present and past, the German foreign minister told the Palestinian head of government Mohammed Shtaja on November 12, 2023, according to Stern. Less than two weeks after the bloodbath, Baerbach and her Jordanian counterpart Al Safadi were already calling for a negotiated solution to the Gaza war, at the end of which there must be a two state solution, according to NTV.de on October 19. Even in the statements of the officially most pro Israel states, the USA and Germany, the idea has always resonated that the Palestinians have been deprived of territories to which they have any legitimate claim or even a right for decades, even since 1947, that either, in the eyes of undisguised Palestinian solidarity, Israel alone or at best, in equidistant understanding for the Jews. The radical forces on both sides are responsible for the failure of the two-state solution to date. By which is meant right-wing to right-wing radical governments and fanatical settlers in Israel and open supporters of anti-Semitic terror among Palestinians. Even in circles that are decidedly in solidarity with Israel, 
the historical lies are cultivated that Israel has occupied Palestinian territories, West Bank, Gaza Strip, and that Jewish settlers, supported by right-wing religious governments and parties, are settling in Palestinian territories. The matter-of-factness with which the term Palestinian territories is wrongly used corresponds to the talk of a Palestinian people with Arab connotations, as if this had not been invented at the end of the 1960s with the aim of destroying Israel. The banal truth, however, is that the international community and Israel have offered the Arabs of the originally Ottoman province, then the British Mandate Territory of Palestine their own state several times, without necessity and without any moral or legal obligation, but rather generously, but the Arabs and the Palestinians have not only rejected such offers each time, but have responded with violence against Israel and the Jews. After every violent rejection of the two-state solution, and thus a state of their own, by the Arabs and Palestinians, it would have been normal to bury the idea of a two-state solution once and for all, and to proactively represent to the Arabs that with their own behavior they have simply forfeited forever a right to Palestinian statehood that never existed anyway. The world historical anomaly of repeatedly offering the Palestinians instead what they deserve all the less the more often they turn it down, the only people on earth who have ever been granted this honor, can only be explained by Israeli philanthropy and a world community obsession with Arabs and Islam and, difficult to distinguish from this, anti-Semitism. A look at the history of the so-called Middle East conflict and Israeli peace diplomacy may shed some light on this. Even the common term, Middle East conflict, is by no means an attempt at neutrality or objectivity. The word, conflict, is a trivialization, the mere emphasis on geography, Middle East, eschematizes the real events, namely a permanent struggle for survival of Israeli Jews against anti-Semitic Arab murder collectives since the founding of the state. In the West, too, it is already beginning to take the existence of the Arab nation-states in the Middle East, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon, for granted, almost as a matter of course, while with regard to Israel, an ominous, right to exist, is defended at best. Excluding Egypt and Saudi Arabia, to which it only partially applies, the Arab states are the results of British-French nation-building after the First World War. It is the reward or quid pro quo for mobilizing the Arab tribes to fight against the Ottoman Empire, i.e. a promise kept by the West to, the Arabs, they, might have preferred a greater Arab empire consisting of Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Greater Jordan and parts of Saudi Arabia, but were never able to speak with one voice because far too many tribes and families, enemies to the death, claimed rule over Arabia. Until then, the territories in question had been provinces or administrative districts under Turkish rule for centuries, Palestine, 1516-1918. In the territory of Palestine, which in pre-biblical and biblical times was ruled by Greeks, Egyptians, Persians, Romans and partly by Jews, later by Byzantines, Arabs and Muslims have lived and ruled only since the Islamic conquests from today's Saudi Arabia in the 7th century at the earliest, until the Turks took over. As is well known, the founding of Israel goes back to the UN Partition Plan of 1947 for the British Mandate of Palestine, which had existed since the 1920s. The British had also promised the Jews a Jewish homeland in the region on several occasions. However, this is not the decisive factor in the question of the moral legitimacy of a Jewish state in the Middle East. Zionism, the Jewish national movement, emerged at the end of the 19th century and sees itself as a reaction to the never-ending anti-Semitism in the history of Europe. For centuries, the Jews were repeatedly the victims of pogroms and systematic expulsions, for example from England and France from the end of the 13th century, from German cities and from Spain from the 15th century, then the persecution-induced mass exodus of Jews from Eastern Europe from 1880. The Jews were always dependent on the favor and protection of non-Jewish local authorities, rulers, churches, or the willingness of neighboring societies to take in the fleeing Jews, in the Arabo-Islamic region, the story was similar. The idea of Jewish statehood and defensiveness therefore consisted of taking the protection of Jewish life into one's own hands and no longer having to rely on the goodwill of non-Jews for defense against anti-Semitism. In view of the Holocaust, the Nazi-German attempt to completely annihilate the European Jews, which turned the Second World War into a world war against the Jews due to the involvement of Eastern European populations, the more or less inactive turning away of the Western powers, their refusal to accept more Jewish refugees from Germany and Austria, Evian Conference 1938, etc., 
The establishment of Jewish sovereignty for the Holocaust survivors and those who had become homeless, namely in Palestine, was a matter of course. Jews all over the world have a religious and national connection to this land, Jews have always lived there, even after the expulsion by the Romans. In the course of the European expulsions of Jews and the Holocaust, there have always been emigrations to Palestine, the country was the destination of many displaced persons held in reception camps. For a brief historical moment, the idea of finally doing justice to the Jews found a majority among the states of the world. Even if it has been suppressed ever since, Jewish sovereignty and the ability to defend oneself always require a clear Jewish majority in a bourgeois democratic society. Israel is not simply about a state that bears this name and is also inhabited by Jews, it is about the potential refuge for all Jews persecuted by anti-Semitism, in which Jews, exclusively Jews, have the say, despite all differences of opinion among themselves. Only very few people, want to, know that the UN Partition Plan of 1947 was preceded by the First Partition of Palestine. Transjordan, later Jordan, was formed from 75% of the area, the entire territory east of the Jordan River. This created the first Arab-Palestinian state, the existence of which has not been called into question by anyone to this day. Against the backdrop of the talk of a two-state solution for the British Mandate of Palestine, there would have been nothing at all to prevent the remaining 25% west of the Jordan River from being allocated entirely to a Jewish-Palestinian state, i.e. Israel, in the interests of historical justice. Especially since the Palestinian Arabs, under the leadership of the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, organized anti-Semitic pogroms in the 1930s and fought on the side of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, as did the Arabs as a whole, and it is actually a good practice for the winners of wars to dictate the terms of peace to the losers. If the Arabs of the rest of Palestine had been given the choice of either living under Israeli rule or resettling in Syria, Egypt or the Arab-Palestinian state of Jordan, this would not have been a scandal. Instead, the UN partition plan provided, roughly half and half, 12.5% of the original Palestine for the Jews and 12.5% for a second Arab-Palestinian state, rewarding the Arab-Palestinians for their Nazi collaboration in defeat and punishing the Jews without reason or need. Moreover, both groups were to establish their state on three barely connected regions spread across the land, with Jerusalem and its environs as a UN-administered zone. Despite the obvious, grossly unjust discrimination against the Jews and favoritism towards the Arabs, the Jews accepted this partition plan and founded their state. The Arabs, on the other hand, rejected and have rejected the two-state solution, and thus also their own state, ever since and have tried and continue to try to destroy the Jewish state. Against the UN partition plan and unhindered by the UN or any Western power, the Arab Palestinians and the regular armies of Syria, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon and Jordan attacked the Jewish state one day after its declaration of independence on May 14, 1948, once again with the participation of German Nazis, whom they offered refuge from persecution by the Allies. Due to the arms embargo imposed by the USA, Great Britain and France, which again unilaterally disadvantaged the Jews, Israel almost lost. Thanks to the supply of weapons from Czechoslovakia, which was tolerated by the Soviet Union, Israel was not only able to hold its ground, but later, equipped with fighter planes, was even able to win. The Israelis increased their territory by a third compared to the UN partition plan by conquering not only West Jerusalem, but also areas originally allocated to the Arab Palestinians, in the north on the border with Lebanon and northeast of the Gaza Strip and south of the Gaza Strip on the border with Egypt, resulting in a territory that was now also contiguous. The remaining, Palestinian territories, rejected by the Arab Palestinians and surrounding Arab states according to the partition plan were occupied by Egypt, Gaza Strip, and Jordan, West Bank, with the Jordanians also taking East Jerusalem. In the course of this first attempted war of extermination against the Jews and their state, there was a kind of population exchange, refugee movements, expulsions and relocations. Around 750,000 Jews from the Arab world went, voluntarily or by force, to Israel and were integrated there. The Arab world purified itself of Jews. Many Palestinian Arabs, on the other hand, remained in Israel to live there as Israeli citizens. Today, these are around 2 million, i.e. around 20% of the Israeli population. However, around 750,000 Arab Palestinians fled, voluntarily, encouraged by Arab leaders, or forced, from Israeli territories, 
to Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Although these figures are not exact, they do indicate an order of magnitude and that there were roughly the same number of refugees on both sides. Until 1967, the sole responsibility for Palestinian refugees will therefore lie with the Arab states in which they reside and which started and lost the war, as well as with the UN and the Western powers, which at best watched the developments against the partition plan, insofar as they did not even indirectly or directly support Arab action against Israel. For two decades, the Palestinian refugees were not integrated and did not become citizens of Lebanon, Egypt, Syria or Jordan. Nor were there any efforts on the part of the Palestinians, Egypt or Jordan to establish any preliminary forms of Palestinian statehood in Gaza and the West Bank. Rather, the refugee status was cemented and inherited, the people were supposed to live in refugee camps and serve as political momentum against Israel in the form of some kind of right of return. A program not only tolerated by the West to this day, but also co-financed by it. In 1949, the UN even created a temporary relief organization, UNRWA, exclusively for Arab-Palestinian refugees, which has been extended every three years since then, a program that is still unique today. With the Six-Day War of 1967 provoked by Israel's Arab neighbors, the situation changes once again to a large extent and with far-reaching consequences, Israel now enjoys minimal support from the West, above all the USA, while the Soviet Union is more in line with the Arabs. In any case, there is the Israeli occupation of the Sinai Peninsula, which Israel returns for peace with Egypt, in the 1970s and 1980s, the Israeli occupation of the Syrian Golan Heights, which Israel annexes in 1981 due to the strategic advantage for future military defenses and which Trump, against the rest of the world, recognizes as part of Israeli territory in 2019, as well as the occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank including East Jerusalem, annexed in 1980. With the West Bank and Gaza, Israel henceforth occupied ownerless, and not Palestinian, territories, when the British and the UN gave up their sovereignty claims, the Palestinians turned down the offer, after peace with Israel, Jordan and Egypt renounced their claims. Israel cannot annex the territories and make the Arabs and Muslims living their citizens, because this would jeopardize the Jewish majority and thus Israel's sovereignty. From Israel's perspective, there are therefore only three options. One is to rule over a foreign population as an occupying power, which Israel has no long-term interest in doing. The second option is to annex the territories without an Arab population, which would mean resettling the Arab Palestinians in Jordan and Egypt. Against the will of the Palestinians and the Arab states, this would only be possible through concerted action by Western powers. So far, however, there has never been a majority for this, not even in Israeli society itself, although population transfers are historically often universally recognized side effects of post-war orders, accepting the notion of ethnic cleansing. The third option is a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza that coexists peacefully with Israel. Israel has an objective and therefore honest interest in this solution, while the Palestinian side has always lacked partners for its implementation. Palestinian national consciousness did not emerge in the 1930s or in 1948, but only against the Israeli occupiers, and only now is a new, ethnicity, or nation being born, Arabs whose ancestors once lived permanently or temporarily in the southern Syrian province of the Ottoman Empire, which applies equally to Jews and others, are now called Palestinians, their political representation, headed by Arafat since 1969 and recognized as such by the UN in 1974, is called the PLO. Until then, Palestinians, tended to mean Jews. However, if Arabs were referred to as Palestinians back then, writes Gerd Berman in the Judish Runshaw, October 2021, they were offended and declared, we are not Palestinians. We are Arabs. Jews are the Palestinians. Berman quotes PLO leader Zuer Mosen, who stated in an interview with the Dutch newspaper Trouw in March 1977, the Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means to continue our struggle against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality, today there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians and Lebanese. It is only for political and tactical reasons that we speak today of the existence of a Palestinian people, because Arab national interests demand that we postulate the existence of a separate Palestinian people as an antithesis to Zionism.
For tactical reasons, Jordan, a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot make demands on Haifa and Jaffa, while I, as a Palestinian, can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Jaffa, Beersheba and Jerusalem. But the moment we reclaim our right to all of Palestine, we will not wait a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan. So here the leadership of the Palestinian Arabs has confidently and openly admitted that the Palestinian people is merely an invention to destroy Israel. Incidentally, the Palestinian national flag is also exactly the same as that of Jordan, except for the absence of a star, a red triangle rising in black, white and green stripes, and is identical to that of Transjordan, which did not yet have a star. Consequently, the PLO writes the destruction of Israel as its main goal in its own founding charter. In the 1970s and 1980s, various Palestinian organizations would carry out terrorist attacks against Israeli soldiers and Jewish civilians all over the world. The murder of the Israeli Olympic team on September 5, 1972 in Munich is just one example of many. With the Yom Kippur War from October 6 to 25, 1973, the Arab states also underlined their disinterest in peaceful coexistence with Israel, after the War of Independence, 1948-49, the Suez Crisis, 1956, the Six-Day War of 1967 and the War of Attrition, 1968-1970. It was the fifth war that the state of the Holocaust survivors and their descendants had to wage for its existence. Once again, the warlike and terrorist aggression of the Arabs against Israel and the Jews is not about border demarcations and territorial disputes, but about the destruction of the Jewish state. So between 1948 and the 1990s, there were no interlocutors on the Arab side for a two-state solution, neither among the Arab states nor among the Palestinians or their leaders, who have nothing in common beyond their enmity towards Israel. Jordan expelled the PLO in the 1970s, Lebanon in the 1980s with the support of Syria and Iran's Hezbollah. Egypt keeps its borders tight against Gaza Palestinians, especially during the Gaza Wars. And the world community? Ukrainians fleeing the war are taken in, Syrians are allowed to flee through arrangements with Turkey, but evacuating Gaza Palestinians to Cyprus during the war and from there distributing them among the Arab states or, if necessary, shipping them to France and Ireland, none of Israel's humanist admonishers want to think of this when civilians are also falling victim to a war against Hamas, which is entrenched behind civilians. Everyone needs and coddles the Palestinians in order to find any reason to criticize Israel, but nobody wants to have them. Since the end of the 1980s, the PLO has pretended to be interested in a two-state solution, removing the destruction of Israel from its program and declaring its willingness to recognize Israel's existence. In return, a PLO-led self-administration of Palestinian territories, a Palestinian authority, was established. At the same time, concrete peace negotiations on a two-state solution are initiated, Oslo I and Oslo II. On the one hand, however, the PLO repeatedly allowed these to fail, primarily due to the demand for a right of return for Palestinians, expelled, in 1948 and their descendants to the Israeli heartland, which would undermine Jewish sovereignty, and, as in the context of the unsuccessful Camp David and Taba negotiations, culminated in an intifada, 2000-2005. On the other hand, the Islamist Hamas emerged towards the end of the 1980s to compete with the PLO against any form of Jewish-Palestinian rapprochement, again openly calling for the destruction of Israel and adding suicide attacks to the repertoire of Palestinian terror against Israeli civilians since the 1990s. It is gaining increasing influence. Since 2006 and armed conflicts with the PLO, it has ruled over the Gaza Strip. Since 2005, Israel had unilaterally withdrawn from the Gaza Strip under Sharon, including the dismantling of all Jewish settlements and the evacuation of all Israeli citizens, resulting in permanent rocket fire on Israel by Hamas, several Gaza wars and, currently, October 7, 2023, the most brutal massacre of Jews since the founding of the state, according to which Hamas is also more popular among Palestinians in the West Bank than the PLO, according to polls. Whenever there is currently talk of peace and a two-state solution, it always comes across as an appeal to Israel to finally return to the 1990s, to the policies of Rabin and Peres. As if Israel's last offers were from that time. Yet Israeli Prime Minister Olmert had made a far-reaching proposal to the Palestinians and the PLO, which was now led by Abbas, as recently as 2008. Abbas rejected it. 
Saeb Arakat, the chief Palestinian negotiator, said in an interview with the Jordanian Daily Al Dustur on June 25, 2009. First, Israel allowed us to run our own schools and hospitals. Then they offered us 66% of the occupied territories. At Camp David, in 2000, they offered us 90% and just recently 100%. So why should we hurry after all the injustice we suffered? Most recently in 2020, the Trump plan attracted attention as an offer of a two-state solution with Netanyahu's support. The Palestinians and the Arab League ignored it as completely unacceptable. Trump himself spoke of a plan of the century and a realistic two-state solution. This is factually correct insofar as the realities on the ground changed in the decades after 1948 and 1967 in a way that cannot simply be reversed and must therefore be taken into account in peace solutions. This includes Jewish settlements in the West Bank, especially in the Jordan Valley on the border with Jordan, which Trump is in favor of Israel annexing. And why not? It was never Israel's task to reserve Jew-free places in areas controlled by Israel for the Arabs for decades in the event that the Arabs would at some point in the indefinite future feel comfortable accepting them within the framework of mutual recognition, and this despite all warlike and terrorist aggression by the Arabs. Like Olmert, whose plan still provided for the evacuation of many Jewish settlements, Trump's plan also offered the Palestinians territorial compensation, south of Rafah, for annexed areas in the West Bank. However, the Trump plan also openly demonstrated to the Arab world that a Palestinian state coexisting with Israel, if at all, could only, realistically, emerge in enclave form, with two bridge roads to Jordan and a tunnel, or bridge, between the West Bank and Gaza through Israeli territory for the internal connection, which, however, has been completely unrealistic since October 7, 2023. However, this may have become completely unrealistic for the time being since October 7, 2023, just as offering the Palestinians their own state again may be a concern for the UN, the Europeans, the Biden USA, and many anti-Semites, but it is really not the first concern for Israel, and all those who stand in solidarity with it, in the near future. Even in the West, it is thought that the Israeli occupation and the establishment of Jewish settlements in the West Bank and Gaza have played their part in the Arabs' hatred of Israel and would create facts that would make a future, two-state solution, in the spirit of the UN partition plan more difficult. Both are nonsense. The living and legal conditions of the Arab Palestinians have improved considerably under Israeli rule compared to those in Jordan or Egypt. And Jewish settlements in future Arab territories according to the outdated partition plan can only be a problem for those who take Arab statehood for granted as being Judenrein. Nevertheless, Arab antisemitism has made maintaining the occupation expensive for Israel, protecting the settlers, fighting terror, social and humanitarian responsibility for a hostile population, administrative costs. A unilateral withdrawal as in Gaza is probably out of the question for the West Bank. In terms of security and self-defense, the West Bank is of greater strategic military importance than the Gaza Strip, and evacuating the settlements would meet with greater resistance from within society. Annexation is also out of the question, as this would turn the Arab Palestinians of the West Bank into residents of Israel. There is therefore no political solution to the anti-Semitic problem in the near future, the state of the Holocaust survivors and their descendants seems doomed to continue to merely administer it in a sacrificial manner and to have to defend itself militarily at regular intervals. If one would not only defend Israel's so-called right to exist or if we were to not only defend Israel's so-called right to exist and the survival of the Jewish state, but also allow Israeli society, which has been incessantly warred against and terrorized by Arabs since its creation with the aim of annihilation, to actually live in peace and take it seriously that Israel's security is an obligation of Western states, then a real and long-term pacification of the so-called Middle East conflict would consist solely of doing what should have been done from the outset, and which is entirely fair to the Arabs, given their actions over the last hundred years, the resettlement of the Gaza Palestinians to Egypt, the West Bank Palestinians to Jordan. Why not finally establish an Israeli one-state solution when the Arabs have long had a first Palestinian state in Jordan and have repeatedly rejected the second, most recently in the form of the Trump plan, because they categorically cannot come to terms with the existence of Jewish sovereignty in Palestine? Why shouldn't the Arabs finally pay for permanent anti-Jewish aggression, especially in the context of defeats, as is the usual law of war or any post-war order? 
why shouldn't Jordan and Egypt be forced to accept their brothers or be persuaded to do so with donations? The fact that this only historically plausible and morally evident solution is not considered or is defamed as ultra-right only shows how pro-Arab and at the same time anti-Jewish the global discourse on the Middle East conflict is in reality, despite all assurances to the contrary, pre-structured. On April 7, Lucian D. was on a family trip to Tiberias on the Sea of Galilee with her daughters when she was ambushed near the Israeli settlement of Hamra. During the attack in the northern Jordan Valley, Palestinian terrorists shot at her car with a Kalashnikov, causing it to break down on the shoulder of the highway. The terrorists then opened fire again, killing the two sisters, aged 20 and 15, and critically injuring their mother. The father of the family, Rabbi Leo D., was traveling in a separate car with his other children. He turned back after the attack and was there when paramedics arrived to treat his family. You dreamed of traveling the world, now you're traveling to heaven, Rabbi D said at his daughter's funeral. How am I supposed to explain to Lucy what happened when she wakes up from her coma, he added, while Lucy D was still in a critical condition in hospital. He no longer had to explain anything to her, she also died of her serious injuries three days after the terrorist attack. The case also attracted at least some international attention because the D family are British-Israeli dual nationals who had only moved from London to Efrat in Judea in 2014. CNN presenter Christian Amanpour's comment that the three Ds were killed in a shootout was prototypical of how the international press deals with violence against Jews. She had to apologize to the family of the victims for this, but Rabbi D rightly rejected this as dishonest due to CNN's overall reporting. The case drastically shows how Jewish victims of devious murder attacks are transformed into combatants, especially when it comes to so-called settlers, whose sinister intentions are always well known in Western newsrooms. The fact that the vast majority of them are normal Israeli families like that of Rabbi Leo D. and his murdered wife Lucian must not even be mentioned for the life of the world. Above all, so-called settlers are thought to know that their mere existence in occupied Judea and Samaria violates international law in order to portray them as legitimate targets of hostilities even when they are women and children on a family trip to the Galilee. On May 4, during a raid in Nablus in the Palestinian Autonomous Territories, Israeli security forces killed the three members of Harnas who had planned and committed the assassination. The Qassam Brigades, a Hamas armed group, claimed responsibility for the attack. As of the beginning of October, a total of 34 Israelis had been murdered by terrorists in 2023 alone. On average, there were around 200 terrorist attacks per month in Judea and Samaria alone in the first few months of the year, most of which involved pipe bombs, firebombs, Molotov cocktails, knives and other small weapons. This violence has been a daily occurrence for years. In addition, drivers are regularly pelted with stones, endangered by boulders rolled onto the road and burning car tires, or attacked by deliberately reckless driving, forced off the road or into oncoming traffic. As nothing has improved since the murder of Lucian D. and her daughters, former soldiers offer driver safety training courses in which survival in the event of a terrorist attack is practiced. The danger is a daily occurrence and it is to be expected that the 20 or so terrorist organizations operating in the Palestinian-administered territories will continue to operate unchallenged as long as they do not threaten Mahmoud Abbas and his headquarters in Ramallah. Until then, the president of the Autonomous Authority, who at least officially has around 30,000 security forces under his command, refuses to take action against the various armed groups. This also became clear on the open stage when the security plan, drawn up by U.S. President Biden at the beginning of the year, which envisaged a special Palestinian unit trained in Jordan to ensure order, particularly in the north of the autonomous territories with the cities of Jenin and Nablus, strongholds of terrorism, was completely rejected by Abbas. While the USA and the Europeans cling to the delusional idea of wanting to establish Fatah and the Palestinian Authority as a factor of order and the framework of a future Palestinian state, Abbas makes it clear at every opportunity that he is not only unwilling but also incapable of doing so. It is not only he himself who fuels, finances and supports hatred of Jews and terror against Israel. His influence on the gangs of murderers in Jenin and Nablus is also, to put it mildly, manageable. Even if it wanted to do what the EU and the USA have in their fantasies, it could do nothing against Hamas and other terrorist groups that have the full backing of the population in the West Bank. 
A survey published on November 14 by the Arab World for Research and Development, an institute affiliated with the Palestinian Burzite University, found that 75% of Palestinians surveyed supported the massacre of October 7, of which almost 60% fully supported it. A further 11% did not want to make a decision and only just under 13% were against it. However reliable such figures may be, and however precise the surveyors may be with the methods of empirical social research, these results are consistent with the finding that there is nothing in the Palestinian population that is even remotely comparable to the opposition in Iran, for example. Significantly, approval of the massacre in Gaza, where many people had already felt the consequences in mid-November, is lower than in the West Bank, where more than 80% of people approve of the massacre. Various Palestinian organizations are viewed accordingly, while the Qassam Brigades, the Islamic Jihad, the Al-Aqsa Brigades and Hamas are rated very or mostly positively by the overwhelming majority, in each case more positively by Palestinians in the West Bank than by Palestinians in Gaze. Fatah fails completely with over 70% and the Palestinian Authority even with over 80% negative ratings. What at least remotely resembles statehood in the Palestinian territories, such as a president who regularly talks nonsense in the presence of international dignitaries, corrupt authorities, security officials who could at least theoretically provide a little security and order, is hated by the Palestinians, while the Jew-killing terror gangs can hardly save themselves from approval. It is almost superfluous to mention that all respondents reject Israel. The statements of all representatives and supporters of the Palestinian cause prove anew every day that the conflict has not only been about the settlement and occupation of the entire area from the river to the sea since the Hamas attack. It would therefore be an existential threat for Israel to give up control of Judea and Samaria and thus allow the spread and arming of terrorists in areas that are in the immediate vicinity not only of a music festival and a few villages and kibbutzim, but of Israeli population centers. This circumstance could easily lead to tens or even hundreds of deaths in a terrorist attack along the lines of October 7. There is certainly no shortage of murderousness and sadism, as illustrated by an incident on November 24 in Tulkarm, a town under Palestinian Autonomous Administration immediately on the border with Israel, which is only about 20 kilometers from the coastal town of Netanya. As they were unable to arrest any Jews, members of an armed Palestinian group murdered two men accused of collaborating with Israel. Residents of the town beat and trampled on the bodies after the two were shot in the street. Videos show hundreds of Palestinians flocking to the scene, gawking and filming with their cell phones as men try to hang the mutilated bodies from an electricity pole. As this apparently proved too difficult, the bodies were thrown over the walls of an LTN school, with their feet tied to a wire mesh fence. Among the most disturbing footage of the October 7 massacre, which is also available to the general public, is the murder of a Thai worker by Palestinian civilians. It is a 47-second film sequence from the cell phone of one of the perpetrators. The soundtrack alone tells of incomprehensible barbarity, the voices come from various men grouped around the victim lying on his back on the ground, bleeding and losing consciousness. Excerpts May history bear witness that this is the first person I have ever killed, give me a knife, give me a knife, I swear, I am the one who will kill him, I, I, I beg you, let me kill him, I swear, I will cut off his head, I, I, I beg you, let me kill him, Allahu Akbar. Now one of the men hits the victim with a spade. Another shouts, give me, give me. Take a picture of it, he's a Jew, take a picture of it, says the next man, before he begins to strike the victim's neck with eight blows with the spade, accompanying each blow with cries of Allahu Akbar. Then he throws the spade at the victim. Let history be a witness. In fact, the sequence exemplifies a historically new dimension of anti-Semitic murder, moments in which the Islamist work of extermination differs from that of the National Socialists. The first moment is, cheerful sadism. The phrase was coined by Lord Weidenfeld. The British journalist, publisher and diplomat of Austrian Jewish origin, who died on January 20, 2016 at the age of 96, had fled from the Nazis to England in the 1930s. In one of his last interviews, for Die Welt am Sonntag, December 13, 2015, in the lowest circle of hell, he said, The Nazis organized the extermination of their enemies, first and foremost the Jews, as an industrial measure. It was a disgusting, cold murder without much emotion. 
the Bolsheviks killed millions anonymously in organized famines, murderous resettlements, and executions. Horrific enough. But now these jihadists come along as cheerful sadists and also declare war on the free way of life. What are they doing? They behead and castrate their victims, they ravish women at will, crucify people, systematically mutilate them, and all with obscene sexual pleasure. For me, that is morally the lowest level of humanity. What George Weidenfeld said about IS at the time also applies to October 7th. Obscene sexual pleasure, which of course did not play no role at all in the Holocaust, but was not central either, is an essential element of jihadist horror, the perpetrator enjoys the physical proximity to the victim in the bloodbath, in the literal slaughter. The second moment is the display of the deed. The murderers record themselves and their barbaric actions in photos or videos and disseminate them via social media. In doing so, they not only cause fear and terror, they not only torment the relatives of the victims, they also brag about their deeds and advertise their cause in order to recruit new followers and accomplices. Reporter Douglas Murray recently drew attention to this moment in a much-discussed interview. This is another way in which the Islamists differ from the historical Nazis, who tried to hide the genocide of the Jews from their own people and the world. Perhaps not so much because the Nazis, as Murray said, were ashamed of their deeds, whereas the Hamas terrorists and civilians involved act shamelessly. It is more likely that the Nazis knew, because of their Christian and or bourgeois socialization, that they were crossing a line, every conscience. This is what is meant when it is said that the Nazis sprang from civilization in both senses of the word. Since the Orient, on the other hand, was largely spared such Christian bourgeois civilization, in the sense of Norbert Elias, the disinhibited barbarism of the jihadists can be described as a regression, if at all, a regression from a lower level of socialization. In any case, the Nazis replaced the traditional pogrom, at least in tendency, with a bureaucratization, industrialization and delegation of extermination, which they camouflaged linguistically and locally, for which they only marginally employed sadists, to the exclusion of the population, who knew little about it and were expressly not supposed to participate in the murder. In the perverse self-image of the National Socialist elite, the extermination of the Jews was also a kind of burden that they took upon themselves for the good of humanity, something that they had to struggle through and overcome, indeed, the heroic aspect consisted precisely in the steadfastness with which they endured the horror they had set in motion. This becomes clear in Himmler's pose and speeches, in the pride of having, remained decent, in what one had to do. For the jihadist, the ideology of overcoming oneself, great jihad, applies less to the murder of others, which one enjoys and does not endure, than to the desire for one's own death, either immediately in the suicide bombing or indirectly in the deliberately provoked Israeli reaction. The combination of archaism and modernity therefore works differently for the Islamists than for the Nazis. Hamas combines the classic pogrom involving civilians, escalated to the totally bestial, with state-of-the-art technology, cyber know-how to overcome border fences, smartphones, body cams and social media for their monstrous version of propaganda of the deed. The similarities and differences between Nazis and Hamas do not necessarily lead to the conclusion, as Lord Weidenfeld did in the Welt interview, that the jihadists are worse than the Nazis. Something else should be decisive for the Friends of Israel, if the excuse of the therefore no less false historical appeasement with the Nazis, that one simply could not have imagined the extent of the horror, at least still testifies to something like naive faith in civilization, today's appeasement with Islamism seems to be an expression of civilization fatigue. What's more, since Hamas and its accomplices, as well as IS, publicly celebrate the anti-Semitic bloodlust, any appeasement, any obstruction of the Israeli military, becomes an act of collaboration through complicity. If you realize what a barbaric murder collective you are dealing with when talking about Palestinian society, in the West Bank, the number of 34 terrorist deaths from January to September 2023 seems almost small. This is solely due to the fact that Israel never completely withdrew from the West Bank. The Oslo Accords provided for a division into three categories, areas A, B and C. The A areas, just under 20% of the territory, are controlled by the Palestinian Authority, at least on paper, and consist of the larger cities where most Palestinians live. The B areas, a good 20% of the territory, consist mainly of rural communities and villages. Here, Palestinians have administrative control and Israelis have security control. 
Area C, around 60% of the territory, is completely under Israeli rule and consists of sparsely populated areas, a few Palestinian villages and all Israeli settlements. As the sea areas include the security-relevant Jordan Valley in particular and separate the Palestinian autonomous areas from one another, terrorists cannot move around undisturbed. Although the smuggling of weapons, such as to gaze, cannot be completely prevented, it can at least be made considerably more difficult. In addition, the Israeli army stationed in the sea areas can react quickly and also carry out operations in the A areas, such as the one to eliminate the murderers of Lucy D and her daughters. What is certain is that it is only thanks to this occupation that a second Gaza Strip has not emerged in the West Bank. The critics of Israel of various stripes differ from the annihilation anti-Semites who shout from the river to the sea essentially in that they are supporters of the theory that there is such a thing as a moderate Fatah and a peace partner called the Palestinian Authority with which one must work towards a two-state solution within the 1967 borders. Meaning the 1949 armistice lines where the Arab army's attempt to annihilate the Jews was fortunately halted. Since most of them are not interested in the real Palestinians and the extermination collective they have formed, but willfully ignore it in the name of talk of peace. Ignoring the need for reconciliation and understanding, they are always forced to blame the Jews for the failure of their wishful thinking. A popular plot is to turn the general and security politician Rabin, who only shook hands with the terrorist Arafat with visible reluctance, into a naive peace politician who also murdered the peace process. The main reason why many Israelis supported the controversial Oslo Accords at the time was that they would have loved to get rid of the Palestinians. If it had been possible to turn the terrorists Aratit and Abbas into military dictators like in Egypt or monarchs like in Jordan, with the result that they would have suppressed the terrorists in their own ranks as brutally as the military does in both countries, then an independent Palestinian state that could exist in this way, at least outwardly in a reasonably peaceful manner, would have been a massive relief for Israel. However, since the Oslo process failed and the Palestinians have no interest in building a state, but only in destroying the state and wiping out the Jews, there is still no sign of a state far and wide. Without Israeli support for the Palestinian Authority, even its pseudo-structures would have been destroyed long ago, as in the Gaza Strip. The two-state solution, which was never a solution, but only a compromise that was always rejected by the Arabs, can no longer play a role because the Palestinians have proven themselves to be completely incapable of nation-building over the past 30 years. So even if the land were divided and further sovereignty rights were transferred to the Palestinians, this would not change the fact that there is only one state in the entire area. If we look at the so-called criticism of Israel, as it is usually found in Western countries, we can distinguish between two basic lines of attack, one assumes that even Zionism, the idea of a return to Eretz Israel, the flight from anti-Semitism and National Socialism from Europe as well as the immigration of Holocaust survivors and Arab Jews until the founding of the state, was wrong. For them, the land from the river to the sea belongs to the supposedly autochthonous Arabs who were displaced by vicious Jewish colonists and robbed of their homeland in the course of the Nakba. This current is particularly prevalent at North American universities, where groups such as Black Lives Matter openly show solidarity with Hamas and view their actions as legitimate resistance against the Jewish colonists and oppressors. Their anti-Semitism is fed by anti-Western resentment, especially anti-Americanism. Here, the Jews who set out for the Holy Land are equated very crudely and without any interest in historical particularities with the pioneers of the development of North America, who are seen merely as slave owners and oppressors of blacks and natives. The other school of thought, which uses the jargon of human rights rather than post-colonialism, recognizes the right of the Jews to their own state in principle, but advocates the two-state solution and regards the Jewish presence beyond the 1949 armistice line as illegal, a provocation and a major, if not the greatest, obstacle to peace. Both of these two, fluidly merging lines of attack can always agree on the enemy image par excellence, which is presented worldwide in the media when it comes to patching up Israeli victims of Palestinian murderers and claiming an equivalence between the State of Israel and anti-Semitic terror gangs just a few days after an unprecedented massacre of Jews, Jewish settlers. For this enemy image, it is irrelevant that two completely different population groups should actually be defined as settlers, with the post-colonial current having the more plausible definition. 
Even if it is true that Jews have always lived in the land and formed the clear majority of Jerusalem's population in 1850, it must be considered indisputable that it was the immigration of Jews, who settled, colonized and reclaimed the land, that created the basis for the state of Israel. When friends of Israel insist with good intentions that Jews have been indigenous to Israel for thousands of years, this misses the point mainly because it goes far too far towards the post-colonial lunacy that colonization of a region is a bad thing. The reason why anti-Americanism and anti-Zionism mean the same thing today lies in the similarities to be emphasized between American and Israeli state-building, which necessarily includes emphasizing the importance of settlers, colonists and pioneers for the history of human progress. Propaganda pieces such as the 1619 Project and movements such as Black Lives Matter, whose local Chicago offshoot proudly distributed a paraglider with a Palestinian flag via social networks after October 7, make the unity of anti-Americanism and anti-Zionism particularly clear. For them, people who, despite all the associated adversities, went to America in order to be able to live there more freely, according to their ideas and their religion, and to this end built new, more democratic, better human communities, from which the United States then emerged, are only relevant because they exploited others, kept slaves and displaced the indigenous population. Considering the enormous progress that the United States represented, one can only be glad that the pioneers and founding fathers were not progressives, in the modern sense, but committed to progress. The fact that the United States and Israel share a special relationship is the reason why anti-Americans in the US celebrate Hamas as a liberation movement. However, this is not due to the geostrategic considerations that are so popular with long-distance fanatics. Rather, Americans quite rightly recognize their own history in the efforts of the first Zionists to return to the promised land and create new communities there in which they could live according to their own religious beliefs and from which an independent state emerged in emancipation from the British colonial power. Even if the relationship of the Jews to the land has always existed and even before the beginning of Zionist immigration there were small Jewish communities and a few somewhat larger ones such as in Jerusalem, this is insignificant compared to the impressive achievement of often bitterly poor Jewish refugees, survivors of the Holocaust or pogroms in Eastern Europe and targeted expulsion from the Arab world, who arrived there with little more than the clothes on their backs. Despite poverty and sometimes miserable, difficult conditions, despite heat, drought, war and terror, they went to work and created a better life for themselves and their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and a future for the Jews who had almost been wiped out a short time before. It is this achievement, which borders on the miraculous, that impresses an American from the outset, at least if he has not been given the writings of Edward said, Judith Butler, Franz Fanon or similar intellectual murderers at an elite university, in the humanities. The original settlement, the immigration of Jews from all over the world and the creation of the State of Israel in the sense of the heraldic saying e pluribus unum in the great seal of the United States characterize the country today and not the fact that Jews have always lived in Jerusalem without interruption. The radical enemies of Israel, for whom the injustice already exists in the original settlement, are more honest in that they apply to Israel what is generally considered progressive today. Anti-racism and anti-colonialism are based on the strange idea that there is such a thing as an indigenous indigenous population that is always in the right, whereas external forces embody evil especially when they introduce impositions such as trade, progress, modernity, capitalism and general social change into previously supposedly harmonious indigenous communities. This assumption is only seemingly in sharp contrast to the cosmopolitanism that is otherwise often preached. For in the case of Israel, this only means what anti-colonial lumpen intellectuals imagine it to mean, a Jew-pure Arab state and a non-Jewish state flooded with Arab refugees, in which women, homosexuals and free spirits of all kinds would be oppressed and murdered. Cosmopolitanism means that everyone is allowed to live in the West and that the less Western they are, the more they enrich life there. However, every Jew, North American or European who sets foot elsewhere is an occupier and colonizer who maltreats the peaceful, authentic peoples. The less compatible they are with modern civilization and the demands of the global economy, the more their characteristics must be respected and preserved. This is precisely where the cosmopolitans are in complete agreement with the militant Arab anti-Semites, whose hatred of Jews was not an import from Europe, Nazi Germany, etc., but must be understood as irrational resistance to the establishment of something like a modern, civilized, secularized society. 
Among the claims that are so false that not even the opposite is true is the one that poverty and misery in the Palestinian and Arab world are to blame for anti-Semitism and fuel the conflict. With the beginning of Zionist immigration to Palestine, which was then Turkish and more anachronistically administered than governed, what could be called a Western capitalist mindset took hold there. In this respect, Arab anti-Semitism was not exported from Europe to the Arab world or even to Palestine, but was fed by the inferiority complex resulting from the experience that the Zionists living there at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century became more prosperous due to their education, their culture, their attitude to life, because they were better adapted to the demands of modernity. The driving force behind anti-Semitism has always been envy, which insinuated that the Jews' success was based on unfair means, on their secret domination of institutions, governments and, of course, money and interest. This was drastically intensified by the defeat of the Turks in the First World War, during which the Jewish population of the Holy Land was massively harassed and only escaped the fate of the Armenians through fortunate circumstances, and of course by the British occupation that followed Ottoman rule. This period is central to the emergence of the conflict and its insolubility, not least because it was the combination of Zionism and a modern British administration that made the country's development, which had been hampered under the Turks, possible. Jewish immigration increased, people began to build something there in the confidence of a certain legal security, which in turn attracted more people who found work or wanted to do business. Many of those who are often mistakenly regarded today as some kind of Palestinian natives have ancestors who settled in the British Mandate territory at precisely that time. For many Arabs, the British Mandate period and the Jewish immigration were associated with considerable advantages. However, the fact that they owed these not to their great master race as the Urvok of the Quran, but to perfidious British and haggling Jews, aroused the resentment that still makes the necessary social modernization impossible today. In this respect, anti-colonialism is merely the contemporary expression of Arab anti-Semitism. What both have in common is the refusal to grow up and any responsibility for one's own actions, as expressed in the works of the pro-Palestinian street art producer Banksy, for example. These satisfy the need for childhood, for smearing walls, painting banners, leaving traces and, above all, destroying things that mean something to others. Shifting all the blame onto Israel, the USA and the West, the indeed bad, hardened, but always merely external conditions, not only empowers bottomless meanness and sadistic violence, but also inaction, passivity and stagnation, a regression that, to make matters worse, also results in the insistent demand for permanent alimentación. Like a precocious child, they constantly want to tell everyone what a world is like that they neither know nor understand. The deeper reason for the unwavering love of the radio left for Palestinian terrorism and Islam as a whole lies in the resentment against prosperity acquired through work, which is only barely concealed by revolutionary phraseology, and in the will to destroy, if not outright talk of intifada until victory. This was already laid out from the outset in the blind belief that it was the revolutions that would suddenly and miraculously improve life. The left's love for the French and Russian revolutions exists not in spite of, but because they quickly turned into terror and mass murder. The decisive contrast to American and Israeli independence, which are despised as colonial projects, is that they were based on progressive communities that were already under construction and had to be established and defended as states against external powers. The second colonization, which is denounced by those who speak in the jargon of human rights, which can no longer claim universal validity through the affirmation of slogans such as, Black Lives Matter, has a different character in this respect and is based on the same defense of the already established state. If only those who live in the territories on the Golan, in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank that were conquered during the Six-Day War in 1967 are to be considered settlers, then the talk of, settler colonialism, no longer makes sense. At the time, these territories were larger than Israel in the 1949 borders and had to be controlled simply because the Arab states rejected the land for peace solution proposed by Israel and decided in Khartoum in September 1967 to say no to three things, no to recognition, to peace and to negotiations with Israel. While the military objective was initially to make possible attacks by Egypt, Jordan or Syria more difficult by using the Suez Canal, the Golan Heights and the Jordan Valley as barriers, the strategic objective changed significantly as a result of the peace agreement with Egypt and the return of the Sinai. Giving up land in return for peace was also the idea behind the Oslo process, which at least made the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel possible in 1994. 
However, the terror of the Al-Aqsa Intifada finally made it clear that the danger no longer came from an Egyptian or Jordanian tank attack, but that it was increasingly asymmetric terrorism that threatened Israel's existence. The construction of the barrier fence and the abandonment of the policy of full sovereignty of the A areas, which the Israeli army has repeatedly invaded since the 2000s in order to eliminate terrorists such as the murderers of Lucian D, guaranteed that the regular suicide attacks in Israel's heartland came to an end. The high-tech and party metropolis of Tel Aviv, which has flourished over the last 20 years, is therefore defended not least in the West Bank and by settlers, who are often held in low esteem by liberal Jews and who also serve in the IDF's combat units far more often than average, thus ensuring that the West Bank does not have the same murder potential as Gaza. Israel, which was one of the poorest states in the world when it was founded, is urgently dependent on the protection of its economic centers and the fact that life in Tel Aviv is now relatively safe again and Ben Gurion Airport is not constantly under rocket fire is crucial for the economic survival of the state. The daily Palestinian terror is primarily directed against the approximately 500,000 Israelis who are now branded as illegal settlers by the international community and therefore open to attack. The overwhelming majority of these Jews have decided to settle in Judea and Samaria out of convenience or for economic reasons. Contrary to what is often claimed in the media, most of them are neither radical nor violent. Their crime is that they believe they have the same right to live in this area as in West Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Like the various Israeli governments since 1967, they contradict the invention of international law, according to which Israel is not allowed to build cities, communities and homes in Judea and Samaria. Many believe that the disputed territories are the core of the Jewish homeland and have no moral qualms about living on the land that they believe is part of their historic homeland. They do not believe that a Jew should be denied the opportunity to live somewhere simply because he is Jewish. Many are convinced that the United Nations Partition Plan of 1947, which envisaged the establishment of an independent Arab state on historic Jewish land, was as much a mistake as the Oslo process and that the rejection of partition by the Arabs has destroyed their claim to the region. Like many other Israelis, some are nevertheless prepared to give up parts of Judea and Samaria in return for a peace agreement. Contrary to what anti-Zionist propaganda claims, the mere existence of many Israelis, most of whom live in towns and villages in Judea and Samaria that have nothing in common with what is commonly thought of as a settlement, is by no means an obstacle to peace. Rather, the Israeli presence in the territories and their urban sprawl and fragmentation, as Israel haters like to accusingly present it, is a guarantee that no more Jews will be killed. To give the claim even the appearance of plausibility, the simple fact that there are also perpetrators of violence among the 500,000 Jews in Judea and Samaria must be exaggerated to settler violence and thus used as a reason to discredit an entire population group. Many Israelis had long been aware of the fact that the IDF alone could not protect the Jews from an extermination collective, something that perhaps only dawned on some on October 7. When the terrorists attempted to infiltrate the near AM kibbutz, the community's security officer, 25-year-old Inbul Raven Lieberman, had already assessed the situation and distributed weapons to 12 residents. Three of the terrorists were shot dead and the others were prevented from entering the kibbutz until the Israeli army arrived hours later. Unlike in almost all other communities in the area, there were no dead Israelis in near AM. Since Inbul Raven Lieberman, who of course acquired her skills in an IDF combat unit and takes part in a program for women in leadership positions, does not live in the West Bank, there were even sympathetic reports in the German press. But if Jews in Judea believe that it is necessary to remain vigilant in the face of potential murderers outside their communities, if they understand gatherings of young men or seemingly aimless roaming Palestinians who are already exploring who lives whereas the threat they objectively represent, even before they have to scrape the remains of their children out of the nearest cave or off the street, then they fall under the term, settler violence, for the international community. Like everywhere else, there are also people among the Israeli residents of the West Bank who are prepared to take the law into their own hands or even commit violent crimes, threaten, attack or chase away Palestinians. Those who commit such acts are outside the rule of law and will be prosecuted by the state authorities, as Prime Minister Netanyahu has also made clear. However, he did not do so without rejecting the unproven accusations against the settlers as a whole, as they are regularly made. For example, Selim, one of the largest internationally sponsored NGOs, openly proclaims what it is all about, 
settler violence equals state violence. Since the occupation is already unjust and the root of all evil, every Palestinian who is harmed in the West Bank, whether by the military or a criminal, regardless of whether it can even be proven that Jews were the perpetrators, is a victim of settler violence. This total sublating of any meaningful differentiation between the defense of a residential area by threatened citizens, military operations like the one in Nablus against the murderers of Lucian D. and her daughters and the rare cases of arbitrary violence by Jewish settlers is consequent in that it is only about presenting the world with an equivalent to the uninhibited barbarism of October 7 and Jews who are to blame for their own murder. If you read the many headlines about the alleged increase in settler violence, which are parroted by international politicians from Biden to Baerbach, you can get the impression that this is a huge problem. If you take the trouble to read the articles, firstly they are always based on the same, copied agency reports and secondly they practically never contain evidence of a crime, let alone one committed by a settler. They are usually based either on the report of a Palestinian who observed something from afar or who only claims to have heard about it. It is suggested that he was able to observe the events precisely and identify the criminal as a member of a particular community, although everyone knows that such eyewitness reports, and even more so those based on hearsay, are extremely unreliable. Or the reports of acts of violence come, enriched with misleading statistics, from one of the relevant, internationally sponsored NGOs. These activists often travel to the occupied territories together with Western journalists, who get terribly excited when they are not allowed to move freely everywhere within a security zone. The likelihood that their representatives will happen to be in the vicinity of a Palestinian being arbitrarily attacked is pretty much zero. Therefore, such incidents must be regularly provoked by groups of international activists and Palestinians approaching military posts or residential settlements and harassing the soldiers and residents until arrests are made or a stone comes flying, which can then be presented as evidence. An example of how successfully propaganda is carried out in this way is a report by the NGO Yesh Din, Volunteers for Human Rights. The aim of this group, according to its own statement, is, to oppose the ongoing violation of Palestinian human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories, to document and disseminate accurate and up-to-date information about the systematic violation of human rights in the occupied Palestinian territories to raise public awareness of such violations and to exert public and legal pressure on government authorities to end them. The specialty of this European-funded organization is known in English as Lawfare, from Law, Law and Warfare, Warfare. Petitions to the Supreme Court in Israel and submissions to the International Criminal Court regarding alleged Israeli war crimes are the most important fields of activity of an organization that, according to its own statements, sees the law as a tool in the fight against the Israeli occupation. On November 18, the well-connected Washington magazine Politica reported, citing a document from government circles, that the Biden administration is preparing concrete steps such as visa bans and further sanctions against radical settlers. According to Politica, the forces to be sanctioned are broadly defined in the document, they include individuals or organizations that have been directly or indirectly involved in acts or policies that threaten the security or stability of the West Bank, those that commit acts that intimidate civilians in the West Bank with the purpose or effect of forcing acts of displacement in the West Bank, or those that commit human rights violations or abuses, as well as acts that significantly obstruct, disrupt or impede efforts to achieve a two-state solution. This was the U.S. government's response to internal pressure triggered by two reports. The first, by Yesh Din, claims that 197 Palestinians have been killed by settlers or Israeli forces in the West Bank since October 7. The second, from the United Nations, says that at least 121 Palestinian households, some 1,150 people, including 452 children, have been displaced by settler violence and access restrictions in the same period. Both reports, and the Biden administration addresses this in its memo, make no effort to substantiate actual violence by extremist settlers. Instead, they attempt to list as many cases as possible by presenting the Israeli army's perfectly legitimate actions against terrorists as settler violence. The fact that the army must act in accordance with the significant threat situation since October 7th, which may of course necessitate orders to leave a certain area, is ignored. 
The sanctions planned by the Biden administration, which European states such as France and Germany naturally want to join, could include legal parties and Israeli government and opposition politicians who speak out against further negotiations with the Palestinians, against the two-state solution or in favor of annexing at least the sea areas in Judea and Samaria. This shows what the myth of settler violence is really about, the undermining of a viable and livable state of Israel, which simply cannot exist in the foreseeable future without control over the terrorists in the so-called Palestinian territories. An internal Israeli army report, which was passed on to the newspaper Yediath Aronoth and published on December 5, paints a completely different picture than the one on the basis of which the Biden government thought it had to act. In fact, there has been no increase at all in so-called settler violence since October 7. In the first week of October, the military recorded 32 incidents of nationalist crime, including four serious attacks and 19 lesser offenses. However, in the week following the Hamas attacks on October 7, the forces recorded only 24 incidents, three of which were classified as serious. Between October 15 and 21, this number decreased further, with only 10 cases reported. Between October 22 and 28, the number jumped to 38, but dropped again in the following weeks. According to the Israeli police, the number of incidents in which Jews turned violent out of nationalist motives fell by 50% compared to the previous year. In the period from October 7, the beginning of the war, to November 7, police recorded 97 incidents of illegal activity attributed to Jews in the area, compared to 184 crimes in the same period in 2022. Police observed a decrease across the spectrum of crimes from violence to vandalism. The eagerness with which these accusations, which have to be clarified by the Israeli security forces, and the problems with individual, close extremists, which exist in Judea Samaria as in any other country, especially in those that are regularly exposed to terrorism, are inflated into the security and peace obstacle par excellence, says something above all about the actors who are defaming Israel. One thing is certain, as Israel is dependent on US support in the Gaza war, the government will have to do everything it can, for as long as it can, to appease the murderers in the autonomous territories who have been incited by the slanderous talk of settler violence. As a consequence, this means dead Israelis, as the murder attack at a bus stop in Jerusalem on November 30, 2023 proves. In recent decades, parts of Israel and many of its global supporters, including the Federal Republic of Germany despite all the nastiness and especially in view of the open anti-Semitism of numerous governments in Europe, have often limited themselves to justifying the defense of Israel and its right to exist on the basis of the Holocaust. In many countries, for example, institutes have emerged that are dedicated to Jewish history, research into genocide, the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, but which have no problem presenting the murder collective in Gaza and the West Bank as civilian victims of Israeli aggression, apartheid or superiority ideology, which is partly a consequence of the fact that research fields defined in identitarian terms always attract people who have little to offer apart from the sought-after identity. Characteristic, origin, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Modern Zionism, be it that of the settlers, who tell the story of the return to Eretz Israel, to Judea and Samaria, possibly even linking it to eschatological ideas of redemption, Dan Diner, be it that of Inbul Rabin Lieberman, who demonstrates against the government and organizes the defense of her kibbutz against mortal enemies, has, on the other hand, largely detached itself from the Jewish narrative of sacrifice. This Zionism certainly does not want to hear about a Palestinian narrative of victimhood that absolves them from taking responsibility for the formation of their own nation and a society that is even remotely civil. Israel today is a progressive state that believes in its future, not least because it has increasingly detached itself from the negative founding myth of Israel as a consequence of the history of persecution that culminated in the Holocaust. Today, the pioneering achievements of the first kibbutzim, the endeavors of the Yishuv, the victorious wars and the return of many Jews to the the pioneering achievements of the first kibbutzim, the efforts of the Yishuv, the victorious wars and the return of many Jews to the new or re-established state of Israel form the basis of a national narrative that does not promote sadness or feelings of guilt for one's own existence, but justified pride in what has been achieved. Based on this, many Israelis not only rightly claim to occupy the territories conquered in the just and completely won war of 1967, but also, after more than 50 years of futile efforts to reach a settlement with Syria and the Palestinians, to exercise full sovereignty over the Golan Heights, Judea, 
Samaria, and Gaza and to unilaterally take the steps that will allow Jews to live in a state without fear of anti-Semitic persecution in the future. They should not and cannot rely on an international community firmly on the side of Hamas, which can be sure of the cues of its useful Jewish idiots in NGOs and at international universities. For this community regards Zionists as eternal settlers on stolen land, and not only in Efrat and Hamra, but also in Jerusalem, near A.M. and Tel Aviv in case of doubt. October 17, 2023, from 7 p.m. Israel time, a wave of popular Islamic anger pours over the countries of the Middle East. The trigger is a rumor about the Jews. It is said that an Israeli missile has hit the Al-Ali hospital in Gaza City. The source. A Hamas health authority. This false report is spread by international news agencies including the New York Times, together with the unconfirmed information that hundreds of people have been killed. A few hours later, Israel provided photographic evidence to the contrary, it was a misfired Islamic Jihad rocket that had hit a parking lot near the hospital. It later transpired that hundreds of people could not have been killed, but rather several dozen. Of course, the Islamic mob on the streets is not interested in this correction. Ten days after Hamas brutally murdered, tortured or raped more than 1,200 people in Israel and kidnapped around 240 people, the situation in Egypt, Jordan and Morocco is threatening to spiral out of control. The mob is demanding that governments break off all relations with Israel, if not military aid for Hamas' campaign of destruction. The verbally radical statements from the respective governments are not long in coming. Around midday on October 18, all the countries mentioned declare in unison that they condemn the Israeli attack on the Al-Ali hospital. The ex-account of the Saudi Arabian Foreign Ministry also read, Saudi Arabia strongly condemns the heinous crime committed by the Israeli occupation forces in bombing the Al-Ali hospital in the Gaza Strip, which resulted in the deaths of hundreds of civilians, including children, as well as injured and wounded. The Islamic mob has only just calmed down after the explosion of the misfired rocket at Al-Ali Hospital when a remarkable video is already circulating on social media. It shows, Turkey IBN Faisal, 78 years old and former Saudi intelligence chief. He spoke in English in a speech at the Baker Institute in Houston on October 17. Three quarters of his speech consisted of vicious, anti-Semitic accusations against Israel, he accused Israel of imprisoning Palestinians in concentration camps, driving them out of Gaza or bombing them indiscriminately. At the same time, he condemns Hamas terror as un-Islamic, attacking women, children, the elderly in places of worship is contrary to Islamic norms, according to IBN Faisal. He then utters two remarkable sentences that deserve a closer look. Firstly, I condemn Hamas for sabotaging Saudi Arabia's efforts to find a peaceful solution to the plight of the Palestinians. A sentence to which we will return. And secondly, I condemn Israel for transferring Qatari funds to Hamas, which Israel itself classifies as a terrorist organization. In a speech on the 40th anniversary of the National Council for Saudi American Relations in mid-November, Turkey IBN Faisal went even further. He elaborated, before October 7, Israel allowed Qatari funds to pass through to Hamas in the belief that economic prosperity would tame Hamas, an assessment that Israeli security hardliners would likely agree with. In 2021, Haritz reported that around $3 billion had flowed into the terrorists' coffers in this way in the ten previous years. According to the report, Netanyahu tacitly approved the money transfer via Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv because he thought it would keep Hamas on a tight leash, Israel would have peace from rockets, he calculated, as long as only Hamas received its money from Doha. An attack on Israel would in turn lead to a freeze on money from Qatar, as Israel would no longer allow the money suitcase planes to land. However, the policy of the money suitcase appeal has always been controversial on the right of Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud and in the military. October 7 showed how right the critics were, and how fatal Netanyahu's misconception was that Hamas was acting as rationally behind its supposedly Islamist rhetoric as any other corrupt government in the Middle East. The background the Royal House of Al Saud had imposed a sea and land blockade on Qatar from 2017 to 2021 together with the United Arab Emirates. The accusation at the time was that Qatar was financing international Islamist terrorism, which also threatened the interests of both royal houses. 
There is indeed great concern in both Gulf monarchies that Islamists could overthrow the ruling houses and cause chaos similar to that in North Africa during the so-called Arab Spring. The Qatari state broadcaster Al Jazeera, which played a key role in fueling the Arab Spring, with the help of the televised sermons of Muslim brother Yusuf al karadawi and celebrated the Hamas massacres after October 7, is banned in Saudi Arabia. The royal family also considers it a threat that Qatar maintains good relations with the Iranian mullahs, whose proxy Hamas acts as. The fact that Qatar has also been hosting and financially supporting the Hamas leadership around Ismail Haniyeh in the capital Doha since 2012 makes Riyadh even more uneasy. According to Rebecca Skonenbach, Turkey IBN Faisal's real message to Israel could be as follows, Israel allowed the payments to Gaza to go through, even though it was clear that Hamas was also benefiting from them. Anyone who believes they can fight terror with Qatar is mistaken. Alternative, Saudi Arabia. The Saudi monarchy, which for selfish reasons wants to secure its exclusive sphere of power and thus also its population, knows exactly what kind of opponent it is up against here, led by the Muslim Brotherhood and the Iranian mullahs. The goal of this Islamic movement is global jihad, its fainals are called Intifada, September 11th or Al-Aqsa Flood, as Hamas propaganda term for the massacre on October 7th goes. The Islamic International considers the destruction of Israel and the expulsion or murder of all Jews from the Middle East to be the necessary, but by no means sufficient, prerequisite for the establishment of its caliphate. Israel is not their only goal. The overthrow of the Gulf monarchies is also a long-term goal, and not just since the Arab Spring. They are seen as westernized and corrupt, downright reactionary. Accordingly, they are striving to replace them with a post-national Islamic people's democracy. All the losses they suffer through defeats are seen by them, according to an apt expression by Joaquin Brun, only as the crossroads to the final victory. When the Hamas Muslim brothers call their massacre on October 7 merely a dress rehearsal, they are showing what they are about, a campaign of destruction into infinity, which is by no means over with the destruction of Israel. This campaign did not just begin in 1948 with the founding of Israel, but with the founding of the Muslim Brotherhood 20 years earlier by the Egyptian elementary school teacher and ardent anti-Semite Hassan al-Banna. To this day, its millions of followers believe that Islam is the solution against supposed Western decadence, but also for the restoration of the caliphate, whose end after the First World War is blamed not least on the sinister activities of world Jewry. In the early 1930s, the Muslim Brotherhood initially thought that they could help Islam gain power in Egypt through Islamic charity and Quran lessons. When this failed, they took up arms. The Muslim Brotherhood responded to the increased immigration of persecuted Jews to Palestine in the 1940s and 1940s not only with attacks on British Mandate territory, but also with pogroms against Jews in Cairo. They carried out terrorist attacks underground, while outwardly they acted as a charity racket. This explains the double face of the Muslim Brotherhood, which it maintains to this day also in the form of various front organizations around the world. At the same time, they pinned their hopes on a Nazi victory in the Second World War. Accordingly, Muslim Brotherhood founder Hassan al-Banna also saw Germany's defeat against the Allies as a bitter setback for the cause of Islam. In a 1946 eulogy to Jerusalem's Nazi Grand Mufti Amin al-Husseini, al-Banna summarized what he hoped for from the Palestinians, resistance to the founding of the Israeli state, Germany and Hitler are no more, but Amin al-Husseini will continue the fight. Just as Hamas and its partner organizations have never been interested in a Palestinian state alongside Israel, but have always been concerned with the destruction of the Jewish state, the Muslim Brotherhood is also committed to the modern principle of the nation as such. This explains why the Muslim Brotherhood was initially open to Jamal Abdel Nasser's pan-Arab socialist revolution in the 1950s. Nasser is said to have personally attended the sermons of Muslim brother Sayyid Qutb shortly before he came to power. Both movements had found a common enemy in Israel and the influence of the West on the Middle East. And they shared the common goal of uniting the Arab states against this enemy. The break between the Muslim Brotherhood and Nasser was not caused by irreconcilable ideological differences, but by a power struggle following the revolution. An offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood had already formed in Gaza in the 1940s, which has been operating under the name Hamas since 1988. 
The Muslim Brotherhood grew massively after the Arab defeats against Israel in 1967 and 1973, when it became clear that Islamism would become the new guiding ideology of the Middle East after Pan-Arabism. Since the persecution by Nasser and until the Arab Spring in 2011, the Muslim Brotherhood, which had been ousted in Egypt, was increasingly perceived in the West as a democratic, moderate, and modern alternative to the secular dictatorships and Gulf monarchies in the Middle East. Many Muslim brothers who had gone to the West went through a modern education and became eloquent speakers for the Islamic cause without ever admitting their affiliation to the Muslim Brotherhood. Hassan al banas grandson Tariq Ramadan, who taught at prestigious Western universities until a sexual assault scandal broke out and describes himself tellingly as a reformed Salafist, is a good example of this. And, as in Cairo and Gaza in the past, they founded charity associations that relieved the state authorities in the West with charitable offers for the Muslim population. Officially, they reject violence, unless it is against the Israeli occupiers or against authoritarian rulers and monarchs in the Middle East. After Nasser's persecution began in the 1950s, many Muslim brothers fled to Saudi Arabia. At the time, Saudi Arabia was waging a proxy war against Nasser in Yemen, the conservative Wahhabi monarchy saw the fact that Muslim brothers came to the country as political refugees in a positive light in terms of power politics. The Saudis were not to revise their policy of extending an outstretched hand, which went hand in hand with the mass admission of Muslim brothers, until much later. Until after the first Gulf War, and even after September 11, 2001, Saudi Arabia tolerated and supported the Muslim Brotherhood in its own country. Conversely, they had to undertake not to be politically active in the country and not to publicly attack the quietest doctrine of Wahhabism. This dictates a fundamentalist everyday Islam and at the same time punishes any violation of the authorities. Until then, the Muslim Brotherhood had been involved in the modernization of the Wahhabi education system, taking on key roles in ministries and society. They literate the population and in this way subliminally spread their ideology. They viewed Saudi Arabia's anti-Israeli stance, which was particularly evident in the fact that the monarchy enforced an OPEC oil supply freeze in 1973 during the Yom Kippur War, which in turn triggered the oil crisis, with benevolence. Saudi Arabia also supported Islamists internationally. The Saudis' calculation was based on the hope that supporting Islamists abroad and tolerating them at home would at least leave the Wahhabi monarchy untouched. The attack on the Great Mosque in Mecca in 1979, when Islamic end-time purists occupied the Kaaba and demanded a reversal of westernization, was threat enough for the royal family. The policy of extending a hand to the Muslim Brotherhood was only to change with the Arab Spring and the election of Muslim brother Mohammed Morsi as Egyptian president, whom the Saudis increasingly perceived as a threat to the royal family. In 2014, Saudi Arabia finally banned the Muslim Brotherhood. This change of course by the royal house towards the Muslim Brotherhood was also reflected in the murder of a prominent Muslim brother, Jamal Khashoggi, who had already joined the Muslim Brotherhood in the 1970s. He was not only, as it is often said in the Western media, a Saudi foreign journalist who was allowed to interview Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan in 1987, for example, but also an intimate connoisseur of the Islamist scene. Khashoggi's services were also gratefully used by the Saudi Secret Service under the then chief spy Inerki IBN Faisal. As Khashoggi later wrote in an opinion piece for the Washington Post, he considered the Muslim Brotherhood to be the decisive reform movement in the Arab world and in Saudi Arabia. The open break with the Saudi monarchy came when Khashoggi attacked Wahhabism from his progressive, i.e. Muslim Brotherhood perspective in the early 2000s, and thus violated the ban on political activity that the Saudis had imposed on the Muslim Brotherhood. The Saudis then imposed a ban on him, which was temporarily sublated due to his good contacts with Turkey IBN Faisal. But he did not stop in 2013, two years after the start of the Arab Spring, Khashoggi published the book Arab Spring, Time of the Muslim Brotherhood. Jean Ziegler, Swiss professor of sociology and deserving member of the Swiss Social Democratic Party, does not like global capitalism, the USA, or the so-called Western world in general, this became clear as early as 2001, when he initiated a media campaign directed against the US campaign against the Taliban in Afghanistan, which centered on the insane claim that the USA and its allies were forbidding the dropping of food in the war zone and thus knowingly forcing a humanitarian catastrophe. Among the Afghan civilian population. 
Like so many enemies of Western civilization, Ziegler does not particularly like Israel either, after all, according to Ziegler in a 2003 report on the food situation in the Gaza Strip and West Bank, Israel also carries out targeted state terror against the civilian Palestinians, commits war crimes incessantly and with impunity and generally proceeds in a very similar way to Nazi Germany. What exactly may have motivated Mr. Ziegler, whose task as UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food would actually only be to investigate and assess the nutritional situation of people in the West Bank, Gaza Strip and elsewhere, to simply make up the malnutrition of large parts of the Palestinian population in order to be able to blame it on the Jewish state like so many other things and thus have one more excuse at hand to call for a boycott of Israeli goods worldwide, one can only guess. It cannot have been compassion for those suffering from hunger and anger against those who allow or even intend to do so, because it is significant that the commission he sent to the West Bank and Gaza Strip to investigate the conditions there was the only one, he seems to have had little interest in actual famines such as those in Burundi, Liberia, Sierra Leone and elsewhere, and areas where hunger is deliberately used by the government as a weapon against unwelcome sections of the population. Such as in Sudan, are not able to attract Ziegler's attention although in Sudan for decades and for approximate 18 months, especially in Darfur, people have been deliberately driven out of their villages and thus cut off from their food sources, and human rights organizations warn that many deaths from starvation and disease are to be expected, he has not yet sent a delegate there. Although Ziegler does not go as far as Sudan's ambassador to the EU, who defiantly replied to reports of a humanitarian crisis in Darfur, there is no famine there, Tejas Spiegel, 28.07. 04, but he also fails to mention the Sudanese government's involvement in the conditions in the west of the country, not a word can be read in his report on Sudan about the fact that its government forced the food and water shortages in the region in the first place and that in the fight against suspected black African rebels, the government has used and tolerated starvation as a weapon against the population for decades, as well as displacement, pillaging, rape and the targeted murder of tens of thousands of people. Not a word is heard from Ziegler about the fact that international aid organizations are denied access to areas threatened by famine. But the perpetrators in Khartoum and Darfur are not Jews, but Arabs who, like their brothers and sisters in Palestine, according to the exiled Sudanese writer Tajib Salik, representative of so many supporters of pan-Arab solidarity, had not just one, like the Jews of Europe, but two traumatic experiences, colonization and the creation of Israel in Palestine. Freitag, April 19, 2002. As long as Israel still exists, the trauma cannot be overcome, as long as Israel remains a stake in the flesh of the Arab people, there will be no peace in the Middle East, neither in the West Bank, in Jerusalem nor in Sudan, according to the implicit thesis. The real problem in the region is Israel, and this, according to the lunatic logic, is only proven once again by Sudan, after all, the rebels in South Sudan, against whom the Arab government in Khartoum has been fighting for decades, were and are logistically supported by Israel. With his manic fixation on the alleged atrocities committed by the Israelis, Jean Ziegler is in good company within the UN, six of the only ten emergency special sessions ever convened by the UN were dedicated solely to the cause of Israel, the last of which has been exclusively about occupied East Jerusalem and the other occupied Palestinian territories since 1997, SC 27.04, and from which the request was made to the International Court of Justice to finally examine the legality of the Israeli, as it is so beautifully called in left-wing circles, apartheid wall. The 15 judges of the court ruled entirely in line with the UN, which, with the exception of the USA and the Marshall Islands, usually condemns any Israeli response to terror as illegal, WAMS, June 27, 04, and on July 9 of this year, as expected, described the construction of the security fence as illegal. The European and Arab public applauded and since then the demand to deal with these Nazis of the 21st century, as with those of the 20th century has become increasingly clear. Almost 30% of the reports and resolutions of the UN Commission on Human Rights, in which the countries of the Arab Islamic African bloc form an automatic majority, SC, 20.0704, condemn Israeli actions or plans, the last one was passed in April of this year and condemns in general terms, the Israeli treatment of the Palestinians, and the Israeli occupation of the Golan Heights, Gibbet. 
A further considerable percentage of the resolutions and reports are also directed against the defamation of Islam and discrimination against Muslims and Arabs, WAMS, June 27, 04, by Israel and the USA, not a single one, however, against Lebanon, where the Palestinians who have fled there are still being held in camps and enjoy no civil rights whatsoever. Such reports and draft resolutions are usually submitted by members of parliament from Arab states and are passed with the tacit approval of the European states. Analogous to the UN Human Rights Commission, to which Israel has not been elected since 1970 and of which the USA was not a member at least in 2002, the non-governmental human rights groups usually behave, they stormed through Jenin to investigate, falsified, reports of Jews massacring Arabs, and remained silent when thousands of Palestinians were killed by Jordan during Black September. In 1970, Boston Globe, May 10, 02. Every Arab is considered a potential victim of Israel and therefore an actual victim of history, who should therefore be held accountable. However, if crimes are committed by so-called Arabs in which, even with the worst will in the world, no involvement of Israeli or U.S. secret services and troops can be traced, as is currently the case in western Sudan, then all the humanitarian pathos and actionism in the UN quickly comes to an end, the Human Rights Commission presents only a paltry 23-page report on the conditions in Darfur. The camps there and those in Chad, which were visited by a delegation together with representatives of Khartoum, and the Security Council only manages to pass a resolution after weeks of discussion, which is intended to persuade the Sudanese government to stop the events it is supporting in Darfur and to punish the perpetrators, but does not hold out the prospect of any sanctions as a means of exerting pressure. But what do we actually know about what is happening in Sudan? It is assumed that things have never been good there. The country has been ruled for centuries by Arabized elites based in northern Sudan, particularly in the capital Khartoum. In the 19th century, when the country was still part of the crumbling Ottoman Empire, they dreamed of establishing a modern all-Islamic federation, an idea which, inspired by the teachings of Wahhab and his Sudanese counterpart Muhammad Ahmed, the God-guided Mahdi, who spread his concept of a reformed modern Islam throughout the country in the bloodiest manner, was abandoned towards the end of the century in favor of the Pan-Arab idea. Establishing the rule of Allah at least on Sudanese territory has been the declared goal of the Khartoum elites since the country's independence in 1956. However, the non-Islamic black Africans in the south of the country resisted any missionary campaign and had not forgotten that their ancestors had been offered for sale on the slave markets of North Africa by these same ruling gangs until the end of the 19th century. Since Sudan's independence, civil war has been raging there between rebellious black African Christians and animists and the changing despotisms in the north of the country and their more or less official troops. In February last year, open war broke out in the Darfur region in western Sudan. Attacks by the Janjaweed, Immortal Knights, FAZ, July 28, 04, or, Riders with Guns, Le Monde Diplomatique, May 2004, who consider themselves part of the Arab minority in Darfur, on villages inhabited by black Africans have been known there since the early 1990s. When Arab nomads who had fled from Chad allied themselves with those in Darfur and began to drive the farmers out of their villages in the fight for the region's scarce water reserves. However, the conflict in Darfur only intensified after the Darfur Liberation Army, DLF, which was founded in 2000 and renamed the Sudan Liberation Movement slash Sudan Liberation Army, SLM slash A, in March of the same year, decided to join forces with the Justice and Equality Movement, JEM, on February 25, 2003 to engage in armed resistance against the attacks by the Janjaweed. Since then, armed Arab gangs have been marauding through the villages, burning and killing anything that gets in their way, the result, an estimated 120,000 victims of violence, to which another 60,000 dead will be added, who will perish of disease and malnutrition, NZZ, 24, slash 25.07.04, and over a million people who have left their villages as a result of the attacks by the Janjaweed and who have since been wandering around the region or have been able to save themselves in camps on the border with or in Chad. Similar to the South Sudanese Sudan People's Liberation Army, SPLA, led by John Garang, the rebels in Darfur are also fighting against the political and economic marginalization of their region forced by the government in Khartoum. There is a lack of electricity, water, schools and roads in the south and in the Darfur region, and against the forced Arabization of the entire country since 1989. 
as was once the case in the south of the country, where the Mujahideen of the Paramilitary Popular Defense Force, PDF, received all the support they could wish for from the government, the government also decided on Darfur, after the rebels scored their first military successes, such as the capture of the region's second largest city, Melite, the government in Khartoum decided to intervene. Although the rebels in Darfur are not being attacked with poison gas supplied from Iraq, as was once. The case in the south, the Sudanese Air Force regularly flies attacks on villages that are suspected of harboring rebels, and the Arab militias in Darfur are also being supplied by the government not only with state-of-the-art weapons, but also with trained troops. The Janjaweed can therefore not simply be described as militias supported by the Sudanese government. They are deliberately working together with the government troops and can also count on impunity for their massive crimes, says Kenneth Roth. But why all this? According to popular opinion, the Arab Muslims in northern Sudan are suppressing the population groups striving for secession in the east, west and especially the south of the country solely to prevent the balkanization of Sudan. In Darfur, however, virtually no one votes for secession and in the south of the country, too, the SPLM has long fought for the reform of the state towards an undivided, secular Sudan. The now popular idea of a separate, independent state results more from mistrust of the Khartoum government, which has so far failed to adhere to one of the agreements reached in various treaties, than from ideological premises. That the real reason for the recurring conflicts in the south and west of the country is solely to be seen in the fact that, as can be read in Le Monde Diplomatique, for example, Arab nomads, who need water and grazing land for their animals, fight, against African farmers who want to protect the meager yields of their land, May 2004, is just as unconvincing, as the unimaginable brutality with which paramilitary and official troops act remains puzzling. And the theory that it is sheer greed for petrodollars alone, as some never tire of claiming, that incites murder and manslaughter is also doubtful, as the clashes were already underway throughout the country before the first barrel of oil had even been extracted. When demands for independence were raised in what is now Sudan in the 1940s, the British colonial administration developed plans to divide the country in two, northern Sudan, predominantly inhabited by Muslim Arabs, was to become independent, and the south of the country was to be annexed to the East African colonies. However, at the Juba Conference in 1947, Great Britain abandoned this plan, which was opposed by the northern Sudanese, who did not want to be deprived of their access to the fertile plains in the south. The south was also considered too unstable, the development gap in this economically neglected region was too great and the various southern Sudanese tribes appeared to be too divided among themselves. The decisive factor for the British decision was ultimately Nasser's takeover of Egypt in 1952, an independent northern Sudanese state could follow Egypt's example and enter into an alliance with the Soviet Union, while a united, strong Sudan with western ties would create a certain balance in the region. Even before independence, however, a dispute arose in Sudan over the country's future constitution, democratic, federal and secular was the view in the south, while the new state in the north was envisioned as Islamic and centralized. With the transfer of power to the Arabized elites in Khartoum, who had been educated at Islamic Egyptian universities, the conflict came to a head, as there was no consensus in the north of the new republic either, some, especially the Sudanese Nasserists and members of the Ba'ath Party, who were pan-Arab in orientation, voted for Sudan's close ties to Egypt and other Arab socialist-oriented countries, such as Iraq or Syria later on, others spoke out in favor of establishing a closed Islamic republic, and still others tinkered with a new identity, including the Islamic faith, of course. There was agreement in the north on only two points, that the emerging state should be Islamic and that the infidel South Sudanese should be dealt with according to the old custom, if they could not be enslaved as they once were, they should be excluded from the public life of the state as far as possible. However, the southern Sudanese did not give in and stuck to their demand for a constitution based on the British model, which would not only have established a secular state but also guaranteed them complete equality. The first civil war broke out even before Sudan gained independence. In 1958, General Aboud, a supporter of the National Islamic Path, seized power. He accused his civilian predecessors of having betrayed the true Islam of Arabia and launched a military campaign to homogenize and Islamize the country. The practice of other religions was criminalized and an attempt was made to incorporate the South into an all Sudanese Islamic community by means of large scale missionary campaigns. 
However, the repression only really fueled the resistance of the Christian and animist Southern Sudanese. In the early 1960s, various rebel groups that had previously operated autonomously joined forces to form the Anya Naya, Snake Venom, and, logistically supported by Israel, which sent them weapons by Uganda, did their bit to overthrow the dictator. Three years later, the members of the Anya Naya had become hopelessly divided among themselves due to political differences, a new constitutional debate began, in which it became clear for the first time what kind of minds the pan-Arab-oriented Islamists of the North were actually made of, the projection, in which Hassan al-Turabi, a supporter of the Muslim Brotherhood who would later found the National Islamic Front, NIF, and Sadig al-Mahdi, a descendant of the God-guided Prophet, were significantly involved, not only provided for the introduction of Sharia law and the prohibition of all godless excesses, namely atheism, Christianity, animist religions and communism, but also called for a ban on the right to stand for election for all non-Muslim and non-Arab inhabitants of the country, i.e. the exclusion of all black Africans, Christians, animists and Muslims alike, from parliament. There was no danger of excluding members of their own race from parliament, as almost 100% of Sudan's Arabs were professed Muslims. In contrast to the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II, who campaigned for the cooperation of all Islamic peoples, with the aim of establishing a modern all-Islamic federation, Al-Turabi and other supporters of the pan-Arab idea dreamed of a greater Arabia, whether this was politically united or divided into various Arab states. It was no longer faith that united them, but dissent, the all-Arab idea had replaced the all-Islamic idea. This political disenfranchisement of the black population of Sudan was accompanied by a scorched earth policy. Entire villages were burnt down, harvests destroyed, massacres of the black population carried out and the surviving inhabitants of the places in question were deported to the north, where, like their ancestors, they eked out an existence in conditions that were in no way inferior to those of slavery. In May 1969, this situation seemed to have come to a temporary end, the coup d'état by al numeri a pan-Arab Nasserist supported by both socialists and communists, prevented the establishment of a presidential Islamic Republic and a peace agreement was signed between the government and the southern Sudanese rebels in Addis Ababa in 1972. The still completely undeveloped South was granted its own parliament and a certain degree of autonomy, support measures such as the construction of a University in the southern Sudanese capital Juba were initiated and the Anya Naya were incorporated into the regular army. However, the situation in Sudan soon changed again, after the heads of the leading communists and socialists were cut off following a failed coup attempt, both parties were criminalized and the country found itself in a severe economic crisis, which caused the dissatisfied population to revolt, Numeri increasingly returned to his Arab Islamic roots. He distanced himself from the state socialist ideas of the Nasserists and Baathists and propagated, entirely in the spirit of the Umma party. Islam as the only true unifying factor. He consequent introduced a one-party system in 1972. In 1977, he openly allied himself with the Al-Ansar slash Umma party, whose aim was to promote Shawa Islamia, i.e. Islamic awakening, as well as the Muslim Brotherhood party around Al-Turabi, and had himself appointed ruler of the faithful. At the end of the 1970s, he even ordered the cleansing of Khartoum, as more and more black Sudanese settled there either because they had been deported there to do the menial work required, or because they had fled to the north to escape the civil war in the south, the Arab population of the capital feared racial alienation and declared a need for action. All members of the black race that the government troops could get hold of, regardless of religion, were then herded into camps and deported to the south. A further step on the path to Islamization was taken in 1983, when Numeri introduced Sharia law as the only law applicable to all. Since then, headscarves and alcohol bans have also been compulsory in the south of the country and, as in all other Islamic states, violations of Islamic law have been punished with flogging, e.g. for rape, amputation of a hand and a foot, e.g. for theft, or even death, e.g. for apostasy from Islam. The laws of Islam increasingly served merely to legitimize the power, political interests of the Arab elites in Khartoum and so the peace treaty with the Anya Naya was summarily declared null and void on the grounds that Islamic Arab tradition teaches that treaties concluded with unbelievers are not binding for true believers. In order to finally break the resistance, the Numeri government simultaneously pursued a policy of economic destabilization of the already underdeveloped South as well as the West and East of the country 
the construction of canals, for example, literally dug up the water for farmers in various regions, and measures begun to improve the infrastructure, such as the construction of roads, were discontinued, so that even today large areas in the south and west of the country are still cut off. From the world. The oil, which has been extracted in the southeast of the country since 1978, has been and continues to be transported to refineries in the north of the country, and the money collected, China and France in particular have concluded lucrative contracts with the Sudanese government for all concerned, is mainly used to buy weapons from Switzerland or Russia, which are then used against the population in the various remote parts of the country. With the successful coup d'état by Colonel al-Bashir, who was supported by the NIF around al-Turabi, the situation in Sudan worsened again. Bashir, who fought on the Egyptian side in the Yom Kippur War against Israel, and his cabinet now vowed to finally establish the kingdom of God on the soil of Sudan and to Islamize the entire country. They proclaimed a republic in which Islam, as in Iran, became the official state philosophy. At the same time, they declared jihad on all infidels and pushed ahead with the forced Arabization of all areas of society, Arabic was declared the only permitted language, the practice of traditional African customs was made a punishable offense, all Christian and secular schools were closed and replaced by Quranic schools, which of course only boys were allowed to attend, where they were educated to become brave mujahideen for the holy war against infidels in their own country as well as against Israel and the USA. Since then, violations of Islamic law have not only been sanctioned with brutal corporal punishment, but the punishment is also carried out in public in front of jeering crowds, as under the Taliban in Afghanistan. However, the measures taken by Bashir against the South Sudanese population show that forced Arabization also implies quite different things. For the first time, the army also used poison gas against southern Sudanese villages, children and young women alike were deported to the north of the country if they were not massacred by the roving gangs in the name of Islam some to be re-educated into true believers in Islamic homes and trained as cannon fodder for the jihad, others to do menial labor in Arab households and to be of service to the heads of households in yet another completely different way. Young men were conscripted into often deadly forced labor, e.g. for the construction of canals, while useless old men were simply left to die of starvation, thus furthering the destruction of the country's black African population. Under the leadership of al-Turabi, the ideological mastermind behind the military Bashir, Sudan developed into an attractive base for Islamist groups in the 1990s. In 1991, Al-Turabi founded the Popular Arab and Islamic Conference, PAIC, an international umbrella organization of radical Islamist forces to which all fundamentalist Islamic regimes belong. And 1991 was also the year in which Osama bin Laden, who had been expelled from Saudi Arabia due to his involvement in various terrorist activities against American institutions, found asylum in Sudan. He was a welcome guest there, as he not only financed various government building projects, but also supported the training and maintenance of the Mujahideen, who were and still are being pampered by the government and who have distinguished themselves worldwide in the fight for Islam. It is assumed that both the first attack on the WTC and the assassination attempt on Egyptian President Mubarak in Addis Ababa in 1995 were largely prepared by terrorists based in Sudan. The USA put Sudan on its list of rogue states as early as 1993 and Clinton imposed extensive economic sanctions against the country in 1997, so that Bashir felt compelled to at least deport bin Laden to Afghanistan in 1996. However, the government only adopted an outwardly moderate course after a Sudanese pharmaceutical factory, which was believed to be producing nerve gas, was destroyed by American cruise missiles in response to the attacks on U.S. embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. In 1999, Bashir, who feared the violent removal of his regime by foreign troops and also the bankruptcy of a country on the brink of financial ruin due to the ongoing civil war, fell out with the staunch Muslim brother Al-Turabi who was even imprisoned for a time. Dutiful attempts were made to at least give Sudan the appearance of democracy and the rule of law, exiled politicians such as al namiri were allowed to return, several parties were admitted and in 2000 elections were held again for the first time, although they were not so free and secret and were boycotted from the outset by the opposition parties, which had been intimidated by the government in a similar way to Iraq under Saddam, so that Bashir was able to garner immense shares of the vote but were well understood by the USA as a gesture. After September 11, Bashir took the precaution of condemning the terror of the Al-Qaeda chief, instead of, like his former partner, 
railing against those Arab and Islamic states that support the USA in its war and hand over their earth and sky to the Crusaders and Jews, is 3W260-02, and has since managed to keep the, already minor, international trouble at bay, with such supposed concessions to the democratic world. Welt Compact, May 25, 04, in a statement issued on 27. In a declaration signed on May 27 of this year, also under pressure and after long mediation efforts by the USA, the SPLA-M and the government declare their intention to make peace with each other after decades of civil war and lay down the conditions that should form the basis for such a peace. The war in Darfur is not mentioned in this document, however, this is despite the fact that the SPLA-M and the SLA are organized in a joint umbrella organization, the National Democratic Alliance, NDA. And despite the fact that on the surface it looks as if the rebels in the west of the country are fighting the same battle as those in the south. And yet the two conflicts differ in one crucial detail, the black African inhabitants of Darfur believe in Allah like their enemies, the leader of the JEM, Khalil Ibrahim, even belonged to the Islamist Al-Turabi party for a long time, and yet they receive no form of support or solidarity from their religious brothers and sisters in Khartoum or from the member states of the Arab League. They fare like the Polish, Ukrainian, Romanian and other auxiliary troops of the Germans, who tried to serve the Nazis as particularly convinced enemies of the Jews, nothing, no act of murder, a large number of the troops stationed in South Sudan were recruited from members of the predominantly Islamic tribes of Darfur, and no profession of faith, however convincingly presented, can hide the stain of their origins in the eyes of the Arab rulers in Khartoum. Like the Germans once did, the Sudanese Arabs also cling to an Arab vision, dreaming of a greater Arabia, integrated into the powerful community of the Ummah, in which there is only room for other races, if they are content with the role of slaves and serfs who earn the livelihoods of others, light-skinned Arabs still feel, as D. Velt writes, as master race, destined to dominate the blacks, December 5, 04. And as it is well known that a people need space, but at least habitable space in Sudan is rather scarce, the available space must be depopulated in order to make room for the members of the only true people on earth, the Arabs, chosen by Allah to achieve supremacy on earth. As in South Sudan, where the economically valuable, fertile and oil-rich regions were depopulated by militias and the army in order to settle people of Arab origin, the same approach is being taken in Darfur, extensive regions are being sealed off and devastated by the government. First came the airplanes. The airstrikes were followed by the cavalry militias, Der Standard, July 17, 2004, which try to fulfill their official mission, destroy the villages, drive out the people, Welt, December 5, 2004, as effectively as possible. Following the usual modus operandi, they massacre entire villages and set fire to what is still standing after their invasion, stealing people's livestock, crops and water sources and driving the rest of the population, if they can save themselves, Welt, July 24, 2004, into flight, which often means death and is also intended to mean death. As aid deliveries from the international community are deliberately prevented by Khartoum, so that hunger completes what Janjuid and official troops have failed to do. The following detail illustrates that the Islamists are not interested in the content of their beliefs, that Islam provides them with the ticket with which they can rationalize their desire for destruction, in addition to the dwellings, the mosques of the black Africans were usually also destroyed, which no convinced Muslim would ever do. FAZ, July 28, 04. In the areas, cleansed, of, as the government in Khartoum puts it, lawless elements, nomads of Arab origin are to be settled and the expulsion of the black Africans thus made irreversible. FAZ, July 21, 04. The little fertile space in Darfur, which is threatened by desertification, is to be handed over to members of the Arab master race. Just as the good land in Eastern Europe was once handed over to so-called ethnic Germans. The majority of UN member states agree with the states of the Arab League that decisive action in Sudan would be inadmissible, interference in the internal affairs of the country. As in the case of a planned resolution against Zimbabwe, the language of cooperation and dialogue is also preferred with regard to Sudan, considerations that do not stop the United Nations for a moment when it comes to the relentless persecution of Israel, as U.S. political science professor and Bavsky rightly observes, concrete, 06-04.
And although there is no end in sight to the killings in Darfur and the fighting in southern Sudan is flaring up again, people in this country are also trying to persuade the Arab mass murderers in Khartoum with reasonable arguments and thus dissuade them from their actions. It is as if the murder gangs in Rwanda could once have been brought to their senses at a round table. And even in the USA, the calls for intervention are not as shrill as the greatest investigative journalist of all time, Jürgen Elsasser, thinks they are when he writes that Washington and Berlin are stirring up intervention hysteria with unverifiable reports, Junge Welt, May 29, 2004. In the USA, as once in Great Britain, they are rather counting on the fact that after a successful peace agreement between North and South Sudan, forces friendly to the so-called West will be involved in the government and prevent the current state doctrine from becoming the future state doctrine, thus putting an end to the murders allegedly committed in the name of Allah. The fact that the UN majority refuses to name and do in the case of Sudan what it would naturally do in the case of Israel or the USA, to describe what is happening in Sudan as genocide and to intervene accordingly, may superficially appear to be a logical inconsistency. But it is a contradiction in terms and nothing would be more inappropriate than to denounce it with moral outrage. It is no coincidence that the relevant UN conventions and resolutions never speak of mass murder, but of genocide. In contrast to the term mass murder, which, according to a remark by Ike Geisel, expresses the fact that the massacres of modern times were crimes against the masses and crimes by the masses, and thus addresses the collective not only as an object, but as a subject acting destructively, in genocide the collective appears purely as a victim and the murderer as an equally purely external subject, which not only cannot be a people itself, but whose purpose of existence lies in robbing the peoples of their dignity, identity, and ultimately their existence. The category of genocide is a general clause and it covers the sovereign calculation of the UN majority to either blame mass murders on the state-organized enemy of nations, Israel, wherever possible or, in the style of honorable society, to regard the relevant events as a family affair in which any interference is forbidden as warmongering or the like, again emanating from the enemies of nations. Actionism and indifference, both attitudes so characteristic of the UN, turn out to be two sides of the same coin, which in any case is used against the Jews or against a substitute object, as was the case years ago against the Serbs. So it is perhaps honorable, but helpless, when both houses of the US Congress refer to the events in Darfur as genocide, see Tejaspiegel, July 29, 2004, and thus attempt to pit the ideal against reality. Others are more cunning. The whole thing is, in effect ethnic expulsions, according to the Minister of State in the Foreign Office, Kirsten Muller, on 28.06. On Deutschlandfunk Radio, and, it, would be, somehow, important if the United Nations Security Council were to push through a resolution, because after all, according to Foreign Minister Fischer, the killings must come to an end, FAZ, July 29, 04. How the militias that have been let off the leash and the government protecting them are to be effectively stopped, without resorting to military intervention, remains a mystery, the Parliamentary State Secretary in the Development Ministry, Eid, recommends travel restrictions for Sudanese government members or the freezing of foreign accounts as examples of suitable sanction measures, Gibbet, quite as if everyone didn't know that Sudan's assets are invested in Islamic banks anyway, which will be wary of participating in such measures, and as if it were customary for Bashir and Al-Taha to spend their annual vacation in beautiful Mecklenburg. Internationally, it has been agreed to describe the events as bordering on genocide, Taz, January 7, 2004. On July 30, after lengthy negotiations, the UN Security Council passed a resolution in which the government in Khartoum is kindly requested to end the persecutions, NZZ, 31.07-01.08.04, in Darfur and to disarm the militias. There is no threat of sanctions if the demands are not met. The UN at its best, in mid-June, the international community decides with unusual haste to set up a UN force to implement a peace treaty between the government and the SPLA that does not yet exist, but continues to respond to the catastrophe in Darfur only with appeals, SZ, June 14, 2004. 
The Islamist regime in Khartoum has thus gained a further breathing space, which it fears will be used to bring the war in western Sudan to an end with all the force and military resources released in the south, bladder für Deutsche UND Internationale Politik, 07-04, and finally to announce the total victory that Bashir hoped to have achieved in April of this year and which can only mean one thing. The last black person has also left the country or died in Darfur. The Bashir government's usual strategy of appeasement seems to have worked once again, after Kofi Annan visited Sudan and demanded both the disarmament of the militias and a legal investigation into the crimes they had committed, the Sudanese government had ten members of the Janjaweed arrested and sentenced to six years in prison and public cross amputation, right hand, left foot, for murder, looting and illegal possession of weapons. The international community understood this gesture and took note of it gratefully. Even though 100,000 people demonstrated against the UN resolution in Khartoum on August 5, everyone there knows that this resolution has made the intervention of international troops in Sudan a distant prospect, and not because the Sudanese cabinet announced a political and strategic mobilization in mid-July and announced that it would not only resolutely reject deployment of international troops, but would also deal appropriately with any soldier who sets foot on Sudanese land, FAZ. 29. 7.04, and thus to give both the Americans and the British reception worse than in Iraq, Tejas Beagle, July 29, 04, as the Sudanese Minister of Agriculture El Khalifa Ahmed put it at the end of July. You can already imagine the newspaper headlines in 2014, 1994, Genocide in Rwanda. 2004, Genocide in Darfur. Never again. And if the states of the Arab League then submit a resolution calling for decisive military action by the international community against Israel to prevent the genocide of the Palestinians, no one will point out that Israel also has the right to protect its population from terrorism. As Syria and China recently did when a vote on a resolution condemning Russia for its actions in Chechnya was on the UN agenda. It certainly won't be Germany, as no objections are raised here even today when for example, at a Heinrich Boll Foundation discussion event on the situation in Darfur, an Orientalist sleepwalked his way to the actual core of UN human rights policy and innocently asked whether it wouldn't actually be more than understandable if the Arab states also demanded a blue helmet mission in Israel in the near future. So we can only hope that the USA will abandon the course it has taken in recent years and not only stand by the side of Israel again, but also continue to include regimes that spread more terror in favor of more Islam in the list of rogue states and treat them accordingly. The European-Sudanese collaboration with the facade of humanizing migration control thus mainly strengthened the mostly militaristic elements in the Sudanese state and thus the reorganized Janjaweed militia, itself involved in human smuggling, became the militant wing of the dignified border management, especially along the border with Eritrea, which the European Union is pushing all the way to East Africa. On Al Jazeera, General Hemedi recently boasted that the Europeans were dependent on him. The fact that the U.S. charged affair Stephen Kutsis, Washington's highest-ranking representative in Sudan, honored General Hemeti with his presence during the breaking of the fast last Ramadan also provoked astonishment among the Sudanese opposition. There is no doubt that Vladimir Putin's Russian Federation and China are more familiar to the Sudanese despotism, and yet the critical dialogue that Europeans and Americans alike maintain with the butcher the representatives of the European Union and Great Britain have also made representations to General Hemeti, is above all one thing, a betrayal of the social revolutionaries on the streets of Khartoum and elsewhere. The organizational backbone of the protests is the Sudanese Professionals Association. The high proportion of women in the street protests is particularly striking. Under Omar al-Bashir, the infamous Section 152 of the Sudanese Penal Code allowed thousands of women to be arbitrarily arrested year after year on the basis of their clothing, which would have provoked the prevailing morality. As a result, a separate economy grew up in which police officers arrested women in order to extract horrendous fines from them. During the mass protests against Bashir, women also demanded an end to the misogynistic Section 152. The young architecture student Allah Sulla, who became an icon of the protests, sang, they burned us in the name of religion, killed us in the name of religion, imprisoned us in the name of religion. The protesters are vehemently demanding an end to the recruitment of Sudanese for the Yemeni front, just as in Iran with regard to the Syrian catastrophe. Graffiti also calls for Sudan to leave the Arab League.
In addition to the denunciation of Saudi Arabia as an aggressor, there is also criticism of the Emirate of Qatar and its support for the Muslim Brotherhood. While Bashir's regime exploited Arab chauvinism, one of the popular slogans of the protesters is, forgive us Darfur for the blood spilled. Earlier this year, when the tottering regime arrested 32 young men from Darfur at Sinar University, southeast of Khartoum, and denounced them as Mossad agents, protesters chanted, you arrogant racist, we are all Darfur. The background to the Israeli-Saudi rapprochement, which has already been criticized by Muslim brother Jamal Khashoggi, is the Abraham Accords, which the Trump administration initiated at the time. Since 2020, Israel has concluded peace treaties with the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Morocco as a result of the Abraham Accords, which not only concern national security, as in the Cold Peace with Egypt and Jordan, but also include areas such as trade, tourism and cultural exchange. It is no secret that Hamas wanted to torpedo precisely this normalization process with its massacre on October 7. With the Abraham Accords, Israel is aiming to divide the Islamic world, while at the same time mistrusting its probably precarious and possibly only very short-term allies. For some years now, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Saudi Arabia have been sensing that the forces that have the destruction of Israel in mind for the establishment of their Ummah Caliphate could also be directed against the Gulf states. The New York Times now reports that most political leaders in the Arab states would like to see Hamas overthrown. Informed sources have also reported that Israel is negotiating with several Arab states about an international consortium that could take over the political administration of the Gaza Strip after the war. One of the states that is expected to play a key role in the administration of Gaza after the war is Saudi Arabia. However, the conditions for Mohammed bin Salman's socio-political reforms and the desired normalization of relations with Israel are precarious in Saudi Arabia. Not only is Saudi Arabia still regarded by the Islamic world as the guardian of the holy places of the Prophet, it can also be assumed that a large proportion of Saudis continue to support the Muslim Brotherhood and its Palestinian offshoot Hamas. As one Arab Hamas sympathizer aptly writes, if political freedoms were to be introduced in Saudi Arabia, there would not only be massive, anti-Israel, demonstrations on a scale comparable to what we have seen recently in Yemen and other countries. Many Saudis would probably be ready to leave the country immediately and try to join Hamas in Palestine. In this respect, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has every reason not to accelerate the pace of his reforms any further, be it for fear of popular uprisings or palace revolts. Few Saudis are saying what the strategically minded among them have learned at the latest since Yasser Arafat's support for Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, that Palestinian political organizations destabilize the Gulf region if they become too powerful, and that they cannot be relied upon. In other words, that the Arabian Peninsula could face the same civil war chaos as Jordan or Lebanon if the Gulf states ever take in Palestinians as refugees. One of those who openly expresses this realization is the Saudi businessman, influencer, and author Rawaf al -Sin. In a video that has gone viral on social media, he denies any territorial claim by the Palestinians to land in the Middle East, accuses the Palestinian leadership of involvement in Saddam Hussein's war of aggression against Kuwait and calls on Israel to take tougher action in Gaza. Curious, he says that the true location of the Al-Aqsa Mosque is not in Jerusalem, but in the village of Al-Jurana near Mecca, which he derives from an original historical critical reading of the Quran. It is unlikely that the peace agreement between Israel and Saudi Arabia has been completely on hold since October 7, but Hamas has been able to delay its conclusion with its attack. Hamas and its financiers in Tehran and Doha know that the window of opportunity for a normalization of Saudi-Israeli relations will close in the foreseeable future. The presidential election campaign in the USA begins in March. Then the Americans, without whom there can be no peace treaty, will be preoccupied above all with domestic politics. Whether Saudi Arabia will take the opportunity to officially make peace with Israel as the home of the Jews in the Middle East by then remains to be seen, given the precarious position of the crown prince in his own country and in the region. And Israel knows all too well, in case of doubt, the Saudis and their changing interests can no more be relied upon than any other state in the Middle East that has made peace with Israel, even if occasional pleasant surprises, such as Saudi Arabia's shooting down a missile fired towards Israel by the Iranian-backed Houthi Islamists from Yemen on its own territory for the first time on October 19, are seen by the Israelis as a glimmer of hope.
If the massacre of October 7 has taught Israel one sad lesson, it is this, only as a defensive Zionist country does Israel have a chance of surviving in the Middle East. The upheavals and the disintegration of the power structure in the Arab world have transformed the often invoked but never realized pan-Arab unity into a strict Sunni military community. One could also say, made it recognizable. Because what seemed to be secular about pan-Arabism, and claimed to be so, at least initially, was always and unchallengedly aimed at the dominance of the Sunni denomination through the ethnic-linguistic unity it sought. With the fall of Saddam Hussein, who had presented his invasion of Kuwait and the resulting war in 1990-91 as a step towards Arab unification, the last pan-Arab practitioner disappeared. Just how serious he was about this is shown by the fact that Hussein had already created a tailor-made genealogy for the expected caliphate, with which he sought to prove his descent back to the Prophet's family. Hussein was not able to keep Kuwait after all, but at least he was able to keep his rule in Iraq. Because Iran was not to be seen as a beneficiary of Sunni weakness in accordance with the American containment strategy and force at the time, Hussein was allowed to continue his plan to force Kurds and Shiites who did not want to follow the Pan-Arab program into the Arab Sunni nation through massacres, at least within the Iraqi state borders. Bassam Tibi also saw the dictator's brutality as being due to a Pan-Arab ideology, which may be secular in its origins, but in practice it is always the case that a person is only fully valid in an Arab-dominated state if he is a Sunni Muslim and ethnic Arab. Accordingly, during the Kuwait War, Saddam Hussein had already stopped using pan-Arabism, which had been unsuccessful and therefore worn out in the earlier Arab wars against Israel, and instead effectively proclaimed a Muslim jihad against the West. This call also added fuel to the fire of the inner Islamic confessional conflict, when, twelve years later, the Sunni rule in Iraq, which was based on the Ottoman tradition, was ended from outside, Saddam's fall led to an inner Islamic civil war, fueled by the Sunnis' attempt to gain new power options, Shiite rivalries, and the anti-Shiite terror of Al-Qaeda. Since the first Shiite-led Iraqi government, the Arab Sunni governments have increasingly moved closer together in an anti-Shiite unity of action, led initially by the Jordanian king supported by Mubarak and the Saudi royal family, which has emerged as Iran's main adversary. Iraq was to take the front line against Shiite influence in Sunni Arabia. An estimated 90% of Arabs are Sunnis. They, but not only they, have a special relationship to Islam, the book of which was written in Arabic and is considered to be properly understood only in it. Arabs claim the leading role in the Islamic world, because Islam is considered an Arab religion and as such is predestined to create a sense of unity across tribal and national borders. The desire for a democratic movement to inherit and develop the secular parts of Arab societies is therefore confronted everywhere with the reality of Islamic democracy, whose representatives see the cause of its decline precisely in timid secularization. On the one hand, the fear of decay and weakness leads to freedom being equated with atheism and moral decay. On the other hand, Arabs see the confrontation with Persian Iran as a choice between joining Sunni rule or being seen and treated as henchmen of the Iranian enemy. As a result, every conflict in the region is always interpreted by the Sunni side as an expression of the Shiite-Sunni struggle, the protesters from the Shiite majority in Bahrain immediately saw themselves branded as Iran's henchmen, in 2011. The protests against the government were crushed by the Saudi-led Gulf Cooperation Council in order to dispel fears or hopes of a shake-up of the political order in the Gulf. In February 2009, the head of President Ahmadinejad's office, Ali Akbar Natek Nori, actually described Bahrain as the historic 14th province of Iran. In Syria, the Sunni side now wants to make up for lost ground and detach the country from the Shiite Iranian sphere of influence. Now that the Americans have failed to end Assad's rule, Syria is to become the scene of Arab-Sunni self-assertion, even if there is no common strategy and each Arab potentate is promoting its own groups in Syria. The anti-Assad fighters are not only divided, they are also fighting each other for strategically important areas and attractive resources in the country. Although they have no common goals, for the first time all Sunnis are united in the anti-Assad camp. For the first time in this war, the front between Sunnis and Shiites has also been straightened out, as even Turkey has chosen the side of the Sunni opposition after a phase of rapprochement with Assad. After many years of good contacts with Iran, Qatar has also sided with the Sunni royal houses and called for the overthrow of Assad, 
and the offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood, the terrorist organization Hamas, which used to have its headquarters in Damascus as an important ally of Iran and its fight against Israel, has turned against its former supporters and moved to Doha, Qatar. On the other hand, the Shiite Hezbollah in Syria, which enjoyed great respect among Sunnis due to its ongoing war of terror against Israel, as did its supplier and trainer Iran, is now fighting against them openly and without reservation. As at times fatally divided as the Sunni front is on all questions of a post-war order, some want to save a tradition for which the Royal House of Saud stands, others, such as the Muslim Brotherhood or Al-Qaeda, are committed to its elimination, the Sunni alliance, which is at enmity within itself, is held together by the prospect of weakening Iran and its Shiite policy of self-confidence, insurgency, and expansion. Sunni cooperation also proved to be a union of enemies in the first Gulf War. At that time, Egypt and Saudi Arabia were committed to the Iraqi side against Iran, but as early as 1981, in the first year of the war, the six states of the Arabian Peninsula founded the Gulf Cooperation Council not only to counter the effects of the Iranian Revolution, but also Iraq's claims to supremacy. The Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, in turn, continues to have a divisive effect to this day, the Muslim Brotherhood, which is regarded by German political advisors as the most important post-war force in Syria, SWP Act 1252, August 2013, has been driven out of the government in Egypt with significant involvement from Saudi Arabia. Until the Brotherhood took sides with Hussein, the Saudis had been its main sponsors. Shiite state doctrine, which centers on the imamate, grants political and religious leadership to the imams alone as an authority with secret knowledge and an exclusive understanding of the Quran. Sunni state doctrine, on the other hand, relies on the caliphate, which grants rule to those who are capable of it and to the successful. In the theocratic understanding of the state, there is an abysmal rift between the two doctrines, which cannot be brought to a compromise simply because their main representatives are traditionally rivals for power. As such, they accuse each other of heresy. According to the Sunni Arab conception, Shiites are regarded as representatives of a non-Arab consciousness and or as notoriously unruly and unreliable. Both doctrines dispute each other's claim to establish a God-pleasing rule, and so battles between the faith groups automatically become battles for power and its legitimacy. The internal Islamic struggle for the right form of God-pleasing rule cannot simply be dealt with in political terms, it is an expression of manifold despotic claims to power, which cannot be satisfied as a whole, against the background of Oriental history of rule, which are defiantly held up to Western compromises. The fighters are concerned with both the whole and their own, with religion and the spoils. The post-colonial states and their elites have lost so much prestige in the Arabellion that in future, rule will be exercised more than ever by means of religion, which, on the other hand, means that religious deviation and political enemy recognition are one and the same. Nevertheless, European commentators usually portray the struggle between Sunnis and Shiites either as a purely religious one, whose unbridled fanaticism is exotic and terrifying, or as a purely political one, in which religion is merely used as a vehicle to assert claims to power. What is concealed here is precisely what is special about Islam, the inseparable combination of the two. One suspects that war as a religious war cannot be pacified or ended, yet one refuses to acknowledge the impossibility of a peaceful solution or the victory of the better over the worse. Interests must therefore be discovered where religious delusion, which can no longer be grasped with categories of instrumental reason, dominates the scene. In Islam, it is not state borders that count, but religious borders. Those who refer to it always mean the community of believers, a gross realm, a tradition and this always includes the pursuit of expansion. This is another reason why the Arab nation-states face the accusation of being artificial, existing by the grace of neocolonialism or depending on collaboration with the West, which denies the autochthonous tradition and hinders Arab progress. It is at least true that the Arab national development models have failed. The political paranoia of the Arabs draws the conclusion from facts such as the fact that the USA allowed Mubarak to be overthrown that it had withdrawn its protection from the Sunnis. And this has greatly increased the uncertainty among the Sunni potentates, who also rule Shiite majorities in Arabia according to Ottoman tradition. So far, the monarchies have proved to be more stable than the other states amid the general uncertainty. Saudi Arabia seems to be encouraged by this to take the lead in the Sunni movement and thus continue to assert its existence. However, Saudi Arabia can only export Wahhabi Islam, which offers no prospects for other countries. 
The Saudi clergy, who as the guardians of their Wahhabi nomadic Islam are also enemies of the Shiite interpretation of Islam, tie their support for the royal claim to power to the condition that the king replaces his political monopoly entirely in the interests of the clergy. The de facto state religion is enforced against the subjects with the help of a religious, i.e. essentially moral, police force, state and religious power are as little separated as in Iran. The takeover of power by the al-Sad dynasty in Saudi Arabia began with one of the fiercest literary publicistic conflicts between Shiites and Sunnis, as it brought the most important holy sites of Islam, Mecca and Medina, into anti-Shiite hands. The Wahhabis also destroyed the tombs of imams in Medina because they consider the domed tombs and other ornamental work to be un-Islamic innovations. Saudi sectarianism and delegitimized nation-states, apart from hostility towards Iran, there is clearly nothing that could justify the unity of the Arabs. Since Sunni unity is only conceivable as the product of the usurpation of one faction, the all-sided and bloody competition between clans, clans and other power cartels in Arabia will continue to intensify. Yaakov Amidror, who was Netanyahu's national security advisor until November 2013, therefore described the events in the Middle East as a permanent work of disintegration, we are currently seeing the collapse of a historical system, namely the idea of a national Arab state. This means that we will soon be surrounded by an area that is no man's land. Since Iran has been negotiating its nuclear armament directly with the USA and lucrative contracts have been beckoning, headlines in the media such as the Mullah's theocracy, Spiegel, have been replaced by confident mockery, speculating on the current state of the alleged tug-of-war between hardliners and reformers. No one wants to think it possible that a nation with a tradition as great as that of Persia could turn into a political suicide cult, as if the Goethe nation had never known Hitler, especially as Ahmadinejad's predecessors and successors in the office of Prime Minister, Katami and Rouhani, come across much more sympathetically as nice and enraptured smiling clerics than he does. In fact, Iran is traditionally characterized not only by its confessional difference from the majority of Arabs, but also by its offensive national ethnic demarcation from Arabia. Reza Khan Pahlavi, the penultimate Shah of Persia from 1925, fought against the influence of the clergy following the example of Ataturk and relied on the ideology of racial superiority, based on the German model, which is why Persia was officially renamed Iran, i.e., Land of the Aryans, in 1935. His son Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, Shah from 1941 to 1979, rehabilitated the clergy and acted as the supreme protector of the Shiites with a constitutional mandate in the hope that the faith would prevent them from turning to communism. However, Islam, once brought to Persia by the Arabs, was by no means the only focal point of the Shah's national ideology. In 1971, for example, he staged a 2,500-year celebration of the monarchy in the remains of the ancient Persian residential city of Persepolis, placing his rule in line with the first great Persian empire of the Achaemenids in antiquity. By recalling Iran's pre-Islamic past, he referred to Persia's cultural independence from the Arab world and associated his monarchy with an old great power and new ambitions. The nationalist Persian tradition was also adopted by the mullahs, and it was no peculiarity of Ahmadinejad that in 2007 he invited the powers of the world to see the power and capabilities of our people in Persepolis. In Iran, a self-assessment is cultivated according to which the country is culturally unique and significant, while Arabs are sometimes regarded as retards and lizard eaters. This is not about the actual appropriation of the rich pre-Islamic past, but about mystifying it in the interests of the Islamic claim to leadership from the Shiite minority position. As a leading power that seeks to combine orthodox Islam and national greatness, Iran is questioning the traditional leadership role of the Sunni majority in the Islamic world. This is done ideologically by referring to the doctrine of lineage, shortly after Muhammad's death, the required genealogical continuity in the succession of caliphs was arbitrarily interrupted by the Sunnis, which is why their claim to the caliphate was illegitimately acquired. Shiite principles were fundamental to the founding of the Iranian theocracy, which cannot serve as a model for a Sunni state. These include, for example, the relationship of the faithful to their grand ayatollah, whom they may choose from around 20 candidates to be their leader, if their affiliation is not already determined by birth. The believer must follow the fatwas of the ayatollah and the cleric receives a considerable tax from the believer. Faith and power are so closely linked and the ability to exercise this power, i.e. the dignity of ayatollah, must remain exclusive and be granted by the consent of the already recognized authorities. 
In Shiite democracy, this principle is reflected in the fact that the clerics in the Guardian Council pre-select suitable candidates and only then are the eligible voters allowed to go to the polls. The overthrow of the Shah and the establishment of the theocracy was linked to the plan to assume a leading role in the Islamic world by exporting the revolution. To this end, revolutionary leader Khomeini placed the revolutionary reason of state above questions of religion. Through its radicalism against the traditional rulers and as an enemy of the Arab status quo, Iran attempted to expand its legitimacy throughout the Ummah and offer itself as an ally to Sunni subversives. Shortly after the revolution, a central office for the export of revolution was opened in the center of Tehran. The Islamic Front for the Liberation of Bahrain was represented there, as were similar organizations from the other Gulf states, North Africa and Lebanon. From the summer of 1979, Shiites also rehearsed the uprising in Iraq. However, the plan to overthrow Saddam Hussein failed due to the massive repression against Iraqi Shiites and was one of the reasons for the Iraqi attack on Iran in 1980. In December 1981, an attempted coup by Shiite Muslims against the Sunni ruling dynasty in Bahrain was thwarted, for which Iran was held directly responsible. Other members of the Gulf Cooperation Council, such as Kuwait, felt the Islamic revolutionary zeal in 1982, cinemas, girls' schools, restaurants and libraries were attacked there. Attacks followed in Oman and Saudi Arabia, but nowhere did a Shiite coup succeed. Although the planned export of revolution could rely on Shiites in the respective countries, some of whom became radicalized in the new Shiite self-confidence, the pan-Islamic revolutionary ideology was a foreign policy dead end, hardly any Muslims in the Arab world, outside the Shiite enclaves wanted to recognize Tehran's claim to leadership and so the Iranian leadership soon devoted itself exclusively to the Shiite cause in Arabia. Iran was most successful with Hezbollah, which it developed into Lebanon's Shiite emancipation movement and turned into the strongest domestic political and military force. The expansion of Shiite power in Lebanon has shifted the focus of the conflict there from the Christian-Muslim rivalry to the intra-Muslim rivalry between Hezbollah and the Sunni Hairi camp. Hezbollah's cooperation with Syrian-backed Amal, which is also Shiite, led to close cooperation between Tehran and Damascus. Both regimes were concerned with intensifying the fight against Israel, not least because the perseverance shown by Iran's leadership in its long-standing, consequent and successful fight against Israel is the basis of its entire internal Islamic foreign policy. The situation was similar for the Assad regime, which is not supported by Sunnis. The successes achieved in terrorism against Israel and the obvious progress in high-tech and nuclear weapons also consolidated Iranian cooperation with Sunni organizations such as Hamas, which continued until the war in Syria. Cooperation with the best-known Sunni terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, is the exception, open hostility is the rule. The reputation of the Iranian revolution in the Arab world was severely damaged by the Iran-Iraq War, 1980-1988. Saudi Arabia also worked against the Iranian export of revolution wherever possible and promoted Sunni Islamists, for example in Afghanistan and Pakistan, where support for the Afghan Taliban and Pakistani Islamists always had an anti-Iranian edge. This policy contributed to a significant intensification of sectarian conflicts in the 1980s, especially in Pakistan. In Pakistan, which proclaimed itself the first Islamic Republic in 1956 and where the Shiites form a minority but are the second largest Shiite community after the Iranian community, the Shiite-Sunni conflict was already intensified in the 1980s by pro-Sunni legislation. Since the Taliban and Al-Qaeda from Afghanistan took root there, Shiites have been terrorized. Pan-Islamism, the idea of one state for all Muslims, is certainly at an end, and the history of attempts at rapprochement between the denominations can also be regarded as a failure. There was no lack of attempts to achieve an ecumenism that recognized nations and denominations. In 1947, the Society for Rapprochement Between Islamic Denominations was founded. After the dispute between the United Arab Republic, the merger of Egypt and Syria to form the VAR from 1958 to 1961, and the Pahlavi Iran over the de facto recognition of Israel, the VAR broke off diplomatic relations with Iran, and Egypt, whose policy was closely linked to the founding of the society, also limited its support for ecumenism. Until the death of Khomeini, 1989, ecumenism no longer played a role, as Iran pursued its pan-Islamic revolutionary ideology.
It was only when Khomeini's successor placed greater emphasis on Iran's national agenda that Islamic ecumenism came to the fore again. The desire for interconfessional, Islamic dialogue was strengthened once again when, after the Taliban, 2001, and Saddam Hussein, 2003, were overthrown, no Arab state was able to gain leadership of the Arab region and Shiite Iran rose to regional power. Even in the case of Iran's biggest adversary, Saudi Arabia, there was something like a national dialogue after Sunni terrorists carried out attacks in Riyadh in 2003 and the ruling house wanted to isolate the perpetrators by distancing itself from violence. A conference was held in Doha in 2007, organized by the University of Qatar, Azai University in Cairo and the Tehran World Forum for Rapprochement between the Islamic schools of law. However, the conference did not produce any results, as the Shia-Sunni dialogue did not address state issues and therefore could not seriously address the problem. Overcoming the division of the Ummah caused by the West, or as it is often called, Zionists and Crusaders, and countering the spread of secular ideas with a utopia of a united Islamic tradition remains wishful thinking. The pious desire to avoid public conflict between the Islamic faiths, because, according to common conviction, the imperialists exploit this conflict for their own purposes, has always been more a method of disciplining the minority, today this conflict has turned into open warfare. The Holy War, which in Iran has gone through a career from revolution to Shiite awakening and via national ideology to the imperial program, is in the process of capturing the weakened Sunni opposing side and thus becoming a multi-front war, the first chapter of which, in retrospect, must be seen as the first Gulf War between Iraq and Iran. The dynamics of the theocracy aim for totality, deviation has no place in it, the struggle for domination must destroy the opponent as far as possible or at least immobilize him for a long time, accordingly, this struggle is not tactical and thus ultimately cannot be stopped within the framework of the Islamic ideology that has prevailed for 1,400 years. U.S. foreign policy has no coherent answer to this murderous dynamic, the hot confessional war in Syria has thwarted all of Obama's previously recognizable guidelines. Before the war began, there was a phase of detente between the USA and the Assad regime, Syria was to play a greater role in the security architecture and have a moderating effect on Hamas, Hezbollah and Iran in the nuclear conflict. The U.S. ambassador post in Damascus, which had been vacant since March 2005 due to the murder of Rafiq al-Hariri in Beirut, was reoccupied two months before the outbreak of the uprising. However, the already fickle Obama can no longer rely on Syria, which is probably why direct negotiations with Iran are now taking place and a corresponding realignment of U.S. policy is imminent. It is not only Israel's concern that the Obama administration is making itself more vulnerable to blackmail than ever before. The USA's upgrading of Iran from a leading supporter of terrorism, Bush, to a long-term negotiating partner in Geneva means further fueling the Sunni-Shiite religious war. The Arab-Sunni state leaders see themselves increasingly called into question internally and have lost their foreign policy protector, who used to be satisfied with containing the destabilization attempts by holy warriors in addition to containing Iran. Syria is currently just the hottest spot for the Shiite-Sunni war, which can be fought wherever the faithful meet and has long since reached holy sites such as the Iraqi pilgrimage sites of Karbala and Najaf or even Mecca. The repeatedly invoked Islamic unity in the fight against Israel has also receded even further into the distance, a discrete minimal cooperation between Israel and Saudi Arabia against the Iranian nuclear program is currently more conceivable. The fact that the Hitler fans from the Royal House of Saud even want to come to terms with the Jewish state, at least temporarily, shows that this multi-front war of previously almost unthinkable alliances can hardly be ended. At best, it could probably be curbed somewhat. One way could be to encourage Islamic minorities that are not ethnically and or religiously inclined towards either Tehran or Riyadh in their efforts to gain autonomy and to enable them to stay out of this war as far as possible, this would apply first and foremost to the Kurds. Because neither of the two main state opponents, Saudi Arabia and Iran, can hope to assume the leadership role for the other's clientele, the conflict could weaken into a permanent but cold war, a situation that makes it more difficult for the opposing camps to cooperate in the fight against Israel. This alone and the improvement of the situation for Islamic minorities are the only rays of hope that are conceivable in the Middle East in the coming decades, however, there should be no more talk of peace plans or any kind of revolution. The world is bad, revolutions are therefore popular, and yet the world will not necessarily be any better for it.
On the one hand, it is inherent in the concept of revolution that, by setting society and the state in motion, it creates a moment of uncertainty in which the old is removed but the new is not yet established. On the other hand, the degree of imponderability depends on how far the new has already taken shape in the old, because the more concrete this shape has become, the better the outcome of the revolution can be read from it. A rule derived from historical experience then states that an Arab or Persian revolution does not promise anything good. In the case of Egypt, on the other hand, predictions could be made based on this, the accuracy of which was similar to that of a weather forecast for the previous day. The outlines of what a revolution would mean could already be seen in the so-called Cairo Spring of 2005, when the tiny constitutional reform introduced by Hosni Mubarak gave the Muslim Brotherhood candidates a huge vote in the subsequent parliamentary elections. One reason for this was that there was no other opposition. The remaining opposition parties represented in parliament were all creations of the regime from the time of Anwar al-Sadat, opportunists with a leftist Nasserist or national liberal veneer, whose policy was to disguise the military dictatorship with the facade of pluralism. Outside parliament, where Muslim brothers and Salafists organized the masses in mosques, via satellite television and through social work in poor neighborhoods, a protest movement was still active at the time under the slogan, Kifaya, Enough, a network of left-wing activists created by Nasserists, Communists, Trotskyists and others, who were able to mobilize their rather small following to take part in demonstrations against Israel and the USA, which were more or less tolerated by the regime, but had nothing to counter the Islamic opposition policy. The other reason, however, was that the Egyptian masses did not want to be governed by anyone other than the Islamic ideologues. So it was not difficult to guess that Egyptian democracy would become an Islamic democracy, and that an Egyptian revolution would become an Islamic revolution in Egypt. The Mubarak regime initially reacted by cancelling the spring and tried to hide behind the repressive apparatus through which it was used to ruling. During the Young Officers' Revolution of 1952, the regime was able to serve the masses ideologically by promising them Arab socialism and the destruction of Israel, allowing Gamal Abdel Nasser, the beloved leader, to push the Muslim Brotherhood into the background without losing the affection of his people. Gamal Abdel Nasser's death triggered a flood of tears that reached far beyond Egypt's borders, Muammar Gaddafi also fainted at Nasser's grave at the time, and left behind an ideological disorientation once it subsided. When Anwar al-Sadat finally formally ended the war with Israel and gave up the partnership with the Soviet Union, and Egypt allied itself with the USA instead, the regime tried to compensate for the broken Arab pride with a measured Islamization of the country. But instead of satisfying the ideological hunger of the masses in the long term, it only fed it, they soon wanted a higher dose of Islam. This became apparent in the Cairo Spring. In response, political mathematicians devised the paradoxical formula for maintaining the regime, that more democracy in Egypt would only work with, even, more Islam on the one hand and, even, more military on the other, as an Islamic democracy with military reservations. The journalist, activist and Nasserist Abdel Halim Kandil described the burgeoning revolutionary expectations in 2005 in such a way that, in retrospect, he would have earned himself the reputation of a clairvoyant if the scenario he described had not been all too foreseeable, in the event of a social explosion, an intervention by the army was very likely. Although the army was no longer in a position today, it also had no intention of ruling itself as it did in Nasser's time, it would, however, pave the way for a new constitution that would integrate all the essential political forces, including the Muslim Brotherhood, on the basis of more, not less, political freedom. The regime, i.e. the army, would therefore rid itself of Hosni Mubarak and the political apparatus of conformists and opportunists surrounding him, which had incurred the displeasure of the masses and thus become ideologically and politically useless, and leave the field to the Islamic organizations in its place. However, this strategy, which initially appeared to be a path to dual power, through which the military regime would have renewed its power, could also be seen as a new edition of the power struggle that had been going on for half a century, in which the army would still enter as the more powerful rival, but in which the Islamic opponent would be granted a power that it had never possessed before in its almost hundred-year history. Islam would have the possibly decisive advantage of an ideology. That could still inspire the masses. The fact that, one way or another, this increase in political freedom, for the Islamic parties, would ultimately result in less freedom overall was not allowed to be part of the revolutionary expectation. 
These are actually truisms, Abdul Masih Basit, the priest of St. Mary's Church in Cairo, may have thought to himself in the stormy January of 2011, when he looked at the political situation with understandable unease one day before the start of the uprising, but wisdom is not omnipresent and it is perhaps better to explicitly warn his flock again against participating in foolishness. Because the mood in his congregation seemed to be just like that. Since the beginning of the month, Christians have been demonstrating incessantly against Hosni Mubarak's cursed regime, which did not protect them from the violence perpetrated against them by an increasingly aggressive Islamic mob, even though this state was their only protection against it. It was right to make themselves heard as a religious minority in this way, it was a just protest, but for God's sake it should not be misconstrued as a prelude to revolution. But after the revolution in Tunisia, everything suddenly appeared in a different light. The rally planned by left-wing activists in Cairo on January 25, which was originally intended to be just one of the usual, ultimately inconsequential protest events that have been so common in recent years, suddenly took on a completely different, revolutionary character. Even the Muslim Brotherhood, which otherwise officially stayed out of such activities, had mobilized for the rally. All of this seemed suspicious to Abdul Masih Basit, and so he preached on behalf of his church on the day before the revolution, we urged the Coptic youth not to take part in the demonstrations on January 25, because our problems will not be solved by demonstrations and loud slogans. At this point, the Coptic youth no longer had an ear for fatherly advice of the dialectical kind. How was it to be understood that protesting was first the right thing to do, but then wrong again? The forthcoming mass demonstrations only seemed to continue on a large scale what they themselves had begun on a small scale. How could the Christians, of all people, be absent from this revolution when they had just been the first and bravest in the fight against the hated regime? One could have answered them with the prophetic wisdom of Jesus, the first will be the last. The Christian demonstrations had begun on January 1. The night before, shortly after midnight, when the New Year's Mass was over and the devout were just streaming outside, a car bomb exploded in front of the entrance to the Two Saints Church in Alexandria. The explosion killed 23 Christians and injured many more. This was not the first, just the bloodiest in a continuous series of attacks against them. Over the past three years, the attacks had increased in frequency and intensity. It only got worse with the coup. In the days that followed, numerous demonstrations, road blockades and similar actions took place in Alexandria and Cairo, which regularly ended in street battles between the Christian activists and the police, who tried to intimidate the demonstrators with truncheons, tear gas and rubber bullets, lasting well into the night. This led to some remarkable scenes. On the second day of the protest, for example, a nine-man police cordon surrounded the Cathedral of St. Mark in Cairo, the seat of the Coptic Pope, Shenouda III, to prevent the Christians gathered there for the demonstration from leaving the church grounds. The encircled demonstrators raised the wooden crosses they had brought with them and stormed the police cordon, chanting, Revolution. Revolution in Egypt. Revolution in all the churches of Egypt. Ministers who arrived to express their consternation to the congregation were called hypocrites and their vehicles were demolished with stones. Similar demonstrations and riots continued throughout the day and night in Alexandria, Cairo and other cities. The third day of protest began with a demonstration by state forces. A group of people had gathered in Cairo for a vigil and lit candles in memory of the murdered Christians. The police lined up opposite. A high-ranking police officer, qualified by his rank in all reports on the scene but not identified by name anywhere, approached the vigil and blew out one candle after another in a gesture that was supposed to embody his power. The following night, a demonstration formed in Shubra, a district of Cairo where many Christians live, only to clash with the police. The demonstrators did not hesitate and attacked the police with stones, bottles and the tried and tested wooden crosses, putting the officers on the defensive, who then dropped their shields and batons and tried to defend themselves by throwing the stones and bottles back at the demonstrators. An unusual constellation occurred during this battle, which in itself was insignificant. It was the second time in two nights that Cairo Police Special Forces called in for riot control, overwhelmed by the number of demonstrators, had to break up the rehearsed marching lines and attack the crowd in street fighting style. Even before Monday's events, at least 39 police officers, including four high-ranking officers, had been injured trying to stop the demonstrators. Later that Monday, 
when a smaller group of protesters marched towards Talat Harb Square, located in central Cairo in the middle of a neighborhood dominated by 19th century European architecture and tourist friendly, cosmopolitan stores, cafes, and bars, as if in remembrance of pre revolutionary times, the regime's batches once again stood in their way. This time, however, it was once again the usual impenetrable overabundance of black uniforms that had apparently been placed here for the purpose of permanently darkening the atmosphere of this place and the mood of the demonstrators. For their part, the demonstrators once again had the right slogans at the ready, down with Mubarak. Down with the military regime. Then it happened again. An armed man in police uniform, a retired officer, as it was later reported, boarded the train from Samalat to Cairo on January 11th, took a quick look around and then shot at a family he identified as Christians. One man died, Finf were injured, then the murderer was overpowered by other passengers. As usual, the state claimed that the act was not religiously motivated, but instead offered a different explanation for the crime. The murderer was said to have been irritated and frustrated because he was short of money. Witnesses, on the other hand, reported that he had deliberately chosen a group of women for execution who were not wearing headscarves and that he had shouted, Allahu Akbar, as he shot them. Once again, the Christians rose up in protest. This once again led to that unusual constellation that has now almost become a habit, in Cairo, for the first time in years, the number of demonstrators exceeded the number of police deployed to fight the uprising, the demonstrators briefly gained the upper hand and thus destroyed the facade of invulnerability with which the Ministry of the Interior surrounded itself. The fact that such a situation repeatedly arose during these days may also have been the reason for some young cops to overestimate their own strength, especially when one considers that when a comparable situation arose again after January 25th, the event was immediately celebrated as the first writing on the wall of the revolution, but only because the whole world was already attuned to it. Initially, however, the Egyptian repressive apparatus had no real problem putting the Christians in their place, who had largely remained among themselves during the demonstrations and, with 8 million believers, represented a notable community but, with a share of 10% of the total population, also only a despised minority. In addition, the official press soon began to remind the demonstrators that their actions were not without danger and that, if they took things too far, they would only incite religiously motivated violence and even provoke a civil war. However, these teachings were not very original, because the fact that Christians in Egypt were living dangerously was just as obvious as the fact that they were caught in a political trap. While the mob attacked them, power abandoned them, and this mechanism was in fact what fueled the religiously motivated violence. And for this very reason, not a single one of the murderers of Christians in recent years has been arrested, tried, or even convicted. However, a few days after the protests described here, there was a surprising but ambiguous exception to this rule. It concerned a massacre that had taken place a year earlier, on January 6, 2010. On that day, eight Christians had been murdered in Nag Hammadi, again as they were leaving church, by gunfire from a passing car, with the perpetrators apparently also unintentionally hitting and killing a Muslim policeman. On the same day, two women died when the mob set fire to the homes of Christians in neighboring villages. The Minister of the Interior explained the massacres as follows, no religious motive could be identified, but there were initial indications that the event was connected to the accusation that a young Christian had raped a Muslim girl. The parliamentary spokesperson explained, the crime in Nag Hammadi is just a single crime without religious motives, just like the crime of raping the girl. Whether a girl was actually raped by a Christian in the village, whether a girl was raped in the village at all, has not yet been clarified. However, the man who was imprisoned because of this double ambiguity is still waiting in vain for a trial. As with earlier and later massacres, the right rumor and the accompanying whispers were enough to explain and justify this case. The terrorist attack in Alexandria, which triggered the protests in January 2011, was preceded by rumors that two Christian women who had converted to Islam were being held captive in an Egyptian church and that weapons were being hidden in Egyptian churches. The latter claim was made by Muhammad Salim Alawa, one of today's much sought after reformist Islamists, who wants to run in the next presidential election and declare war on Israel. A few days after the massacre in Nag Hammadi, the police carried out a large scale house search in the town and arrested 22 Christians, who were sent to prison without being charged with a specific crime. During the subsequent demonstrations, 50 people were arrested for demonstrating. 
Heavy clashes then broke out in Nag Hammadi between the Christian and Muslim residents of the town, with bloody street battles and burning houses, until heavily armed Egyptian army units finally marched in to pacify the town. Eyewitnesses had recognized the three murderers of January 6, 2010, they were finally arrested and on January 16, 2011 one of them was sentenced to death, perhaps because the regime was worried about Egypt's international reputation at the time, perhaps because this time a Muslim, and a policeman, had also been killed in the alleged revenge attack. The previous demonstrations by Christians alone will probably not have had the desired effect. The Egyptian armed forces are now completely dependent on American arms supplies, the volume of which has grown in parallel with the Iranian threat over the past 10 years, amounting to around $1.3 billion a year. The regime is therefore susceptible to criticism from Washington and other Western capitals. On the other hand, they need each other and the president in office in Washington at the time does not like to make himself unpopular, so the criticism voiced after the terrorist attack in Alexandria was not so harshly worded as to make Cairo nervous. Perhaps not so explosive, but still too harsh for the regime's taste, was apparently the criticism of the Pope of the Catholics. In a statement distributed to the relevant embassies represented in the Vatican on January 10, Benedict XVI deplored the increasing persecution of Christians in the Middle East, highlighting the terrorist attack in Alexandria as an example. The Pope wrote that the attacks were just further proof of how urgent and necessary it is that the governments of the region, despite all the difficulties and dangers, take sufficient measures to protect religious minorities. Need we repeat it? In the Middle East, Christians are genuine and reliable citizens who stand by their homeland and fulfill their duties to the state. Do we have to repeat it? This rebuke in the form of a question was not misunderstood by the Egyptian government and prompted it to withdraw its ambassador from the Vatican perhaps the reaction to the papal criticism only became so heated because Egyptian diplomacy preferred to sit out the anger over the criticism in western capitals. As usual, the Pope left it to his press spokesman to deal with the tedious diplomatic aftermath, so that he himself did not have to retract any of the truth of what was said. There is no need to speculate on whether intensifying international criticism would have helped to increase the security of Christians in Egypt, because the revolution came, although it was clear that it would lead to a worsening of the situation. Initially, however, the Coptic youth, who had believed that the revolution was merely a continuation of their protest on a larger scale, saw themselves vindicated. This impression could also be gained from the account of the beginning of the revolution given by the authors of the International Crisis Group quoted above, although they again miscounted when they described a station that had already occurred here for the fourth time in a month as an event, without precedent, that was taking place for the first time. The numbers on January 25 surprised everyone. The protesters gathered in many places all over Cairo to undermine attempts to control them. They confused the police by constantly announcing different locations, while participants communicated via Twitter, text messages and cell phones about the new meeting points. The result was unprecedented. For the first time in most protesters' memories, their numbers outnumbered the police. The Christians, who were admittedly not among the majority of demonstrators, could have contributed their divergent memories, but minority issues no longer interested anyone anyway. Just as Abdul Masi Basit had feared, the Coptic youth plunged headlong into the turmoil on Tahrir Square, were their own concerns, for which they had demonstrated alone against the state power just a few days ago, were quickly drowned out in the general fever of the revolution. Here they now stood together with the activists of Kafaya, the coalition of the youth revolution, to which the youth of April 6 belongs, which in turn includes activists from Kafaya, the youth movement of the Muslim Brotherhood, which in turn belongs to the aforementioned coalition of the youth revolution, which also includes the youth in support of Muhammad el Baradiyai who in turn is a member of the National Association for Change. One should not be deceived by the variety of names. The various activist groups are a mixture of the same ingredients, Nasserism, Communism, Trotskyism, Anti-Imperialism and, of course, Anti-Zionism. Only the mixing ratio distinguishes the individual organizations, if at all, because they are obscurely intertwined with each other in terms of personnel. The Muslim Brotherhood or its youth organization are involved everywhere. Only El Baradai is a peculiar phenomenon, who can perhaps be described as a moderate anti-Zionist with a Nobel Prize. But what were the Christians' own concerns that the Coptic youth themselves had already forgotten? As a religious minority, they wanted to be protected from the mob that threatened them, they wanted religious freedom and equality before the law. 
nothing more than what every citizen would be entitled to, the right to be part of a community that respects the lives and property of its members. But now they were standing here with people who had a completely different idea of community. One got an idea of this when these revolutionaries later, long after the generals had taken over, recalled the good old days in the square, where they were united by a feeling they described as a mood or atmosphere, a kind of commonality and equality across all boundaries of religion, gender, class, party and rank that could only be felt in the square. That is why they were drawn back there again and again after the revolution. In this community, during the drunkenness of the state of emergency, it was of course quite absurd to ask about specific issues. Religious freedom, for example, or, derived from this, compulsory veiling were problems that, despite the perceived unity of religions and genders, had no place on the square, as discussing them would have only disturbed the beautiful communal experience. In any case, there is no state-imposed compulsory veiling in Egypt as there is in Saudi Arabia or Iran, it only exists here as a form of violence exercised by the Islamic community, i.e. as social violence, so that a debate about it seemed out of place in a movement that had come together to overthrow the regime, but not to solve social problems. One could, however, have raised the question of what kind of regime the revolt wanted to install in place of the old one and whether the new constitution should handle the Islamic dress code as liberally as the old one. Religious freedom had a similar fate in prospect. In Egypt, religious minorities have so far enjoyed religious freedom and Christians are equal citizens, albeit with certain restrictions, but here the problem lay elsewhere. The same state that legally guaranteed religious freedom was, as we have seen, not fully prepared to defend this formal right against the real injustice suffered by Christians as a result of the violence perpetrated against them by the Islamic mob. In the square, the Christians now stood united partly with the mob and partly with those who would make the laws in the future and also want to formally eliminate religious freedom. The injustice of genital mutilation, on the other hand, was not part of the Christians' own concerns from the outset and was therefore not forgotten by the Coptic youth but could not be an issue for the revolution simply because there was an intergender and interreligious consensus about it in the square. In Egypt, it has been banned by the state since 2007, but it continues to exist as a social violence that is not limited to a specific religious community, but rather subjugates the entire female gender and is exercised immediately by parents, primarily mothers, against their daughters. The ban was a law that was not enforced, so it was not a law but merely a good intention, the implementation of which depended on Suzanne Mubarak's personal commitment and the success of her educational campaigns. The commitment was greater than the success because the Egyptians consider themselves to be the heirs of the oldest civilization, which no longer needed enlightenment. Today, the ban is rejected because it was a law of the hated regime. And because there is no religious justification for genital mutilation, the new lawmakers take the position, nothing in Islam prohibits circumcision. Statistics show that over 90% of adult women in Egypt are circumcised, that before the ban 77% of girls were circumcised, now 74% are, with doctors increasingly performing circumcision instead of mothers, just as hand chopping in Saudi Arabia is now mostly carried out using modern medical methods. In view of the mental state of a population that results from such conditions, the Egyptians should have been advised to wait a little longer with the revolution because they are not ready for it. If it were true that this was the home of the oldest civilization, then the question would arise as to how many millennia it would take and whether waiting would change anything at all. But of course this was not an issue on the square, because these were problems whose discussion would have exceeded the limited horizons of the revolutionaries and overstretched the sensitive tolerance of the boundless diversity on the square. The reality on the square stood in stark contrast to the image that the world public was forming, which was consequently composed of completely superficial ideas, Spring, Youth, Facebook, SMS, etc. The point was threefold, firstly, we don't know what or who it is. Secondly, it is the youth, the new generation, the enlightened middle class. Thirdly, the Arabs are quite different from what we always thought, above all, it is not the Muslim Brotherhood that everyone is afraid of. Well, many of Egypt's citizens are young, 32.7% under 14, average age 24, so you couldn't do much with this reference unless you wanted to find out what this seal of quality is supposed to mean. The rest of the argument implied that the use of modern means of communication requires education or education and that terrorists are too stupid to set up a Facebook account or use a Blackberry. 
This crazy loss of reality was characteristic of the perception of the so-called revolution in general. And there is a simple explanation for this. Sick from a history of wars and crises, crime and betrayal, bourgeois and revolutionary self-confidence needs self-deception like an alcoholic needs alcohol to numb his fear of the bad end, which comes a little closer with every sip of this medicine. The Islamic tenor is the object of fear that creates the need for Islamic reformers. The Arab Spring came like an unexpected healing by the laying on of hands. In this country, the loudest spokespeople for the revolution were to be found among the moderate faction known as Israel Solidarity and its weekly newspaper. When they noticed with grandiloquent understanding, Joshka Fisher style, that Israel did not share their revolutionary exuberance, they had finally found a reason to criticize Israel for once. Israel's skepticism was unfounded, they said. Don't be afraid, they shouted at the Jews. The argument used by people, who certainly know how dangerous Islamic gangs are, to prove the harmlessness of this particular revolution was the claim that it had begun without the involvement of the Muslim Brotherhood, who had only joined later. This was meant to imply that the driving force behind the revolution was precisely those Facebook activists who were unseen and presented as the previously overlooked enlightened Arab youth who deserved our support. Now it is irrelevant in and of itself whether the Muslim Brotherhood was there from day one or day two, or whether they joined later in order to seize the revolution, which supposedly did not belong to them, as was said later. They were no less there from the first day, except that they weren't wearing t-shirts saying, hello, I'm one of them. In fact, in the run-up to January 25th, the Muslim Brotherhood had deliberately decided not to be visible as an organization on the square because, in light of the events in Tunisia, it seemed possible that this time it might actually succeed in forcing Hosni Mubarak to step down, especially as the presidential election was due to take place in a few months. His candidacy was unlikely and it was known that a successor was also being sought within the regime. The visibility of the Brotherhood could only harm cooperation with other activists and international sympathy. However, this consideration was only relevant to the scene in and around the square where the eyes of the world were focused. In other cities, especially in their strongholds in the Nile Delta, the Brotherhood dominated the revolution for all to see, as in Sinai, where the smuggling and other criminal gangs or Al-Qaeda groups active there took part. After the involvement of the Muslim Brotherhood became obvious, attempts were made to deny the Islamic character of the revolution by pointing to its economic drivers, because if it had any, its content would not be Islam, but bread and peace. In fact, many families in Egypt are poor, there is unemployment, injustice and a lack of prospects. Compared to other parts of Africa, Egyptians may still look rich, but that was not an argument, because they were always poor enough for a revolution. The argument also did not quite fit with the earlier one that the middle class was rebelling here, a class not usually associated with the poorest strata of society. But perhaps it was the class most affected by the lack of prospects. That could be, but it cannot be that the existence of poverty in Egypt contradicts the fact that Islam was the content of the revolution, because as the Muslim Brotherhood slogan says, Islam is the solution. This means that it is the solution to all problems, including and especially economic ones, because it is the religion of the tormented, who are promised eternal justice. Social work is the basis of Islamic mass mobilization, the bond or transmission belt, Lenin, between the people and the party. The party, which was founded by the Brotherhood after the revolution, therefore bears the name Freedom and Justice and underlines this through campaigns in poor neighborhoods, such as in October 2011 in the Cairo district of Mbaba, where it distributed food at half price to the gullible, a district in which further attacks on the Christian minority occurred over the course of the year. The Salafist party is called the Light and wants to eliminate the bondage of interest through Islamic banking. In its commitment to the poor and downtrodden, Islam is no match for socialism or Mother Teresa. But wasn't there a strike on April 6 and 7, 2008, with which the textile workers of Mahala al kubra a major industrial city in the middle of the Nile Delta, reacted to the increase in food prices? Didn't the police brutally suppress this strike and didn't activists use Facebook and text messages to call for a general strike and the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak? So it's the internet and mobile phone revolutionaries again, but this time in association with real workers in the class struggle in the style of the 19th century. This is where the April 6th youth movement emerged, which wanted to support the strikes with demonstrations, 
whose spokespeople in turn became the old acquaintances, the anti-Zionists of the Kafaya movement, so that the diversity of like-minded people appeared with ever new names and activities, only to soon find themselves in Tahrir Square. The strikes were also only superficially about food prices, which were heavily subsidized by the regime. The strikes themselves, as well as the events accompanying them, ran under the slogan, Egyptian Intifada. They were political strikes or a show of strength by the Muslim Brotherhood in a city where it played a leading role in the trade union movement and where many workers would later support the Muslim Brotherhood party. Finally, since the revolution did not produce any content that added to or even contradicted the Muslim Brotherhood's program, it took on the role that suited it, rising from the initially invisible to the highly visible leader of the movement. This happened not only in the later parliamentary elections, but already in the square, because the Brotherhood had something ahead of all the others, a program and an organization. The advantage became apparent the moment the clashes with the police got tougher. One activist later explained with an example, they were very helpful. When people got fed up with just standing around and watching, they organized reinforcements. They were very good at organizing stone factories to produce supplies of ammunition and build barricades. The authors of the International Crisis Group described the Brotherhood's rapid change of role from their own perspective, the Brotherhood initially observed the situation cautiously or even fearfully, envisioning the repression that would inevitably follow their participation in a failed revolt. But their attitude soon changed, partly in response to pressure from their many younger members in Tahrir Square and the surprising strength of the protest. Once the decision to fight had been made, there was no turning back for them, Mubarak had to be brought down or his retribution would be terrible. The role of Islamist activists grew the more violent the confrontation became and the more they moved away from Cairo, especially in the Delta, their own deep roots and the relative weakness of the secular opposition gave them a leading role. But then an even more powerful organization entered the stage of the revolution. The generals also initially played their role in such a way that their intentions remained invisible, their intervention was initially only noticed by the sudden disappearance of the police from the scene, the very part of the power apparatus on which Hosni Mubarak relied. Soldiers took over the position. They handed out sweets and chocolate to the revolutionaries and vowed not to shoot at them. The promise held for three quarters of a year, then, on the night of October 9th, Soldiers shot at a demonstration of Christians after the Islamic mob had set fire to a church. Twenty-four Christians were murdered that night, partly by gunfire and partly by military vehicles running into the crowd and running people over. As in early January, the Christians fought numerous street battles with the new power in the days that followed, their slogans now being, Muslims. Christians. Overthrow the field marshal, and Tantavi is a murderer. A total of 26 Christians had already been killed in March and May when the mob mobilized by the Salafists set fire to their churches, stores and houses. This time, the killers were motivated by alleged love affairs and similar unbelievable things. In these cases, as before the revolution, the new regime had always distinguished itself by its inactivity, for which it gave itself the seal of approval of impartiality. Did the Christians now have to fear the new rulers not only because of their indifference, but as a deadly enemy themselves. The day after the massacre in October, the murderer sentenced to death in January 2010 following the terrorist attack in Alexandria and the demonstrations by Christians at the beginning of the year was hanged. Two ministers resigned in protest at the violence perpetrated by soldiers against Christians until the military council promised to punish the perpetrators. This was granted to the Christians for their 50 deaths. At this point, however, the new rulers found themselves embroiled in a power struggle that was undecided, but in which their rivals, the Islamic parties, were gaining political ground from day to day. From a Christian perspective, there was therefore only the prospect that their situation could continue to deteriorate catastrophically, but no prospect of improvement. The next shots were fired in November, immediately before the parliamentary elections, when the revolution returned to the square. The Muslim Brotherhood and Salafists had called for a joint demonstration of power after Friday prayers. When soldiers tried to clear the square on Saturday morning, the activists joined them so as not to lose touch with the Islamic Revolution and deny their character once again, there are no parties here, no Muslims and no Christians. We are the people. The Coptic youth were also there again. Christians stood guard while the Muslims prayed so that soldiers would not disturb them. There must be something to the saying that hope dies last. 
The difference between concept and reality establishes the possibility of revolutionary practice, not the mere concept. Max Horkheimer In December 2009, someone said about his Egyptian homeland, I come from a country where there is an unwritten agreement between the individual and society, you accept the rules, but also the constraints of the collective society and don't question them, and in return you can count on the solidarity and recognition of everyone. In every decision, you have the support of your father, your teacher, the imam or a verse from the Quran. You are never alone, in a positive or negative sense. Individuality is given up for security and support. A good year later, the same person explains to the German public via ARD and ZDF, the Egyptians are ready for democracy, hoot.de. And, the Egyptian people want freedom, you can literally feel it in every corner of Egypt, D. Welt, February 7, 2011. What radical upheavals in Egyptian society must have taken place in just a few months, and nobody noticed, except Hamed Abdul Samad, who made the statements. However, Abdul Samad does not seem to have been quite so sure either, otherwise he would not have had to decree the nature of the weeks-long protests on Cairo's Tahrir Square in such a defiant, even authoritarian tone, I insist that it is a revolution. If one follows the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels to assess whether a cause can be defined as revolutionary, in which the proletariat was not identified as the only revolutionary subject, but rather what destroys feudal, patriarchal, idyllic conditions, was defined as revolutionary. Then the masses on Tahrir Square should not only have demonstrated for the end of the Mubarak era, but also for the fact that, in the words of Abdul Samad, they are no longer forced to sacrifice their individuality to Egyptian collective society, and this should have been directed specifically against the regime of father, teacher, imam and the Quranic faith in general. In the first chapter, Bourgeois and Proletarians, it says, the bourgeoisie has played a highly revolutionary role in history. The bourgeoisie, where it has come to power, has destroyed all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has ruthlessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties which bound man to his natural superior, and has left no other bond between man and man than naked interest, than unfeeling payment in cash. It has drowned the holy shivers of pious enthusiasm, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of philistine melancholy in the ice-cold water of selfish calculation. It has dissolved personal dignity into exchange value and replaced the countless vested and well-acquired freedoms with an unscrupulous freedom of trade. It has, in a word, substituted open, impudent, direct, arid exploitation for exploitation cloaked in religious and political illusions. The bourgeoisie has stripped all the hitherto venerable and piously revered activities of their halo. It has transformed the doctor, the lawyer, the clergyman, the poet, the man of science into its paid laborers. The bourgeoisie has torn away the touching and sentimental veil from the family relationship and reduced it to a purely monetary relationship. The bourgeoisie has revealed how the brutal expression of power, which reaction admires so much in the Middle Ages, found its fitting complement in the laziest bearskinning. Only it has proved what human activity can achieve. It has accomplished quite other marvels than Egyptian pyramids, Roman aqueducts and Gothic cathedrals, it has performed quite other feats than migrations and crusades. Quote, end. In reality, Abdul Samad also knows that there can be no question of this, as he lamented to the Taz in November 2010 about the Egyptian reality, when he, Abdul Samad, asks anyone on the street why these, Islamic, societies used to be leading in what has happened since then, he always gets the answer, because we have distanced ourselves from the religion, May 11, 2010. Hamed Abdul Samad is not only Henrik M. Broder's buddy, with whom he went on a Germany safari for ARD in 2010. As a German and Egyptian citizen, he drummed up support for the alleged revolution on Tahrir Square from the FAZ to Jungle World. His reputation as credible and authentic was enhanced by the fact that he combined the brazen claim that, even the Islamists, were demanding freedom and democracy, on Tahrir Square with a popular threat, the hatred of the West by the alleged revolutionaries would continue as long as it did not unconditionally support the masses longing for democracy in the Middle East. In Jungle World on March 3, 2011, Stefan Grigot wrote under the headline, Spoilsport Israel, Israel is being called upon to seize the opportunity and finally put an end to checkpoints and siege, without even mentioning why these checkpoints exist in the West Bank. There is thunderous applause on German television for such a formulation. 
Especially when, as Haim Abdul Samad did in the ZDF program was Nun, Nehost, Shimon Stein, the former Israeli ambassador to Germany, is slammed in the face. Abdul Samad clearly doesn't distrust the enthusiasm he receives from the German audience, who celebrate him as the authentic voice of the masses rising up against a puppet of the West. In an interview for the online portal Der Westen, Abdul Samad confirmed that this threat is primarily directed against Israel, as Stepan Grigit noted, if Israel really is a democratic state, it should side with the Democrats. If Israel really wants peace, it should show solidarity with the Democrats in Egypt, January 2, 2011. In the ZDF program Hoot on February 1, 2011, Abdul Samad declared, I hope that all Western governments now understand that this is their last chance to side with democracy in the Middle East. If they miss this chance, they will have no more credibility and no more allies in the Middle East. Abdul Samad is not a cheap demagogue whose sole aim is to paint a rosy picture of the events in Egypt at the beginning of 2011 against his better judgment. Rather, he acted as someone driven by his own theses on Islam and Arab society. Abdul Samad's popular, criticism of Islam, in Germany, which certainly contains truth, has long since made him a not at all innocent participant in a discourse that is not opposed to Islam but to the Enlightenment and wants to finish off civilization with culture. Deutschlandfunk, a stronghold of the discourse of cultures, believes it has found in Abdul Samad the counterpart to the authors Nekla Kalek or Ayan Hirsi Ali, who are reviled as Enlightenment fundamentalists, the 38-year-old academic strives for equidistance from all the protagonists of the debate being conducted in this country. His focus is entirely on the civilizing aspects of culture, deradio.de, September 13, 2010. It is not only since Oswald Spengler that this German distinction between civilization and culture has enchanted entire generations of critics of civilization, who believe they can use it to conceal their anti-Western resentment. In Germany, this kind of criticism is still a popular business model today, especially among public broadcasters and German film funding, which used to be called an educational mission, an educational mission that is suitable for reconciling the politically correct Deutschlandfunk with the non-governmental portal politically incorrect, which holds the protection of culture equally sacred. With Oswald Spengler, Abdul Samad himself has brought the name into play that ensures him undivided attention. It is no coincidence that the title of his successful book, The Decline of the Islamic World, A Forecast, was published in 2010. In it, he describes his personal awakening experience as the apparent transformation from radical Islam apologist to avowed critic of Islam, I came across an old book from an acquaintance that initially seemed to me to be a goldmine, Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West. I thought I could find in it all the arguments against the decadent Western civilization that was so overwhelming to me as a devout Muslim, and I felt no small amount of schadenfreude at the imminent end of this culture. But the content of the book shocked me. Because the state of the declining civilization, as Spengler describes it, seemed very familiar to me. I was very familiar with the aging culture, which had become cold and soulless and had been infiltrated by materialism and formless violence. I slogged through the difficult text until I came across this passage, at last, in the old age of dawning civilization, the fire of the soul goes out. The waning power ventures once more, with half success, in classicism, which is no stranger to a dying culture, on a greater creation, the soul thinks back once more, in romanticism, wistfully to its childhood. At last, tired, disenchanted and cold, it loses its desire for existence and longs, as in Roman imperial times, to return from a thousand years of light to the darkness of primal mysticism, to the womb, to the grave. It was still too early for a Copernican turnaround. It was not until more than ten years later that I ventured once more into the decline of the West. Now I read the book with different eyes and tried to follow Spengler's advice to look the decline of one's own culture in the eye. By analogy with the sprouting, blossoming and withering of a plant. Spengler, had tried to explain the life cycle of a culture as the morphology of history, page 12 ff. In his Philosophy of Destiny, which he regarded as a German philosophy, Spengler presented a total of eight high cultures, to which he counted the ancient and occidental cultures, which stood in irreconcilable opposition to one another. He saw his work as the first historico-philosophical critique of a modern humanity that was supposedly incessantly progressing towards something higher and nobler. The great success of his work can be explained above all by the fact that in the year of publication of the first volume in 1918, 
the second followed in 1922, he hit the nerve of the times, the First World War was drawing to a close and the German cultural people, quite unlike the victorious powers, felt they were in decline. Spengler's objection to the prevailing teleology of history reads like an anticipated passage from a Horkheimer essay against the logical course of world history, I am protesting here against two assumptions, writes Spengler, which have so far corrupted all historical thinking, against the assumption of a final goal for all of humanity and against the denial of final goals in general, Munich 1972, 613. In diametric contrast to Horkheimer, however, whose 1942 essay, Authoritarian State, ended with the statement that teleology makes human determination a priori impossible, Spengler resolved his critical thought by renouncing human subjectivity altogether, which is confusingly similar to the oblivion of being, later lamented by Heidegger, life has a goal. It is the fulfillment of what was set with its conception. But the individual human being belongs by birth either to one of the high cultures or only to the human type in general. There is no third great unit of life for him. But thus his destiny lies either within the framework of zoological or world history, Ibid. Human reason, which goes beyond the first nature, the zoological, as well as beyond the assumption that it is merely an appendage of a high culture, which Spengler characteristically refers to as an organism, must not exist and thus neither a human history nor its prehistory. And from this follows a very decisive fact, established here for the first time, that man is not only without history before the emergence of a culture, but becomes without history again as soon as civilization develops into its full and final form and thus ends the living development of culture, has exhausted the last possibilities of a meaningful existence, Gibbet. Horkheimer's criticism, directed above all against the determinism of Marxism-Leninism, also applies in its entirety to German ideology and thus to Spengler. The historical scheme of such raisonnements only knows the dimension in which progress and regression take place, it refrains from human intervention. It merely assesses them as what they are in capitalism, as social quantities, as things, Gibbet. The fact that Spengler's morphology, alongside the generally valid category of high culture, does not recognize any external distinction between progress or regression, but only the hermetically self-contained, progressive realization of its possible, until, completion, synonymous with its end, is cultural relativism par excellence, not least in its mortal decay. Although Spengler does not recognize a dialogue between cultures, but only victory, defeat and ultimately the downfall of the victor in decadence, it is precisely in this way that he has had a decisive influence on the current cultural discourse. Spengler's sprouting, blossoming and withering, the plant-like growth and death of cultures, Adorno, this vegetative process in which no human being can actively intervene, which Abdul Samad is so fascinated by, asserts the complete autonomy of organisms and thus not least their worthiness of protection against all criticism. No wonder, then, that Abdul Samad was called to the witness stand by Dutchland Radio as a thoroughly spiritual representative of his own culture, Abdul Samad, against the criticism of Islam declared to be hostile to dialogue, as a critic of Islam, he is an exceptional phenomenon. Not a zealot, more of a philosopher. Not someone with ready-made answers, someone who wants to enter into dialogue with others. The naturalization of culture, its transformation into a law of nature, forms the basis for Abdul Samad's thesis of the lawful demise of Islam. The sympathy for his theses, not only in quasi-state radio, is based on the fact that the death sentence on the Western world, which has actually long since perished, always precedes the alleged demise of Islamic culture. The philosopher Abdul Samad always speaks of Spengler, and Spengler speaks of the German people indulging in wild fantasies of doom, who also believed they recognized the cultural bankruptcy of their conquerors in their own downfall in 1918. Abdul Samad puts it like this, the disappearance of the culturally interested population, the death of art and the fixation on painem et circensis, bread and games, the generations that Spengler attributed to the West, are all phenomena that one can clearly recognize when taking a closer look at an Islamic society, provided one looks beyond the pious facade, page 14. What superficially sounds not at all dissimilar to the criticism of the culture industry in the dialectic of enlightenment soon proves to be the opposite with Abdul Samad and his lovers. Anyone who follows Spengler will hardly be able to get rid of the fact that in the Stone Colossus World City he recognized the demise of culture in civilization as finally complete and that this essentially Western Moloch has gained entry into other organisms as an undead parasite. The hostility towards modern urbanity is based on the longing for an idol, 
Mark slash Engels, in which blood ties regulate human relationships, these last cities, Spengler laments, are mere dwellings created not by blood, but by purpose, not by feeling, but by the economic spirit of enterprise, page 674. This romantic anti-capitalism, which laments the artificiality of the city as cultural decay and blames this on the social relationship called capital instead of understanding it as revolutionary and progressive, as in the Communist Manifesto, turns the necessary criticism of the narrowness and ugliness of big cities into a rejection of any condition of the possibility of individual happiness, inflated into an existential judgment. It probably also has to do with the fact that Spengler was never an original racist, because race meant nothing biological to him, but always something cosmic and soulful, page 689, that Abdul Samad can refer to him so faithfully without being shunned for it. Abdul Samad's elevation to the status of philosopher is primarily due to the fact that he is well received not despite, but because of his doom mongering about the inevitable downfall of Islam. It is the degradation of the subject, who can only become an appendage of inevitable historical destiny, that inspires enthusiasm for his book and awakens an old German longing in Ditchland Radio, the book conveys a third way in the polarizing debate. It does not offer patent remedies for conflict resolution, but a comprehensive explanation of the processes that must be set in motion to enable Muslims to connect intellectually with modernity. This neutralized, mechanistic language of processes, courses and connections, purged of any subjectivity, is the way of thinking of those who cannot ignore any doom and gloom without immediately elevating it to a cultural critique. Adorno argued against this culture of the third way, in order to escape the magic circle of Spengler's morphology, it is not enough to defame barbarism and rely on the health of culture. Rather, the element of barbarism must be penetrated by culture itself, page 71. This penetration becomes impossible if, like Abdul Samad, one harbors the intention of wanting to look beyond an allegedly pious facade of Islamic society in order to search for the real thing behind it. In this way, what constitutes Islamic propaganda is declared to be essentially healthy and a German enlightener becomes a constructive apologist for internalized coercion, while in the West there is an antithesis to materialism and consumerism in the cultural repertoire of enlightenment and humanism. Lived Islam lacks a healthy defense mechanism against consumption without categorically excluding and condemning it. One could say that consumption without Kant leads to confusion, page 15. Decades ago, Horkheimer slash Adorno denounced the fact that enlightenment, humanism and religion are only supposed to fulfill the social function of a counterpole or defense mechanism as part of that administered world that drives the self-destruction of enlightenment. No wonder, then, that Abdul Samad cannot be capable of differentiating between the essence and appearance, the general and the particular, of Islamic societies. His concept of the current meaning of Islam is downright anti-critical. Starting from the inevitable decay of Islam, Abdul Samad states that it can no longer offer any constructive exclamation point. Answers to the questions of modern life and to the decay of a culture that places its own particularity above change, although this particularity no longer corresponds to any substance, give it. As if this were not precisely the social place of ideology formation, as if it were not the essence of ideology to cover up and disguise the difference between concept, Islam, and reality, reality of life, and as if this were not precisely why we speak of a necessarily false consciousness, which is a mass and crisis consciousness could neither be neatly separated with a dissecting knife from any state propaganda, a tribal tradition, nor from Islam itself. Only those who tear reality apart into its particles instead of grasping it in its unity of diversity and bringing it to its concept can, like Abdul Samad, give a general all clear in view of the obvious crisis in Arab societies, which has turned Islam more than ever before into something that can no longer be distinguished from ideology. As far as Islam is concerned, writes Abdul Samad, it may be all sorts of things in its current state, but in my opinion it is certainly not one thing, it is not powerful. On the contrary, it is seriously ill and is in retreat, both culturally and socially. The religiously motivated violence, the increasing Islamization of the public sphere and the convulsive insistence on the visibility of symbols are nervous reactions to this retreat. The advance of Islamism is merely an excited mobilization and, as Spengler writes, woe to those who confuse mobilization with victory, page 18. But all the more woe to those who, like Abdul Samad, understand and ignore this as a sign of the certain decline of Islam, as Adorno himself insisted in 1955 when answering the question will Spengler be right, after, or rather despite, Auschwitz, 
First of all, one will have to say the simplest thing, that the West has not yet perished. The criminal jalassenheit with which Abdul Samad basically only illustrates the downfall of the Islamic world in his book of over 200 pages and consequently spreads more than just expedient optimism in view of the events in Egypt at the beginning of 2011 devalues every correct observation he makes. Facts about contemporary Egyptian society that anyone who hasn't been fooled by the events in Tahrir Square could know, can be found in abundance in Abdul Samad's book from last year, if an Egyptian woman dared to lift her veil demonstratively today, she would probably be crushed by the masses, because it is not just a religious symbol, which it used to be, but has become a symbol of struggle. If someone were to write a book about their loss of faith, it would shorten their life expectancy, page 87f. Or, many people think that democracy is a regulation that can be implemented from above. They cannot understand that the constitution, free elections and parliamentarianism are only symbols of democracy and that the soul of democracy lies in the mindset of the people and their common sense, page 169. In the face of the mass protests at the beginning of 2011, Abdul Samad has obviously not only decided not to say another word about Egyptian life expectancy and common sense, but to declare the average Egyptian mindset to be akin to the soul of democracy. It is easy to understand why someone like Abdul Samad, who has been driven out of the country by the intolerability of an authoritarian society, will do everything in his power to support any movement of protest that could promise even a glimmer of hope for improvement. His penetrating whitewashing of the Egyptian protests can perhaps also be partly explained in this way. And yet he has not only played the voluntary helper for all those in this country who have always known that criticism of Islam is a highly dangerous attack on the dialogue between cultures, that true freedom means being part of a coercive organization and that democracy is only realized when a mass of people chant the demands appropriate to their nature. When asked by ZDF whether he would have to rewrite his book after the events in Tunisia and Egypt, Abdul Samad replied boldly, no, not at all. The Islamic world as we knew it has perished, hoot.de. Sem Oshdemir and his party colleagues are not the only ones who have happily heard the message. In the FAZ, in which Oshdemir outed himself as a Patrick Bonner's fan, the Green Party leader also showed that he had learned from Abdul Samad, the debate can no longer be conducted without also thinking about the revolutions in Egypt and Tunisia. The loud call for democracy, freedom and participation in prosperity in these Muslim countries is really getting the radical critics of Islam into trouble with their construction of a supposedly unchangeable being, May 27, 2011. At the beginning of 2011, almost nobody wanted to listen closely and only heard calls for democracy and freedom. It seems strange that someone who has been known since 1979 to want to be anything but this became the voice of reason, Bauman Niramand. Presumably because he still remembers the failure of the Iranian left in its alliance with the mullahs, he seems to have had a premonition that the misery in Egypt could be repeated. Niramand is one of the very few commentators who has succeeded in putting down on paper what is actually a simple thought, Western media talk about a democratization process without examining more closely whether the conditions for this form of government exist in the Arab countries and whether the masses of insurgents are even striving for such a system, Taz, March 29, 2011. Thinking about the preconditions for democratization presupposes the need to penetrate the element of barbarism in the culture itself, as Adorno demanded. In relation not only to Egyptian culture, but to Islamic culture in general, we need to talk about a phenomenon for which the term youth bulge is gradually being coined. Some Wikipedia authors have provided information about the causes of the youth bulge, the approximately 2 billion people living in Islamic and African countries today account for 300 million young men between the ages of 15 and 30. However, due to the demographics there and the often desolate and underdeveloped economic structures, they are not given the opportunity to achieve an acceptable social status. This is partly due to the more traditional forms of society in many third world countries. Due to primogeniture, only the firstborn have opportunities for social advancement, while the remaining surplus offspring do not find an adequate place in society, resulting in a large discrepancy between individual aspirations and social reality. If we take this as the basis for a critique of the conditions there and do not draw the stupid conclusion, as the left does, that everything is just a social issue that has nothing to do with Islam, then we should ask. What is the situation in Egypt regarding criticism of the principle of primogeniture, and thus of the Muslim family tradition? One can assume that such criticism exists. However, one must also assume that it is not only marginal, 
but that its public expression poses serious dangers to body and life, because the social need for a real revolution in Egyptian society simply does not exist, not even among the majority of those who protested in Tahrir Square. The respected Islamic scholar Reinhard Scholz, on the other hand, has transfigured the character of the Arabellion as an emancipative youth movement on behalf of the entire public opinion in Germany, you can compare it with the youth movements that were directed against the Adenauer Republic. There too, as now in the Arab world, it was about individual freedom, Taz, January 6, 2011. In Egypt and elsewhere, however, there is no talk of a generational conflict that deserves its name because it is aimed at the individual's emancipation from tribe and clan. Unfortunately, almost everything suggests that the great discrepancy between individual aspirations and social reality, as the Wikipedia authors call it, consists of something else, in contrast to the protests in West Germany in the late 1950s and 1960s against the mustiness of a thousand years. What, for example, the sister reports on the sole household of the Tunisian martyr of self-immolation, Muhammad Bouazizis, could therefore easily have been a description of the reality of life for an average male representative of the youth bulge in Egypt, Muhammad brought home between three and five euros from selling fruit in the evening, which his mother and five siblings lived on. His father died a long time ago. Muhammad couldn't think about starting his own family. He didn't have the money to pay for a wedding the necessary dowry, Spiegel Online, January 23, 2011. In other words, not wanting to live differently from one's parents, but not being able to live like them, this is, the great discrepancy, which is not a discrepancy because it turns out to be the need to continue what already exists, as a lack of desire to break with the socially constitutive tradition embodied by Islam, in which the bride and groom saying, I do to each other at the wedding is of the least importance in the formation of marriages. The only thing that could be called revolutionary would therefore be what has not been done so far, or rather, what had to be done because of the social constitution and has not ended even after Mubarak's rule, the protest against the mustiness of a thousand years, which in Egypt on Tahrir Square must have been at most behind closed doors. The FAZ is the only newspaper in Germany to have given revolutionary thought to a revolution of Egyptian conditions in the spirit of the Communist Manifesto, i.e. how to destroy the feudal, patriarchal and idyllic. The newspaper for Germany also asked itself the question, why are the Egyptians so poor? The answers did not consist of the usual ideological text modules from A for exploitation to C for colonialism and capitalism to Z for Zionism, but were derived from a comparison with a society located far to the east. Quote, 50 years ago, there was a country that resembled the Arab superpower in most important respects, South Korea. The Asian Republic had roughly the same number of inhabitants, whose numbers grew at the same rate. The people were just as poor as the Egyptians, they also suffered from a dictatorship and high military spending. Today, South Korea is a technology-driven industrial power, the South Koreans are five times as rich as the Egyptians, they live ten years longer, and in a true democracy. South Korea's leadership has successfully propagated small families since the 1960s. This policy brought South Korea the so-called demographic dividend, families and the state had to invest less in children. The Asian country benefited from a sharp rise in national income due to increased capital formation and lower costs for economically dependent age groups. The consequences are striking, South Korea has managed to bring its young citizens into employment, while in Egypt the generation of sons and daughters is threatened by unemployment and a lack of prospects and has been thrown back into the shadow economy, June 2, 2011. In view of such a victory over the youth bulge and the societal stagnation that has led to it, it would be an exaggeration to speak of a South Korean revolution. But what has been achieved there would be an objection to all revolutionary romantics as the inescapable claim to any protest in the Middle East. The British are different from the Germans. The following interesting and strangely unexcited introductory reflection by Jonathan Spire to an article entitled, Who Should Rule Syria? Nobody, which appeared in The Spectator on August 20, 2016, would have earned a scolding and disgrace in Germany in the same August, the long civil war in Syria is still far from over. Any real chance of a rebel victory ended with the intervention of Russian forces last fall, but while the initiative now lies with the Assad regime, the government forces are also far from a decisive breakthrough. So who, if anyone, should the UK support in the Syrian slaughterhouse, and what might progress look like in this broken and bleeding country? In Germany, 
people do not ask such frivolous questions, here they begin their deliberations with the axiomatic answer, the Syrian people must be supported in their desire for freedom, which they have so bravely demonstrated in a sacrificial civil war against a revenant of Hitler. Period. The British author's question, which appears to be based purely on a calculation of benefits, perfidiously allows Western support for the Assad regime as one option for resolving the conflict. Most Germans would readily agree with his answer to this option, even if they instinctively reject the anti-people reference to two variants of Islamism that threaten world peace, it should be obvious that a victory for the Assad regime would be a disaster for the West. Assad, an enthusiastic user of chemical weapons against his own people, is allied with the most powerful anti-Western coalition in the Middle East. This is a coalition dominated by the Islamic Republic of Iran. It includes Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Shiite militias of Iraq and the Pakistani Islamic Jihad. If Assad were to win, the Iranian alliance would consolidate its dominance over the entire area between Iraq-Iran and the Mediterranean, a decisive step towards Iran's hegemony over the entire region. An Assad victory would therefore be good for Islamism, at least in its Shiite variant, and bad for world peace. It should be prevented. What would be the alternative to Assad? While the Germans would immediately call for no-fly zones over Aleppo and preferably a united strike against Assad's militias after this completely correct brief analysis, so that the liberated people could then take their fate into their own hands, Jonathan Spire continues his article no less correctly, the controversy begins when someone starts to consider the alternative to an Assad victory. Reflection on possible unpleasant aspects of this alternative that could endanger world peace is steadfastly refused in Germany, but also in Spire's home country, where not only the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn and nasty EU European propaganda machines such as The Guardian and still large parts of the BBC, but also state conservatives have spent years promoting the victory of a politically moderate people fighting for Western values that do not exist, and in many cases still do, last. November David Cameron claimed that he had killed 70. 000 moderate rebels ready to challenge the Islamic State in eastern Syria. This figure was a myth. The editor devoted to them was among the very first Western journalists to spend time among Syrian rebels. I recently returned from a trip to southern Turkey, where I interviewed fighters and commanders from the main rebel alliances. Without particular pleasure, but with considerable conviction, I can report that the Syrian insurgency today is consistently dominated by Sunni Islamist forces. And the most powerful among them are also the most radical. After a brief analysis of the gangs dominating events under the umbrella of Jaish al fadah Army of Conquest, namely Arar al-Sham, Free Men of the Levant, a Salafist jihadist group, Jab Hat al-Nusra, until recently the official offshoot of al-Qaeda in Syria, now renamed Jab Hat Fatah al-Sham, and Falak al-Sham, Legion of the Levant, whose ideology stems from the Sunni branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. Note Spire, the small groups of the Free Syrian Army that still exist only do so. With the permission of Jayish al fadah and only as long as they are useful to them. In the currently very unlikely event that the Islamist rebels defeat Assad's regime and reunite Syria under their rule, the country would become a Sunni Islamist dictatorship. The more probing question remains, so if there is no British or Western interest in a victory for either the regime or the rebels, what should be done about Syria? In Germany, where this question does not arise because people do not want to talk about the looming Sunni Islamist dictatorship, as they have long since condoned it and are in favor of the victory of the people under the leadership of Sunni rebels, who are of course moderate, strong images and even stronger words are needed instead for a mendacious and highly dangerous campaign. In the summer of 2016, the ideological triad was found, Little Omran, Srebrenica and Auschwitz. Little Omran, as the boy who was pulled from the rubble of a bombed house in Aleppo in mid-August 2016 is known, was doubly lucky, he survived the collapse of the house and was only five years old, not twelve, like the Palestinian Abdullah Taysir al-Isa, who had been beheaded on camera a month earlier by militants from the Nur al-Din al-Zenki movement in the same district. Both children's fates converge in the person of Mahmoud Raslan, a member of an Aleppo media center whose Facebook presence suggests that it is a perseverance center for the final victory of jihad. Raslan is the proud photographer of Omran sitting in the ambulance, apparently in shock, a picture that went around the world and made it onto the front page of Springer's Berlin mass circulation newspaper BZ, where it appeared on August 19 under the title, Aleppo, Shame for Our Civilization. 
On the same day, the SC, for whom the images of maltreated children are just as much ammunition for an attack on the remaining sanity of all of us as for Springer's competitors, did not stop at the heartbreaking reference to the fact that the English Telegraph had managed to conduct an interview with the activist. Tears started running down my face when I took the photo, Raslan said. In fact, she disgraced the actions of her own company in the entire competition by adding the following note, on Friday, various bloggers pointed to Raslan's Facebook page, on which he publishes snapshots of his missions. In a picture from August 5th, he is wearing the same striking t-shirt, as in the snapshot of Omran and poses grinning with fighters from the Zenki militia. Two of the men in the picture can be identified beyond doubt in other photos from mid-July that gained sad notoriety, the men took part in the beheading of a 12-year-old whom they accused of being a child soldier of Assad's regime. The fate of Abdullah Taysir al-Isa was worth little more than a thin piece of news, which ended to everyone's satisfaction with a statement from the butchers of Harakat Nur al-Din al-Zankis that they were distancing themselves from the incident and would investigate the background. But Amran became Aleppo and Aleppo became our shame. Images of children from war zones are propaganda tools, the bigger the eyes of the little ones look at you, the more certain you can be that the respective medium wants to commit its customers, or if, as is the case in Germany, it is all the media, the nation, to blindly taking sides on one side of the front. The depiction of a maltreated child is traditionally seen as an indictment of the war in general, the well-known horrors of which the home country of the peace movement still seriously wants to educate people about today. In reality, even after 1918, the deeper German meaning of social democratic, communist and left-wing bourgeois disgust with the war was not so much to defy the revanchists as to either completely deny the German-Austrian war guilt in an unacknowledged alliance with them or, in view of the great horror of the world war, to minimize it as a negligible marginal issue. When Germans come up with war children, it is always for the purpose of coming to terms with their own history as perpetrators. This can go so far that they identify themselves in one go with the current perpetrators related to them, who only fought to prevent an entire people from perishing and being subjected to violent expulsion, which must somehow be the same thing in German eyes since Hitler's slogans of perseverance and the expellee propaganda of the early FRG. Little Omran is the humanly touching symbol of a persevering community of Syrian homeland security in the name of the borderless Sunni Jihad and its Western allies, be it Doctors Without Borders, Oxfam, the Springer Press and even parts of the anti-German camp. The disgrace of Western civilization, denounced by the BZ, Springer has learned to dispense with the culturalist vocabulary of the community of values that must be defended, is that the USA and its allies are not making common cause with the Islamists of Mahmoud Raslan's ilk operating in Syria. With little Omran on the banner, a Syria scenario is being developed that no longer has anything to do with the civil war being fought there, its combatants and their respective interests. Anyone who does not take part in the holy war against the genocide of Aleppo, billed July 20, 16, is said to have lost at least some residual sympathy or, worse still, is secretly allied with Assad, the destroyer of the people. In the past, these were the words of doctors without borders or Oxfam, who wanted to recognize genocide in the bombing of Baghdad by the U.S. Army in 2003, directed against the axis of good lead by the USA and Great Britain. Today, this is written by people who can no longer even recognize the city limits of Aleppo in the gun smoke of their own barrel bomb propaganda, let alone who lives in this city at all. In some neighborhoods of the heavily destroyed old city of Aleppo, up to 300,000 people, probably significantly fewer, including thousands and thousands of Sunni Islamist militants, are besieged by troops of the Assad regime and its allies, largely cut off from supplies and bombed by Russian planes. The German public cannot even agree on this basic fact, which explains nothing. Instead of speaking neutrally of militants, in Aleppo, the term insurgents, e.g. die Zeit, July 31st, 16, is often used to call for solidarity, and in many cases it is not a few districts that are reported on, but the entire city, for which any help is justified and desirable. Besieged city in Syria. The Islamists are Aleppo's last hope, was the unintentionally open headline in Der Spiegel after the temporary interruption of the supply route to the embattled areas on February 8, 16, linking the goals of the Sunni Jihad with our dashed hopes for a just peace in Syria, while the USA and Europe watch as hundreds of thousands of people in Aleppo are starved to death. Islamists come to the aid of those trapped inside. They are led by a terrorist militia. 
Let it not be said that the pro-Israel world protested against such cynicism. Even worse than in the anti-US and anti-Israel Spiegel, the deepest German resentment rumbles in the heads of the top commentators of the Springer Group, who like to be called noble feathers, when it comes to the Syria issue. In a self-accusatory pose, the history of German fate, suffering and liberation, from the fall of Srebrenica and back to the existential Auschwitz, is recalled in order to hammer the same lie into the reader's heads, a people is being destroyed and we, we of all people with our special responsibility, stand idly by and watch, what a disgrace. The 15-20% to of Christians who lived in Aleppo in 2004 according to Wikipedia, the Alevites who are not quantified in the same article, the Kurds who are averse to Jihad and the secular Muslims who were once to be found in large numbers in this city are no longer even mentioned in the definition of what the Syrian people in general and the people of Aleppo in particular are. When there is talk of genocide against trapped civilians and snapshots of a jihadist killer are passed around as Proof We have Richard Herzinger to thank for the resumption of Srebrenica propaganda, a good 20 years ago, the international community and the West stood idly by and allowed Serbian units to massacre 8,000 inhabitants of the Bosnian town of Srebrenica. It was only under the shock of this atrocity that they finally decided to intervene. Today, a humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding in Aleppo, Syria, that far surpasses Srebrenica. 300,000 civilians are trapped there by troops of the Assad regime, Iran and Russia. Starvation and the targeted destruction of civilian facilities such as hospitals are a central component of the genocidal warfare waged by the Moscow-Damascus-Tehran axis. But the UN and the West let them get away with it. The civilian population is faced with the alternative of fleeing or being ruthlessly bombed and starved. It is in fact a forced displacement and thus another war crime committed under the leadership of a permanent member of the UN Security Council. Welt, February 8, 16, this outrageous equation and conflation of genocide and expulsion in relation to Aleppo was not enough for him. Six days later, Herzinger was convinced that all Syrians were being exterminated by Syrians who were not part of the people, the Western democracies seemed determined to let an entire people perish in the Syrian conflict rather than risk a confrontation with the Damascus, Moscow, Tehran or criminal axis mainly responsible for the mass deaths. Welt, August 8, 16. However, in order to reduce the matter of extermination, which Herzinger still describes as genocidal warfare or letting an entire people perish, to the formula Aleppo is Auschwitz, an expert by blood is needed, a case for Henrik Broder. He had already declared on July 31, 16, I don't want to offend or hurt anyone. I know how cautious you have to be with historical comparisons, although in principle you can compare anything with anything, anyone with anyone, Trump with Hitler, a chicken farm with a concentration camp, the EU with the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation. Always delicious, this Broder, his even dumber fans must have thought to themselves, who didn't shudder at the steep sequel, but on the contrary sent waves of pleasant shivers down their spines. I would just like to say, for me, Aleppo is worse than Auschwitz. Auschwitz is history, documented down to the last detail. Auschwitz cannot and will not be repeated. It will remain the fall from grace of 20th century European history. Now, as a seasoned newspaper reader knows, here it comes, the breaking of the taboo, but Aleppo is the present. The killing and death is being broadcast live. No one will be able to say that the slaughter took place in private. I therefore have a request to Mr. Steinmeier and M.S. Von der Leyen, to the Foreign and Defense Ministers and the EU Foreign Affairs Representative, to the Chairman of the EKD Council, Bishop Bedfordstrom and to Cardinal Marx, the Chairman of the German Bishops' Conference, to the President of the Central Council of Jews, the Federal President and to all holiday speakers who gather on every 9th of November and every 27th of January. November 9th and January 27th to commemorate Kristallnacht and the liberation of Auschwitz, shouting, resist the beginnings, please stop shedding crocodile tears for the dead Jews. Stop talking about the European Peace Project. And stop ranting about the need to fight the causes. Just shut up and be ashamed. This is fatally reminiscent of a very related piece of prose that was published two years ago and begins like this, in the face of the horror that is happening right now in Aleppo, there is no position of distance or neutrality. It is a war designed for conquest and annihilation against a people who have no resources, who are confined to a tiny area with no water, where hospitals, ambulances, and children are targets because they are accused of being terrorists. 
This is difficult to understand and impossible to justify. And it is shameful that Western countries are allowing this genocide. There's the whole Herzinger, supplemented by Broder's Auschwitz steeled, shame on you, except that the original quoted here didn't say Aleppo, but Gaza. Broder should take another deep breath before throwing around Auschwitz comparisons next time, because he continues, I cannot understand this barbarism, which seems even more cruel and incomprehensible in view of the terrible events that the Jews had to go through in the past. Only geopolitical alliances, this mendacious mask of business, the arms trade, for example, explain the shameful attitude adopted by the US, the EU and Spain. I know that, as always, certain people will discredit my right to express my opinions with personal attacks. Therefore, I would like to clarify the following points, yes, my son was born in a Jewish hospital because I have very close friends there who are Jewish and because being Jewish does not automatically mean supporting massacres, just as being Hebrew does not mean you are a Zionist, just as being a Palestinian does not automatically make you a Hamas terrorist. That's just as absurd as saying that being German makes you a Nazi. This is what probably the most European actor ever, Javier Bardem, wrote in eldiario.es on July 25, 14. But back to the starting point, the western fall from grace of Srebrenica. The peacekeepers, specifically the Dutch, could not or would not have imagined that Radko Mladic's cozy cronies in Srebrenica would seriously slaughter the 8,000 Bosnians between the ages of 12 and 70, including a minority of Bosnian militiamen, who had been handed over to them. The subsequent intervention by the West, above all the USA, which Herzinger praises so highly, resulted in the lasting weakening of Serbia and its militias operating in Bosnia. At least this meant that there was no second Srebrenica. Today, the West is faced with a Bosnian rump state that is already largely Sharia territory and from which the largest European contingents have left for Syria to join IS. In addition, there is an unpredictable partially Islamized gangland called Kosovo and a highly questionable Republika Srpska in the Serbian-claimed part of Bosnia. The civil war may be history, but what was once called Yugoslavia has not become more westernized since the West intervened. You sometimes get information about this in country articles, which doesn't impress a strategist like Herzinger, because he uses German ideology in the highest doses in the battle for mines, just like his buddy Broder. The existence of Auschwitz and its purpose were known to the Allies without any consequences being drawn from this detailed knowledge. Reflecting on the denial of reality that took place in British, American and Soviet Russian staffs could, however, be part of historical research on antisemitism. The demands for European consequences of this failure, which always start with highly questionable speculations about a mysterious complicity between the Western Allies and Germany's old elites, give cause for concern. The Germans themselves never tire of insinuating that the Allies were never concerned with saving the Jews, but only with the destruction of German cities, even with letting an entire people perish, Herzinger. Because, to continue with Javier Bardem, even today they are not really concerned with Israel, but with the destruction of Gaza in a mendacious game for oil and to the detriment of the people, who are Arab and Islamist and whom it is our shame not to defend. Srebrenica as a propaganda figure cannot be had without Auschwitz, Broder is merely taking up what Joseph Fischer so heroically said in 1999, when it came to the Kosovo War, I stand on two principles, never again war, never again Auschwitz, never again genocide, never again fascism. For me, the two belong together. The comparison between Auschwitz and Srebrenica or Kosovo was about the same thing as in Aleppo today, saving the small Omrans, many of whom are quite large and heavily armed, and ensuring that no one dares to leave the combat zone in the center of Aleppo as a civilian. In 1990-91, it was German foreign policy that not only made Germany the warring party raging on the ideological front by single-handedly recognizing Slovenia and, above all, Croatia, but also forced the EU to go along with it or look like a ridiculous bunch in the eyes of the world. The option for Yugoslavia, which was vilified as an artificial entity, did not even exist in German eyes when the civil war broke out. Instead of referring to a people in 1990-91, which, as the sum of the members of the Yugoslavian constituent nations, would probably have had a better post-socialist future in a united Yugoslavia than in the patchwork of small states, it had to be the naturally real peoples, the Croats, who were increasingly uninhibited in acknowledging their Ustasha past and the inhabitants of large parts, but not all of Bosnia, who were called Muslims. 
The fight against the artificial and therefore not viable and certainly not worthy multi-ethnic state was waged in the name of the tribal and blood nation, which resulted in the demonization of Serbia, which upheld the Yugoslav idea until 1990. Since hindsight is wiser, it is difficult to deny that a political option of the West for the preservation of Yugoslavia would have been the more sensible and humane way, but probably not feasible from the outset. The old hatred was too deep, which became even greater with the massacres after the liberation in 1944, especially by members of Tito's partisan army, which was not entirely Serbian. The Srebrenica massacre also stands for this hatred. However, the Yugoslav war was not designed to physically annihilate entire populations, in the case of Srebrenica the Bosnian Muslims. First German, then Pan-European propaganda deliberately described real expulsions, Muslims and Croats from today's Republika Srpska, Croats and later Serbs from Croatian Krajina, and staged expulsions, Kosovars from Kosovo in 1999, as genocide in order to finally gain the moral right to intervene. The Yugoslavian civil war was about creating ethnically pure states. As there were almost no such states anywhere, expulsions were to be used to help. Precisely what could perhaps have been prevented by defending the multi-ethnic state of Yugoslavia was carried out all the more cruelly with reference to the right to self-determination of the autochthonous peoples. However, the murder of up to 8,000 men and young people, although a war crime, is not an action to eliminate all Bosnian Muslims, as German propaganda suggests to this day. Broder's atrocity was the reference to Auschwitz in an Aleppo debate contaminated with Srebrenica comparisons. The reference to a genocide in connection with Yugoslavia is not legitimate when using the name Srebrenica, but, and even then only with considerable restrictions, with regard to Jasenovac, the death camp in which at least 80,000 people were slaughtered by the Ustasha Croats between 1941 and 1944, mainly Serbs, Roma and Jews, but also Bosnian Muslims. The killing of Yugoslav Jews in Jasenovac was the Croatian contribution to the German genocide of the Jews of Europe. The mass killings of mainly Serbs and, to a lesser extent, Roma and Muslims carried the possibility that one day perhaps all Serbs, Bosniaks and Roma in the territory of the defeated Yugoslav kingdom really were to fall victim. However, such a hypothesis does not seem likely when compared with the atrocities that actually took place and the plans of the Greater Croatia, which did not refer to the entire Yugoslav territory. Pro-American authors, i.e. those who are on the right side in the War on Terror, often emphasized the successes of the NATO interventions in Bosnia or Kosovo in order to dispel the concerns of their critics, today's opponents of the war, with whom they knew they were in agreement at the time. One example. Henrik M. Broder summed up his reservations about the European policy of appeasement towards Islamism in the Weltem Sontag newspaper as follows, Europe, your family name is appeasement. Matthias Dopfner took up this formulation a few days later in Die Welt and remarked that he could no longer get this sentence out of his head because it is so terribly right. European appeasement had cost the lives of millions of Jews and non-Jews, he said, because Britain and France had realized too late that they could not negotiate with Hitler. Disguised in a nebulous word equidistance, European appeasement today relativizes the Palestinian suicide attacks in Israel and allows Europe to overlook the 300,000 victims murdered and tortured by Saddam Hussein, in peace-moving self-righteousness. Finally, it is, appeasement in its most grotesque form, to react to the escalating violence of Islamist fundamentalists in the Netherlands with the proposal to introduce a Muslim holiday in Germany. One can only escape this assessment by deliberately playing dumb and would like to provide further examples to prove its correctness, such as the Spanish voters' prostration before terrorism after the attacks in Madrid on March 11, 2004 or the hide-and-seek game of European diplomacy and the United Nations about the Iranian nuclear bomb, which is currently being presented to the world public. The war against Islamic fascism is necessary and the realization of this necessity is being prevented in Europe by anti-American resentment. The only caveat to Broder and Dopfner is that their assessment does not do equal justice to all the countries of the European Union, that Europe is divided on this issue and that it is currently the dominance of Germany and France that makes the entire Union appear to be united in anti-Americanism. Even if it is now old hat, the distinction between old Europe and new Europe introduced by Donald Rumsfeld does far more justice to reality. Broder, Dopfner, Die Welt and apparently the overwhelming majority of those who support the anti-fascist campaign against Islamism to the best of their ability are addicted to appeasement towards Germany. 
As a result, most of the pro-American authors also come to crude judgments about other theaters of war in which Islamism plays a significant role, which these authors do not recognize, but instead choose to deny, suppress, or ignore. And finally, they also side with the Islamists, as the examples of Chechnya and Yugoslavia show. This also applies to Matthias Dopfner in his search for further evidence of European appeasement towards Islamism and for suitable historical comparisons, he finally claims that it was the same appeasement that paralyzed Europe when genocide raged in Kosovo and debated until the Americans did our job there. This strange comparison between the Iraq and Kosovo wars is based on insinuations and false assumptions. After all, there was never any appeasement towards Yugoslavia or Serbia, at least not in Germany. One could come up with the idea of characterizing the policy of France and England between 1991 and 1994 as such, since both countries had initially tried to avoid a war between the Balkan peoples and, when this failed, finally placed themselves between the fronts with a joint blue helmet protection force and thus failed once again. However, this appeasement would have been won towards all participants in the war, not only towards Yugoslavia slash Serbia, but also towards its opponents and especially towards Germany, which supported the war from the outset. It was precisely against Germany's resistance, which uncompromisingly supported the popular uprisings in Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo and defended them against its partners in the European Union, NATO and the United Nations, that any attempt at appeasement was bound to be unsuccessful. To speak of a European appeasement with regard to the war in Yugoslavia is therefore misleading, in stark contrast to today's German-British-French appeasement of Iran's nuclear policy, part of a diplomacy that fully deserves the name. The conclusions drawn by Matthias Dopfner can therefore only be reached by those who a priori adopt the traditional German friend slash enemy image, i.e. see Yugoslavia slash Serbia as the aggressor and its opponents, the separatist insurgents in Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo, per se as its victims. However, this interpretation of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia is a direct reversal of the actual course of the war and its prehistory, which is precisely why it is a feat of German war propaganda, especially in the preliminary and early phases of the war, in the dissemination of which Die Welt, for example, was not a leading contributor. This can be said more of the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, but nevertheless contributed its share. Slobodan Milosevic equals Saddam Hussein, Croats, Bosnians, Kosovo Albanians equals America, this is the formula that results from such historical falsification. This parallelization is often used by pro-American authors and politicians to convict those of logical contradiction and inconsistency who, in view of the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, had temporarily put aside their pacifist inclinations in order to plunge into war against the Serbian dictator and the Yugoslav prison of nations, ideally embodied by the Green Party, for example. However, the Greens are not at all irritated by this, as they identify Milosevic with the aggressors Bush and Sharon and attribute the right to liberation from occupation in violation of international law to the Iraqi resistance and the Palestinians. It is therefore easy for the Greens to return the accusation of inconsistency to Die Welt, for example, since it supported the liberation struggle of the Balkan peoples and previously that of the East Germans, but not that of the oppressed peoples in the Near and Middle East. The fact that the Germans fought the war against Yugoslavia and the Serbs with just as much enthusiasm as they now reject the war against Islamic fascism is only seemingly a contradiction. If one compares the respective warring parties more closely, back then the ethnic uprising against socialist Yugoslavia under the supposed rule of the Serbs, who were declared a minority in the seceded republics and provinces before being expelled, today the anti-Semitic terror against the USA and Israel one can easily recognize the consistency and stringency of German foreign policy. Germany is always on the side of the downtrodden and struggling peoples, and this was already the case in the days when the CDU still provided the federal chancellor and the FDP the foreign minister. After all, there is always a consensus in Germany that it was not the Germans who changed sides after September 11, but the USA. Matthias Dopfner could, however, have found an indication of the actual situation in the same issue of the newspaper in which his commentary on European appeasement towards Islamism appeared. After first being reported on by ZDF Hoot Journal on November 18, 2004, two days later Die Welt also devoted itself to the case, which has since become known as the New Kosovo Affair. Not only did the Federal Intelligence Service, BND, the German Foreign Intelligence Service, play a role in this affair, 
but also its informant in Kosovo, the Islamist Samedin Hisari, alias Haja, a somewhat strange nickname for an Islamist, by the way. This is because Enver Haja, as the leader of Albania, was the hero of those Stalinist organizations in Kosovo that managed to mobilize a few unemployed people and students for small, popular uprisings, in the early 1980s, in the 1990s, these organizations then formed key factions of the KLA, the so-called Kosovo Liberation Army, which brought the police and military apparatus in Kosovo under its control after the NATO intervention it provoked in 1999. In contrast to Enver Haja, however, who died of heart failure in 1985, Samedin Hisari alias Haja is still an important KLA leader today, for whom there seems to be no difference between the Albanian and Islamist liberation struggle. And the Germans are also rather reluctant to differentiate, even when he was carrying out attacks against Yugoslav and Serbian police and military units, Serbian citizens or Albanian collaborators, in his function as KLA commander, while NATO, above all the USA and Germany, provided the air force for him and his ground troops. He was considered an ally by the Germans and remained so even when he openly revealed himself to be an Islamist. At the end of February 2004, the Genic Center, German National Intelligence Cell, run by the BND in Kosovo intercepted a telephone conversation with Hisari about preparations for a pogrom against the Serbian minority, which actually took place three weeks later, on March 17 and 18, 2004. During these two days, 19 people were killed, 1,000 injured and 4,000 displaced, and 27 Serbian Orthodox churches and monasteries were burned down. A Serbian citizen was also killed in Prizren, the geographical center of the violent excesses, where the headquarters of the K4 units and the Genic Center are located. The BND informant Samedin Hisari was one of the ringleaders of the March pogroms in Kosovo. If the wiretapped phone call is too thin a piece of evidence for this accusation, the BND has a number of other incriminating documents at the ready, as reported by D. Velt and the Berliner Morgenpost on November 20, documents that not only prove Hisari's complicity beyond doubt, as the two newspapers, which claim to be in possession of the relevant documents, write in unison, but also other ringleaders in addition to him, e.g. of the attack on the Kosovo police station. They also name other ringleaders, for example of the attack on the Archangel Michael Monastery in Prizren, and reveal that the BND had been informed of the Islamists' plans long before the actual pogrom. The BND therefore knew who the attackers were and what they were planning and should have taken the intercepted telephone conversation seriously and used it as an opportunity to take countermeasures, according to the accusation. However, both the Genic Center and the Bundeswehr leadership in Prizren, who had been informed by the BND, firmly rejected this accusation and still claim today that the pogroms were spontaneous protests by the Albanian population, who merely wanted to express their displeasure, similar to the East Germans who vote the NPD into parliament. Of course, it is not contradictory for a people to express their discontent spontaneously in exactly the same way as it was planned by their leaders over a long period of time, rather, this is how the ideal typical pogrom takes place. Something similar, i.e. just such a congruence between the will of the instigators and the willingness of the followers to act, was experienced in Pristina on November 22, 2004, when 10,000 Albanians demonstrated against the arrest of three KLA veterans who were accused of, among other things, the murder of 35 Serbs and collaborators. During the fighting in February-March and May-June 1998, which is why they were charged as war criminals. The aim of the KLA's terrorist actions at the time was to provoke the Serbian police and the Yugoslav army into counterattacks and thereby motivate the so-called international community to save the alleged Albanian victims from the alleged Serbian terror. These actions followed the same perfidious reinterpretation of terror into anti-terror actions and vice versa as is used today, for example, in German or Palestinian propaganda, in which Palestinian terror is presented as an act of desperation and an Israeli counterattack as a provocation, origin and justification of future terror. It is not equidistance, as Dopfner said, but the reversal of the real situation that characterizes such ideology. The striking characteristic similarities between the propaganda of the Albanian and Islamist liberation struggle are also an indication of their ideological affinity. Sharif Krasnici, leader of a veteran organization of the KLA, also wanted to demonstrate this kind of spiritual affinity and militant comradeship with his speech at the protest rally in Pristina, when he screeched the threat into the microphone, if this criminal trial, against the three war criminals, continues. 
We will find other ways to prevent the honor and blood of our martyrs from being trampled on the honor and blood of our martyrs. The impression that the Albanian liberation fighters are companions of the Islamists lies in the form of this liberation struggle itself and is not a construct of its critics. It is not a product of delusion that Albanian fascism in Kosovo and Macedonia, Catholicism in Croatia and Islamism in Bosnia form a front with Palestinian, Lebanese, Syrian, Arab, Persian, African, European, Caucasian, Central Asian and Asian Islamism. Osama bin Laden himself speaks compulsively and incessantly of this unholy alliance, which he repeatedly invokes in his letters, videos and terror messages, such as in his 2002 letter to America, you have attacked us in Somalia, you have supported the Russian atrocities against us in Chechnya, the Indian oppression against us in Kashmir and the Jewish aggression against us in Lebanon. We also advise you to stop supporting Israel and to stop supporting the Indians in Kashmir, the Russians against the Chechens and also to stop supporting the Manila government against the Muslims in the southern Philippines. And the list of theaters of war goes on, Algeria, Afghanistan and Iraq are also listed, but all these countries, Bin Laden leaves no doubt, are only examples, focal points, because actually, as he clearly states, he wants a world war. Kosovo or Bosnia are not included in his list, however, because, in Bosnia and Kosovo, the USA has not yet waged an open war against Islamism. However, if you look at the wars in these countries from the perspective of the opponents of Islamism, they must be included in the fight against Islamic terror. For what are flashpoints for one, Osama bin Laden, are foci for others that need to be extinguished. The Federation of American Scientists therefore characterizes the Al-Qaeda terrorist network as follows, Al-Qaeda is multinational, with members from numerous countries and with a worldwide presence. Key leaders in the organization are also key leaders in other terrorist organizations, including those designated by the State Department as foreign terrorist organizations, such as the Egyptian Al-Ghamat al-Islamiyya and the Egyptian Jihad. Al-Qaeda seeks a global radicalization of existing Islamic groups and the creation of radical Islamic groups where none yet exist. Al-Qaeda supports Muslim fighters in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Chechnya, Tajikistan, Somalia, Yemen and Kosovo. Al-Qaeda also trains members of terrorist organizations from countries as diverse as the Philippines, Algeria and Eritrea. Al-Qaeda's goal is to unite all Muslims and create a government that follows the law of the caliph, Al-Qaeda's goal is therefore to overthrow almost all Muslim governments that are considered corrupt in order to eliminate Western influence in those countries and eventually abolish state borders. Bosnia and Kosovo, as mentioned, have not yet been a theater of the war on terror that the US has been waging since September 11, 2001. However, they only became a potential opponent in this war through the policy of the former American president, Democrat Bill Clinton, who in April 1994 promised the Muslim army, in Bosnia, which was facing total defeat, that he would rush to its aid, equip and train it and ultimately help it to defeat the Bosnian Serbs by means of military intervention. Five years later, the Clinton administration repeated the same mistake in Kosovo. Clinton's predecessor, the conservative George Bush Sr., on the other hand, had imposed an arms embargo on Bosnia, in the face of bitter criticism from Germany, which he had courted as a partner in leadership in 1990. However, Clinton sublated the embargo and at the same time gave Iran the green light to supply weapons to the holy warriors in Bosnia. From then on, the weapons reached the battlefield via the Croatian Adriatic ports, and with them an army of Mujahedin. The American ambassadors in Croatia and Germany, Galbraith and Redman, were forced to admit during questioning before Congress on May 30, 1996, that they had known about the secret diplomacy that had made this Iranian arms pipeline to Bosnia possible in the first place, and had even arranged it themselves. The two ambassadors also confirmed that the Clinton administration, when it decided to intervene in the fighting in Bosnia, had deliberately opted for a life-saving operation for the Islamist regime in Sarajevo. Question. My understanding is that this decision was made in April 1994 in the context that everyone in our government believed, you believed, that the Bosnian government was in desperate circumstances, that it would not survive very long unless something was done immediately. Is that right? Answer from Galbraith, that's exactly right. Answer from Redman, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Referring to the results of the first NATO intervention in Bosnia in 1995, 
the Republican Policy Committee, RPC, attempted in August 1998 to prevent the second intervention in Kosovo, which had been planned by the American government since that time. In an analysis published on August 12, 1998, the RPC quoted Colonel Harry G. Summers, who wrote in the Washington Times on the same day, one of the most disturbing aspects of the current crisis is that it may have been triggered by our own inept foreign policy in Bosnia and Kosovo. There we find ourselves advocating, against all reason, for Muslim factions that receive support from the very same Islamic fundamentalist terrorist groups that are our mortal enemies elsewhere. The RPC had already outlined the extent to which the Clinton administration had promoted Islamism through its intervention in Bosnia in January 1997. This promotion was not just about the Iran pipeline, through which the supply of weapons and mujahedin for the Muslim army flowed, but about the very survival of Elijah Izetbegovic's Islamist regime, the conditions of its existence and the spread of Islamism in Bosnia. The RPC analysis shows that the policies of Bill Clinton's administration not only decided the course of the war, but also laid the foundations for a permanent presence of Islamist terrorist cells, parties, agitators, charities, etc. In short, the RPC said, the Clinton administration's policy of facilitating the supply of arms to Bosnian Muslims made it the de facto partner of an international network of governments and organizations pursuing its own ends in Bosnia. The Promotion of Islamic Revolution in Europe This network includes not only Iran, but also Brunei, Malaysia, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, a key ally of Iran, and Turkey, along with front organizations ostensibly engaged in humanitarian and cultural activities. As an example of such frontline or charitable organizations the RPC cited the Third World Relief Agency, which played a key role in arms transfers to Bosnia while coordinating links to the leaders of international terrorist networks, such as Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman, the mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center attack, to Ayman al-Zawahiri. As an example of such frontline or charitable organizations, who coordinated the Islamist terror operations in Bosnia-Herzegovina from a special headquarters in Sofia, Bulgaria, as well as Osama bin Laden, who was mainly in Afghanistan at the time, where the Mujahideen were taught the skills of war and terror in Al-Qaeda camps before being sent to Bosnia. Later, the Mujahideen set up their own training camps in Bosnia, mostly controlled by the so-called Iranian Revolutionary Guards. James Jatras, who had worked for the RPC from 1985 to 2000 and had been involved in the production of the aforementioned analyses, appeared as a witness in the trial against Slobodan Milosevic in The Hague on September 9, 2004, where he pointed out that the American Commission investigating the attacks of September 11, 2001 had found that the foundations for the Al-Qaeda terrorist network were laid in Bosnia in the 1990s. The Mujahedin were fully integrated into the Bosnian army and at the same time provided independent brigades for special, i.e. terrorist operations. At least 15 such, Muslim liberation brigades, were formed during and after the war. One of these, special units, was called the Hanzer Division, modeled on the Muslim SS divisions created by the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Muhammad Amin al-Husseini, during the Second World War with the help of the German occupying forces in Bosnia and Kosovo. A few observers noticed as early as the end of 1993 that only some members of the Bosnian Hanzer Division spoke Serbo-Croatian, they were Albanian mercenaries from Kosovo, the future theater of war. Thus, in Bosnia, what belonged together grew together. In 1998, the Albanian liberation struggle in Kosovo was confronted with a similarly threatening situation as the Bosnian one four years earlier, the defeat of the KLA was imminent. In the summer of 1998, however, NATO was not yet discussing an attack against Yugoslavia-slash-Serbia demanded by Germany, the bombing of Belgrade or similar, in order to prevent a humanitarian catastrophe, as it was called at the time. In May of this year, internal NATO discussions were based on the proposal to secure Kosovo's borders, in particular the southern border with Albania, in order to cut off the KLA's supply of weapons, its lifeline. Without this supply from Albania, the KLA would no longer have been able to continue fighting in the first phase of the Kosovo War, which initially ended with the complete defeat of the KLA in September 1998, could have been over weeks or months earlier. But an intervention on the side of Yugoslavia-slash-Serbia against the KLA was again, as in 1994, out of the question for Clinton. Nor would it have been possible with his most important partner, in Europe, Germany. When General Wesley Clark, Commander-in-Chief of NATO forces in Europe, 
confirmed in public that concrete considerations were being made in NATO to seal off the border between Albania and Kosovo, which would require at least 20,000 soldiers, the then German Minister of Defense, Volker Rua, not only reacted angrily to the fact that the American had gone public with internals from NATO bodies, but objected vigorously, the real problem in Kosovo is the dictatorship, the police state and the lack of autonomy for the Kosovo Albanians. The real problem is not the border between Albania and Kosovo. Wherever an independence fighter asserts his willingness to resolve the conflict without violence, the threat that he can do otherwise is already at hand. A year ago, Buja Bukoshi, then in Bonn, currently acting Prime Minister of the self-proclaimed Republic of Kosovo in Geneva, assured anyone who did not want to know that his people would prefer a war with the Yugoslav army to continuing to live as citizens of the Serbian Republic. It would be easy to get the weapons and his people would become more impatient day by day and were now ready to fight and die for the independence of their country. The self-assurance with which this declaration of war was made, which at first glance seems astonishing, was explained to the Financial Times last January by a senior NATO official, in spring 1997, the weapons stolen from the barracks during the pyramid uprising in southern Albania were smuggled northwards across the border into Kosovo via mafia channels, so when the Prime Minister called for a people's war in sunny Bonn, the weapons of war were already being distributed among the people in Kosovo. At the same time, the clan bosses who controlled the smuggling of weapons organized a campaign against Ibrahim Rugova, the president of the Kosovo Albanians, who until then had been unrivaled but had become suspect due to occasional negotiations with the Serbian government. The politician Adem Demesai was presented as his opponent. The Kosovo Albanian Liberation Army, which was linked to the extended family gangs, took part in the campaign with terrorist attacks against the Serbian police, citizens, and collaborators. First in Munich and then in New York, non-governmental think tanks that act as political advisors to their respective governments and act in close consultation with them, the Bertelsmann Science Foundation and the Carnegie Corporation, initiated a dialogue between Kosovo Albanians and Serbs in the spring of 1997. With these semi-official talks, the independence fighters were also able to achieve their first successes on the diplomatic stage. The Serbian government, which turned down an invitation to the meetings because it considered the independence of Kosovo to be an attempt to destabilize the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia rather than a topic for discussion, now also found itself on the defensive internationally. The Kosovo Albanians also found themselves in the favorable position of having the choice between the two most powerful competitors in the Balkans the USA, the leading military power in the world, and Germany, the most influential people's power in Europe, had turned the spotlight, Klaus Kinkel, on the small Serbian province. But perhaps the independence fighters had gambled too high. Last December, the UCK, the Kosovo Albanian Liberation Army, claimed responsibility for attacks in neighboring Macedonia for the first time, deliberately or out of stupidity provoking the U.S. soldiers who have been stationed there on behalf of the U.N. since 1992. The central motive of U.S. diplomacy in Kosovo is to prevent an uncontrollable expansion of the Kosovo conflict to the neighboring states of Macedonia, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece and Turkey, with the certain consequence of the failure of the Yugoslavian post-war order and the possible consequence that the southern flank of NATO would break up and NATO itself would be plunged into a crisis, National Defense University. On the other hand, the option of destabilizing the entire region through massive terror is the UCK's decisive bargaining chip. Biased in the language of war, Bukoshi and Demesai assessed the negotiations mediated by the USA between the Kosovo Albanians and the Serbian government after the initially unsuccessful dismantling of the UCK by the Serbian police in the spring as a capitulation. Vitan Saroy, editor-in-chief of the most widely read newspaper in Kosovo, Kohaditor, who had himself taken part in the May talks, dismissed them as a photo opportunity. Another member of the delegation from Kosovo, the former CP leader of the province, Mahmoud Bakali, demonstrated his ability to negotiate with the statement, 1998 will show whether we can achieve independence peacefully or whether developments will take the other path. The president of Albania, a friend of independence with subsequent subjugation by a greater Albanian imperial government, described the start of the dialogue as a national disgrace. The UCK responded to the threat of a compromise solution with a regular small-scale war, the now daily murder of Serbian policemen and attacks on the Serbian minority in Kosovo. 
Independence was no longer a topic of discussion in these now official talks. This was guaranteed by American patronage, as the U.S. State Department had already stated unequivocally beforehand and, through its decisive influence in the Balkan Contact Group, had disseminated the scope for negotiation as follows. We do not support independence or the maintenance of the status quo as the final outcome of negotiations between the Belgrade authorities and the Kosovo Albanian leadership on the status of Kosovo. Without prejudice to this outcome, we will base the principles for a solution to the Kosovo problem on the territorial integrity of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and the OSCE norms, Helsinki principles, and the UN Charter. Despondent, Kolha Ditor turned directly to the German foreign minister, why doesn't a region that is 90% inhabited by Albanians also have a right to self-determination under international law? Kinkel's answer unexpectedly reveals the foreign policy displeasure of an aspiring world power whose power is not sufficient to rule the outside world on its own authority, of course there is a right to self-determination. But, the demand for Kosovo's independence or border changes has no international support. In an interview with Dutch Landfunk Radio, Kinkel was confronted with the same question. This time he answered a little more briskly, adding a time limit to his reluctance to implement the right to secession, which he supports but which is not supported by the Allies, of course there is a certain right to self-determination. But, tending towards change within existing borders now would require a willingness on the part of those involved. And that does not exist. In this respect, it makes no sense to cling to an expectation that has no chance of being realized at the moment. At the end of May, the defense ministers of the USA, Macedonia, Albania, Bulgaria, Greece, Turkey, Italy, Romania and Slovenia agreed to form a multinational task force for deployment in the Balkans. The Albanian president immediately called for the force to be deployed against Serbia. However, this is not the intention of the US government, which has repeatedly informed the Kosovo Albanians that it is prepared to support them in negotiating a compromise solution, but that it is in no way considering intervening on their side in a war of secession against Yugoslavia. In this context, however, U.S. mediator Richard Holbrook pointed out that a lot of weapons were still being brought into Kosovo via Albania, but that the Albanian government and donors abroad were unfortunately trying to cover up this fact. The Albanian government apparently has no control over the border to Kosovo, which those responsible in Tirana openly admit. The highest-ranking U.S. military official in Europe, General Wesley Clark, who is in command of the NATO forces stationed in Europe, confirmed the increasing reports of a possible deployment of soldiers along the border between Albania and Kosovo in an unofficial conversation with journalists in Washington before the meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Luxembourg scheduled to clarify this issue. This possibility was still being explored within NATO because, despite the worrying extent of arms smuggling into Kosovo, there were enormous logistical problems with implementation, problems not only of a geographical nature, but above all due to the inadequate control of the border region by the Albanian state. Preliminary investigations within NATO had shown that at least 20,000 soldiers would be needed to secure the border. Asked about this at a joint press conference of the U.S. and German defense ministers in Washington, William Cohen did not want to rule out a military operation to stop the smuggling of weapons. Volker Rua disagreed, the real problem in Kosovo is the dictatorship, the police state and the lack of autonomy for the Kosovo Albanians. The real problem is not the border between Albania and Kosovo. There was a similar dispute over the Macedonian border. At the same time as the American statements about a possible military operation to secure the Albanian border, the Russian Ministry of Defense proposed extending the UN mandate for Macedonia, which expires in August, significantly increasing the size of the military presence, including a complete Russian brigade, and entrusting it with border surveillance. The border between Macedonia and Kosovo is the other important route for arms smuggling, and the border region, like northern Albania, is a retreat area for the UCK. According to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, which argues similarly to Rua, implementation of the Russian proposals, which were similar to American considerations for monitoring the Albanian border, would result in the UN units flanking Serbia's policy towards Kosovo, while in the German view they would have to serve to protect Macedonia from Serbia. On May 27, one day before the NATO meeting in Luxembourg, Rua told the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee of the Bundestag that he rejected the deployment of the Bundeswehr in Albania or Macedonia to control the borders with Kosovo. Such symbolic missions were dangerous and would not lead to the desired results. 
the Bundeswehr would not take part in any operations that would have the effect of supporting the Serbian system of oppression against the Kosovo Albanians. Contrary to the information disseminated in the German media that NATO was planning an intervention, die Welt, in Kosovo, the German ministers in Luxembourg were unable to get their way. The declaration of the NATO foreign ministers published on May 28 contained the position of the US government, in part verbatim. The Serbian government and the political leadership of the Kosovo Albanians were called upon to engage in a dialogue without preconditions. NATO would only support a solution to the conflict that preserves the territorial integrity of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. NATO's military measures were aimed at supporting Albania and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia in securing their borders. The U.S. newspaper Herald Tribune had already reported the day before on concrete plans by the U.S. military to establish a headquarters in Macedonia in the immediate vicinity of the border with Kosovo. In addition, a provisional 7,000-strong multinational force is to be deployed to Albania to help those responsible there to control the border. U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine K. Albright justified the necessity of these measures not only with the possibility of the fighting in Kosovo spreading to neighboring states, the border security should above all prevent outside forces from further escalating the conflict. Holbrook had indirectly justified the action of the Serbian police against the UCK along the border with Albania at the end of April by claiming that the aim was to prevent the supply of weapons and terrorists. Whether the US government also approved of the counteroffensive launched by the Serbian police in mid-May can only be assumed. Because even at the beginning of June, after the Serbian police had already forced tens of thousands of Kosovo Albanians to flee their villages to Albania and Montenegro with heavy weapons in a further offensive, a meeting of NATO ambassadors merely confirmed the decisions taken in Luxembourg. While Kinkel called for a swift decision by NATO, the US State Department threatened to reinstate the economic sanctions suspended in May, prematurely, according to most German newspapers. American newspapers quoted unnamed NATO officials as saying that the Serbian June offensive also had a clearly defined objective, the Serbs are using the army to clean up the border region. They need a zone 8 to 10 kilometers wide where there are no more people, everyone there is a potential enemy. The inhabitants there have to leave their villages because otherwise they could support armed smuggling. On June 5, the Washington Post described the atmosphere in the refugee camp set up by the UN in northern Albania, horses and donkeys packed with weapons, trucks carrying men in combat uniforms and sporadic gunfire make Tripoja a veritable military base. Teenagers receive training in shooting and no effort is made to stop the military preparations. This Friday also saw the first firefight between Serbian police and the UCK across the border with Macedonia. Koha Ditor published the UCK's call for the general mobilization of Kosovo Albanians. The political director of the German Foreign Office, Wolfgang Ischinger, who was in Kosovo and Albania on behalf of the minister, concluded his trip with the news that the situation in Kosovo had now fundamentally changed. This fulfilled the prophecy he made in January, when he told Deutsche Welle that Belgrade must give up the illusion of declaring Kosovo an internal affair of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia because the situation was potentially explosive. Rua used the following weekend to repeat his demands for a NATO mission in Kosovo against Mr. Milosevic's business and criticized the hesitant alliance partners. In an interview with the FAZ newspaper, he criticized the behavior of his colleagues, it is hypocritical to publicly demand military action in Kosovo and to prevent the necessary planning from being carried out behind closed doors in NATO bodies. The background to the Germans' reluctance may be illuminated by an analysis penned by the editor-in-chief of the military journal NATO's 16 Nations, published by the Herald Tribune on June 9, a NATO intervention in Kosovo would not, as in Bosnia, end the killing, but would merely appear to support the Albanian independence movement. The Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, consisting of Serbia and Montenegro, is a legitimate state with internationally recognized borders. Kosovo is a province of Serbia, whatever its so-called ethnic composition. Violating the principle of recognizing existing state borders, which has shaped the European post-war order, would be extremely dangerous. A NATO attack in Kosovo would be met by regular Yugoslav troops, a disciplined and well-organized force defending its homeland against external aggression, an open-ended battle. It is a fact that there is no will within NATO to intervene in Kosovo, 
and creating the impression that there are plans to do so is extremely dangerous, because it creates expectations that cannot be fulfilled and leads the Kosovo Liberation Army into actions that will only lead to further bloodshed. Neither the Americans nor the Germans, neither the Kosovo Albanians or the Serbs are interested in anything other than the domination of land and people. Neither the violent defense of nor the violent attack on the status quo is justified. The measure of injustice in both cases would be the violation of the civil law ideal of proportionality of means. But the Kosovo Albanians, who are claiming their rights as a minority, have only been killed since they started killing themselves. In recent years, around 250 Serbs have fallen victim to the UCK, the Serbian police have made up for this in three months. Of course, neither side is justified by the injustice of the other. But the complaint about violence and counterviolence, Kinkel, is a lie by the German foreign ministry, because it seems to leave open the question of who is to be assigned to which side of the equation. The condemnation of abstract violence serves to defend concrete violence, a method of justification that the German state is just as happy to use as the German public. This is where the German intervention differs from the American one. While in Washington and New York, Rugova was also accused of not clearly distancing himself from terrorism, the terrorists were specifically brought to Bonn and Munich. In April, the Bertelsmann Science Foundation invited the well-known leader of the Kosovo Albanians, Demesai, contrasted his willingness to cooperate with Serbian human rights violations and presented this latest propaganda event it had staged as an important step towards preventing a new war in the Balkans. Just a year ago, when the UCK had just procured the weapons from Albania, the foundation had struck a completely different tone. In a volume on nationality problems and minority conflicts published as part of the Strategies for Europe project series, the Kosovo Albanians are granted a right of resistance, in the exercise of which the right to self-determination can also be enforced by force. In contradiction to the American Compromise proposal to grant Kosovo the status of an autonomous republic within the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, the Foundation takes the view that there are cases in which the fundamental priority of autonomy over secession becomes invalid to the extent that the intensity of the foreign rule practiced makes the realization of the goal of self-determination within the framework of autonomy appear hopeless. In any case, according to the prophecy at the time, Kosovo would soon explode with the help of the West's inability to act, which has already been demonstrated clearly enough. The author of these sentences, George Brunner, is director of the Institute for Eastern European Law at the University of Cologne and, together with Stefan Trobst, director of the Center for Minority Affairs, ECMI, financed by the German government, has been in charge of the Kosovo Dialogue Roundtables regularly organized by the Bertelsmann Science Foundation for the past year. Trobst was a member of an OSCE observer mission in Macedonia on behalf of the Bonn Foreign Office in the early 1990s, where he built up a dense network of informal acquaintances, Trobst. The Foundation's Kosovo Working Group is headed by Martin Lutz, Commissioner for Regional Affairs at the Federal Foreign Office. Werner Weidenfeld is a member of the Bertelsmann Stiftung Executive Board and Coordinator of the Strategies for Europe Project. He has also been the German government's coordinator for German-American cooperation since 1987. At the end of May, a report in the Washington Post about Albanian refugees collecting money in the USA for UCK arms purchases provoked strong protests from the American public, the US government was called upon to stop these terrorist activities. A similar report, based on sources from the Federal Intelligence Service, was published by Welt M. Sontag at the beginning of April the UCK is specifically directing its members and sympathizers to seek asylum in Germany, the most numerous Albanian diaspora in Europe. The alleged refugees were said to be tasked with financing arms purchases and recruiting independence fighters within the local mafia networks, which also included Prime Minister Bukoshi, the head of the UCK according to information from the American Secret Services. The German public was not interested in this. It would hardly occur to the uncompromising friends of nations to criticize the supply of weapons to oppressed peoples. Even the UN arms embargo against Croatia and Bosnia at the time was considered by the Germans to be the height of injustice. Neither ministers nor citizens in Germany will be enthusiastic about the military protection of the Albanian and Macedonian borders against arms smuggling into Kosovo. As is well known, Clark's proposal, which would have worked to the disadvantage of the liberation struggle, was not pursued further. 
And even the RPC, which had initially presented this plan as an alternative to Clinton's Yugoslavia policy, rejected it in the end because such a policy would have strengthened Milosevic. The RPC itself was so steeped in anti-Serb propaganda that some of its attacks on the government culminated in the accusation that Clinton's policy indirectly strengthened Milosevic's back, and this idea seemed to instill even greater fear in the critics of Clinton's Yugoslavia policy than the possible Islamization of southeastern Europe. The question of Kosovo's formal status under international law, i.e. the question of whether Kosovo remains a province of Serbia with some form of autonomy or becomes, as the saying goes, an autonomous and independent state, is an immediate question of who rules over the country and its people. This statement is initially banal and requires further definition, Kosovo as an independent or autonomous state means the rule of the KLA and Islamism. The immediate consequence would be the unification of Kosovo with Albania and the secession and incorporation of the so-called Albanian areas of Macedonia. NATO's intervention in March 1999 promoted such a development and at the same time brought it to a halt halfway through. Kosovo is in a state of waiting, in which both the legend of the formerly allegedly non-violent Albanian independence movement and Ibrahim Rugova, who was re-elected to the presidency in October, can still maintain their public image. In the meantime, however, the protectorate of the UN and NATO has handed over the main positions of power to the KLA. These are occupied by war criminals such as the three aforementioned KLA veterans, against whom no formal charges have yet been brought. One of these veterans, Ramus Haradinai, was recently summoned for questioning by the International Tribunal on War Crimes in the former Yugoslavia. His election as Prime Minister is seen there as a maneuver by his supporters, who not only do not want to allow his arrest, but are rather determined, as was heard from the demonstration speaker in Pristina quoted above, to prevent the honor and blood of our martyrs from being trampled on. The FAZ agrees, however, in this case, that Ramus Haradinai would be arrested, violent protests by the Albanian majority in Kosovo are feared. For the Kosovo Albanians have not forgotten that Kosovo Liberation Army, KLA, which was formed in the 1990s, whose fighters succeeded in drawing the world's attention to the Milosevic regime's repressive policies in their homeland through attacks and assaults on representatives of the Serbian state. Ramus Haradinaj is said to have been one of the main perpetrators of the terror carried out by the KLA in 1998 against so-called collaborators and Albanian civilians, whether to force them to join in, to blame the Serbian police for the murder or to plunge Kosovo into a bloodbath in preparation for the expected intervention of the so-called international community. The three dozen dead discovered in 1998 in the vicinity of his headquarters in Glogjan are attributed to Haradinaj, among others. His brother Daud has already been convicted of murdering rival gangs and families at the end of the war in 1999. Among other things, he was responsible for smuggling Mujahedin into Macedonia, where the UCK rehearsed the uprising in spring 2001. He is also said to have been involved in Al-Qaeda attacks. However, there are other, better documented links between the KLA and Al-Qaeda. Hazem Tasi, for whom there were also demonstrations in Pristina, and Ramus Haradinaj were already present in 1995 at a meeting with Osama bin Laden in Albania as guests of the then Albanian president Sali Berisha, an ardent supporter of the Albanian cause. The subject of this conversation was the establishment of Al-Qaeda bases in northern Albania and Kosovo. On the occasion of this meeting, the then head of the Albanian secret police, Bashkim Gazadida, was elected to a group of Al-Qaeda leaders whose task was to coordinate activities in the Balkans. According to Interpol, Al-Qaeda members, such as Muhammad al-Zawahiri, the brother of Ayman al-Zawahiri, commanded elite units of the KLA. In the Hotel Lion in Yurosovac, another center of the pogroms of March 2004 in Kosovo, children were allegedly recruited for suicide operations in the absence of their parents for Islamic relief, one of the Islamist apron or welfare organizations. On December 2, 2004, the European Union took over the UN mandate in Bosnia. Of the 60,000 soldiers, most of them Americans, who invaded Bosnia under the NATO banner at the beginning of 1996, a European force of 7,000 men called Yufa remains. The Mujahedin will remain in the country under their regiment. In the meantime, they have married in to avoid the suspicion of mercenarism, which is followed by the suspicion of terrorism. However, there is not much trust in Yufa, a NATO command of just under 200 men, again mainly Americans, remained in Sarajevo. Its most important tasks are listed as, 
fighting terror and training that the multinational Bosnian army, i.e. a mixed Croatian, Muslim and Serbian army, which is to be the counterweight not only to the Islamist violence lurking in Bosnia, and no less in Kosovo. With the successful conquest of Krajina by the Croatian army in August 1995, the balance of power in the former Yugoslavia has changed decisively. Following its military successes, the Croatian regime is now demanding the right to be recognized as at least an equal power in the former Yugoslavia alongside the weakened Serbia. After four years of war, German foreign policy can thus boast another success, the establishment of a so-called strategic balance vis-a-vis -vis Serbia, which is always seen in the executive floors of FAZ and Welt as well as in Bonn as the rise of Germany in the imperialist hierarchy vis-a-vis -vis England and France. On the other hand, the advocates of intervention must realize that the NATO intervention that has been conjured up for four years does not deliver what the TAS and others promised, namely the establishment of a Bosnian state within the borders of the former Yugoslav Republic. The staging of Bosnia as a global model of a multicultural civil society has played an important role in the mobilization against the Serbian side over the last three years. It was not least the assertion that the Bosnian state, in stark contrast to the other Yugoslav successor states, is not legitimized by a nationalist ideology, but on the contrary is the guarantor of multinational coexistence, which earned the Izet Begovic government the support of almost all European intellectuals. Among them were also the majority of those who had previously criticized the German recognition policy toward Slovenia and Croatia, such as Simon Wiesenthal or the English Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm. In the following it will be shown, that Bosnia has not developed any differently from Croatia and Serbia. Bosnian society in the 1980s and 1990s was characterized by the same political, economic and nationalist conflicts as the other republics of Yugoslavia. It is clear that the Izet Begovic government does not stand for multinational coexistence. The ideology of Bosnianism, or Bosniakism, is only shared by a vanishingly small sector of society and has no more influence on the official policy of the Izet Begovic government than comparable currents in Serbia and Croatia. That Bosnianism does not represent an alternative to Serbian and Croatian nationalism, but is itself an extremely nationalistic ideology. Anyone reading the Taz newspaper, Freemit Duva or Stefan Schwartz would hardly think that Bosnia-Herzegovina was part of Yugoslavia until 1992. For Taz editor Eric Rathfelder, Bosnia represents something like an island of the blessed in the sea of Yugoslavia's nationalist lunatics. While Serbian nationalism is seen as the cause of the wars in Yugoslavia, and the Croats have been regarded as at least semi-fascists since the open outbreak of the Muslim-Croatian conflict at the turn of 1992-93, Bosnia-Herzegovina appears to be a republic that is largely resistant to the nationalist trend. Here, at the interface of Islam, Muslims, Catholicism, Croats, and Orthodox Christianity, Serbs, something had emerged that in our time is only inadequately described by the term multicultural society. The allegedly non-nationalist orientation of the inhabitants of Bosnia is justified by the high number of nationally mixed marriages and a specific Bosnian culture that has persisted from the early Middle Ages to the present day, despite all the fundamental changes, such as Islamization since the 15th century and industrialization after 1945. It is not only the fact of this mixture, which is not perceived as such by most people, that gives rise to the Bosnian spirit of tolerance. It can also be found in history. So it has a tradition. And the fact that this tradition has been severely tested by the war and the crimes does not mean that it has disappeared. The evidence of this culture is too present, even in war, and can be experienced in neighborly help and the common fight against the barbaric aggressor. In Rathfelder's portrayal, Bosnia takes on the characteristics of a Volksgemeinschaft rather than a real society with its political and class conflicts. Now even the Taz editor knows that the rise of nationalism since the 19th century has not bypassed Bosnia. But this nationalism is not a product of the social conflicts within Bosnia-Herzegovina, but threatens the republic from outside, from Croatia and Serbia. This is repeatedly explained by the fact that Karadzic, because he was born in Montenegro, could not be infected by the specific spirit of Bosnian tolerance. From the talks between Tujman and Milosevic in July and November 1991, which were about defining Serbian and Croatian goals and dividing up Bosnia, it is concluded that the Muslim side, because it advocates a unified Bosnia, is pursuing a non-nationalist policy. Thus the statements of Muslim politicians fall pleasantly out of this framework. 
Where the social and economic changes of recent decades are included in the assessment of the conflict, they serve almost exclusively to ascribe certain social characteristics to the individual ethnic groups. The Muslims are seen as the embodiment of an advanced urban civilization. On German television, the inhabitants of Sarajevo are portrayed as if they needed their weekly visit to the theater or concert at least as much to survive as the UN's food rations. The Serbs, but also some of the Croats, on the other hand, are seen as backward country dwellers in terms of civilization who are particularly susceptible to nationalism. For many inhabitants of Sarajevo, Zenica and Tuzla, it is a war of traditionally militant and narrow-minded, Serbian, mountain farmers against the way of life and the wealth of their towns. The propaganda image of the specifically Bosnian spirit of tolerance is essentially based on people like Smail Balik and Mohamed Filipovic. Balik is a specialist in Oriental languages at the Austrian National Library in Vienna and editor of the magazine Islam and the West. Filipovic was formerly a professor at the University of Sarajevo. In 1967, he was expelled from the League of Communists of Yugoslavia, BDKJ, on charges of nationalism. Today, Filipovic is a member of the semi-oppositional, liberal Bosniak organization and Bosnia's ambassador to Switzerland. In the course of the debate on the recognition of Muslims as a nation in Yugoslavia in the 1960s, Filipovic and others demanded that the nationality proportionality between Muslims, Croats and Serbs should be abolished in Bosnia. Instead, Bosnia, like the other republics, should be a republic with one nationality, the so-called Bosniaks. This Bosniak option could not be implemented at the time because the communists feared, not without good reason, that this would have dangerously inflamed the national conflicts in the republic, as very few Croats and Serbs were prepared to accept such a change of nation. In the course of the system change since 1988, this demand became topical again. For the Bosnian Muslims, regaining their status as a genuine nation is unavoidable. The further formation of national consciousness can only be a matter of moving towards Bosniakness. The claim made by the supporters of the Bosnian option that the commitment to the independence of Bosnia-Herzegovina means resistance to the nation-state principle is pure window dressing. The dissolution of Yugoslavia did not take place under the slogan of national self-determination for nothing. It would be difficult for a Bosnian government to escape such a dynamic even if it were not led by a convinced supporter of the Islamization of society like Izet Begovic. During the Second World War, Bosnia was the most important theater of the struggle against the German occupiers and the civil and national war that took place at the same time. In this conflict, the majority of Muslims were by no means to be found among Tito's partisans, as their supporters today try to make the public believe. Only in a few regions, such as the area around Bihać, which was 90% Muslim, was support for the partisan strong. The majority of the secular Muslim leadership cooperated with the Croatian Ustasa regime. It is true that they only participated to a small extent in the limited scope for power that the Germans gave the Ustasa. However, many Muslims took an active part in the war of extermination against the Serbs. In 1943, the SS took advantage of the rivalries between Muslims and Croats. The SS leadership around Himmler, who distrusted the Catholicism of the Ustasa, therefore wanted to establish a base that was more ideologically committed to the Nazis by creating the Muslim SS division in 1943. After the war, Tito himself said that only 2.5% of the members of the People's Liberation Army were Muslims. Later, however, Yugoslav portrayals conveyed a completely different picture under the sign of the general nationality proportion. The same applies to the supposedly traditionally secular orientation that is attributed to the Bosnians today. Klaus Legowy, for example, rejects the suspicion that there could be Islamic fundamentalists among the Bosnian politicians with the argument that they are more developed Europeans whose defense in the face of a common European history and culture is an act of European self-assertion. In fact, however, the Bosnian and Albanian Muslims, together with the Kurds, were among the most socially and religiously conservative groups within the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century. The Bosnians were staunch opponents of the Young Turk Revolution of 1908 because it wanted to abolish special religious rights in favor of a strong state. Secularization is actually a product of Yugoslav communism, which banned the veiling of women in 1946, decades later than in Turkey. 
In view of the hostile attitude that most Muslims adopted towards the communists during the war and in the first post-war years, the vague ideas that prevailed in communist party circles about the future role of Muslims had no chance. The formation of a Muslim nation was out of the question, and not only because of the events of the war. Until the mid-1960s, the aim of the leadership group around Tito had always been to settle the national conflicts by forming a new nation for Yugoslavia as a whole. Unlike in the case of Macedonia, where the BDKJ itself actively promoted the formation of a new nation due to its foreign policy frontline position with Bulgaria, this process was not to be disrupted by the formation of a new Muslim nation. There was also no relevant group within the Muslim population at the time that would have been interested in forming such a nation. The Yugoslav Muslim Organization, JMO, of the interwar period never saw Muslims as an independent nation alongside Croats and Serbs. The most important idea of the nationalists, that rulers and ruled should be united by a common ideology, nationalism, simply did not correspond to the interests of the religious and feudal leaders of the JMO. The JMO was primarily concerned with securing feudal rights from the Ottoman period. However, most of the peasants who were dependent on the Muslim feudal lords were not Muslims. There were no ideological points of contact between the two. However, there was no middle class striving for political and economic influence. The broad mass of Muslim farmers, who in the meantime were hardly in a better economic position than the Serbian and Croatian farmers, were unable to articulate themselves politically. The recognition of the Bosnian Muslims as a separate nation, which took place in several stages in the 1960s, is a specific product of Titoism, in which several strands of development converged. On the one hand, due to the accelerated efforts towards industrialization and the ambitious educational program of the communists, a Muslim intelligentsia and middle class had formed in the mid-1960s, which now competed with Serbs and Croats. At the same time, in Yugoslavia, the national question had re-emerged in the form of the federalization debate in the wake of an economic crisis. From then on, the struggle for political and economic influence revolved around national proportional representation. The demand for a separate nation now being voiced by Muslim politicians and intellectuals must be seen in this context. At the same time, however, it was also a ruling technique used by the headquarters in Belgrade. The power of the Croatian party organization, which was coming under increasing pressure from nationalist currents, and the influence of the Serbian party, in which the supporters of economic liberalization set the tone, were to be restricted by upgrading Bosnia-Herzegovina. At the same time, Yugoslavia's role in the movement of non-aligned states was at stake. Tito wanted to demonstrate to the third world states that the Yugoslav state did not discriminate against its Islamic citizens. While it was possible to limit the escalation of conflicts between the republics by the early 1980s, the struggle for nationality proportional representation led to a deterioration of relations between the nationalities in the republic. The decentralization of Yugoslavia, as laid down in the 1974 constitution, had its counterpart in a centralization within the individual republics. In Bosnia, this led to a struggle over the question of whether the proportional representation of nationalities should be maintained in the republic, in which public offices in the party and state apparatus were divided between Croats, Muslims and Serbs in a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. Among opposition Muslims, but also in the party apparatus, the voices calling for a departure from the multinational administration of the republic grew louder and louder. Instead, Bosnia, where Muslims had been the largest population group for the first time since the early 1970s, was to be transformed into a republic with Muslims as the people of the state. With the emerging crisis of legitimacy of real socialism, Islam gained more and more influence as an alternative ideology. An increase in the number of pilgrimages to Mecca, a constantly growing number of theology students, which soon exceeded the capacity of the Islamic faculty in Sarajevo, and women and girls who veiled themselves again were indicators of this development. Similar processes also occurred among Catholics and Orthodox Christians. However, the Muslim nationalists were encouraged by the global renaissance of Islam. In addition, the Orthodox lacked comparable support from abroad, as most Orthodox states were located in the area of real socialism. In the 1980s, the nationalist-slash-religious competition manifested itself above all in a race for the construction of religious buildings, which took on an intensified form, especially in nationally mixed areas. Every year, 20 new mosques were built in Bosnia, mostly financed by donors from the Arab states. 
In many areas of Bosnia and Kosovo, party functionaries were only able to push through certain projects and regulations with the help of local imams. The growing loss of the party's political and ideological hegemony was not a Bosnian but a general Yugoslav phenomenon. In the case of the Muslims, however, this development was particularly dangerous because the turning away from the state and the party went hand in hand with an unrestricted turn to another authority. In addition to this gradual Islamization, another development was also significant. While an increasing ideological softening took place in Slovenia, Serbia and Croatia, the Bosnian-Herzegovinian party and republic leadership became the actual support of the real socialist center. In the eyes of the economic liberals and nationalists in Slovenia and Serbia, Bosnia was regarded as the Dark Vilayet or the Romania of Yugoslavia. Both the real socialist party leadership and the opposition Muslim movement adhered to the traditional orientation towards the third world in the controversy over Yugoslavia's foreign policy course that erupted in 1986. For the advocates of a market economy system transformation, who organized their supporters under the slogan of, returning to Europe, Bosnia was therefore the ideal enemy. In Bosnia, criticism of Titoist-style real socialism could be combined with the traditional anti-Muslim nationalism in Croatia, Slovenia, and Serbia. The end of the real socialist system in Yugoslavia was therefore initiated in Bosnia. The so-called anti-bureaucratic revolution initiated by Milosevic led to the uncovering of the Agricomark scandal. The marketing company for agricultural products set up by Fikret Abdik in Velika Kladusa, Bosnia, had been in the red for several years. Covered up by Bosnian party officials and the Yugoslavian Prime Minister Branko Mikulic, who comes from Bosnia, Abdik had covered up the losses for years with the help of uncovered bills of exchange. Hamdija Pozdarak, who was supposed to become president in 1988, had to relinquish this office. The result of the Agricomark scandal was an upsurge in Serbian and Muslim nationalism. For the Bosnian Muslims, Abdik was a national hero. In 1990, nationalist polarization in Bosnia had reached its first peak. The economy was already on the verge of collapse at this time. Unemployment had already climbed to over 22% in 1987 and inflation was 50% higher than the already high national average. There were no more foreign loans and Yugoslavia was heavily indebted to the IMF. The communists therefore effectively ceded power to the national parties even before the elections in December 1990 for fear of a repeat of the Romanian development. Like the other parties, the Muslims had already adopted Milosevic's technique of nationalist mass meetings by this time. Thus, on August 25, 1990, there was a mass demonstration of 200,000 Muslims in the city of Foca, a memorial march for the Muslim dead of the Second World War. This was followed by clashes between Serbs and Muslims in Foca in September, when Serbs demanded the removal of a Muslim bus operator. On September 15, 1990, a large demonstration of over 300,000 Muslims took place in Velika Kladusa at the invitation of Agricomark. A statement by Abdik shows how far the nationalist dynamic had progressed. Abdik said that, as an entrepreneur, he would actually be best suited to the pro-Yugoslav and radical market economy, alliance of reform forces, of the last Yugoslav Prime Minister Anti Markovic. But only Izet Begovic's Muslim Party of Democratic Action, SDA, could give his company a political mass base, which is why he became a member of it. In no other republic have the nationalist parties received as many votes as here. By mid-1991, this Yugoslav republic had practically ceased to exist. Instead, there were already three governments, three dominions and three peoples on its territory. The state bodies were merely backdrops behind which the leaders of the national parties discussed their problems in creating their miniature states. Thus, on December 21, 1990, Serbian, Croatian and Muslim nationalists were able to agree in less than 24 hours to elect Izet Begovic as president without any major problems. The fact that Izet Begovic only appeared twice on Croatian or Serbian territory during the election campaign, once at a meeting of the Muslim SDA in Banja Luka and once in the Croatian Listica, where he called on the Croats to believe only him and Tuđman. The increased identification of many Muslims with their nation is certainly also a consequence of the war. However, this also applies to many Serbs and Croats. However, this does not apply to the political leadership around Izet Begovic. Contrary to the propaganda image of the German media, he never stood up for a secular state. 
After the war, Izet Begovic was sentenced by a Yugoslav court for membership of a pro-Nazi Muslim organization. In 1970, he published an Islamic Declaration, for which he was sentenced to 11 years in prison in 1983. In it, he railed against feminism as an expression of a depraved class of the female sex, the Jews, the Kemalist reforms in Turkey and propagated an Islamic state. The first and certainly most important conclusion is the incompatibility of Islam with non-Islamic systems. There is neither peace nor coexistence between the Islamic faith and non-Islamic social and political structures. He writes to the followers of civil society, there is no secular principle in Islam and the state must be an expression of the religion and underpin its moral concept. The benevolent editor of a German edition of the Declaration, Peter Gerlinghoff, writes, the Islamic Declaration differs from these currents, meaning the former neo-Marxist praxis group, in that it no longer locates the rebirth of the Bosnian Muslim ethnic group in the Yugoslav or European context from the outset, but places it within the framework of a renewal movement of the Islamic world. The author sympathizes in particular with Pakistan, the only state that even then described itself as Islamic. And further. At the same time, however, the author, has named a fundamental descent to social pluralism with his categorical rejection of the secular principle. This aspect is exacerbated by the remark that Islam cannot be practiced as a private religion, but requires the existence of a Muslim milieu, basically even a Muslim society, i.e. acceptance by the majority. In order to achieve this, the Islamic Declaration states, we must first be preachers in order to become soldiers. Even such militant statements do not dissuade Gerlinghoff from his sympathy for the Muslim side. In this respect, the motto of the Declaration Islamization of the Muslims, writes the German editor, could be understood as the renewal of an old claim to power, which took on threatening traits through the explicit legitimization of violent forms of moral cleansing of the people. In 1970, Izet Begovic made no secret of the fact that he was prepared to sacrifice parts of his own nation for his Islamic project a people that is asleep can only be woken up by blows. Those who wish our community well must not spare it toil, danger and defeat. Izet Begovic maintains good relations with Turkey. However, his closest friends there are not the Kemalist ruling parties, but Nekmetin Erbakan and the Islamists. Power in the areas controlled by the Bosnian troops is shared by several family clans from the SDA. In contrast, the Bosniak-oriented opposition has no influence. According to the Taz newspaper, the majority of the population are supporters of this option. However, they only have two representatives in the parliament in Sarajevo, Adil Zulfikar Pazic and Mohamed Filipovic. However, both politicians do not live in Bosnia, but in Switzerland, and have also fallen out over the issue of cooperation with the government. At the beginning of this year, Filipovic, as Bosnian ambassador to Switzerland, did exactly what the Taz considers to be the greatest fall from grace in Western diplomacy. In February, he conducted direct negotiations with Milosevic on behalf of the Bosnian government. The Bosnian spirit of tolerance can only be perceived by those who are themselves afflicted by fierce anti-Serbian racism. The Serbian population, especially the rural population, is a primitive population that can also be easily abused, reveals Smail Balik, a supporter of a sovereign unitary state in Bosnia, to the Taz newspaper. The interviewer Thomas Schmid does not want to contradict the racist stereotypes. For example, it's unthinkable that someone would spit on the floor in a Muslim house, as they would in the house of a Serbian farmer. Instead, he prefers to listen to the specifically Bosniak version of nationalism, of course there were collaborators with the Turks among the Muslims, but overall the Bosnians managed to maintain a limited independence in the shadow of Ottoman power. The Serbs, on the other hand, often appeared as servants of the Turks. The supporters of Bosniakism are the most persistent advocates of an undivided Bosnia. They refer to Memd Beg Kapitanovic, among others. He was the first to advocate the theory of a separate Bosnian nation. As a large landowner from Herzegovina, his aim after the Austrian occupation was to convert the feudal rights from the Ottoman period into modern capitalist property. The continuity thesis adopted by Serbian and Croatian nationalism, according to which the Bosnian Muslims were direct descendants of a medieval Bosnian state, had a clear function. Bosnian land ownership was not to appear as a product of Ottoman society, but had its origins in the pre-Islamic Middle Ages. As far as the relationship with Croats and Serbs was concerned, 
He was unambiguous, as far as the Croats and Serbs are concerned, they are branches of the South Slavic chivalrous people, as are we, but we come first. However, these theories had no influence on the broad masses of the Muslim population, because they continued to orient themselves more towards the imams than towards a medieval Bosnia that was more fictitious than real. Emerging as a nationalist fringe current in the upswing of Muslim nationalism since the 1960s, Bosnianism bears all the traits of a nationalist ideology, the theory of a national rebirth, the racist demarcation from other nations, above all the Serbs, but also in part from the Croats. The Balak share the claim to have been freedom fighters against the Ottoman Empire with the Croatian and Serbian nationalists, among others. The Muslims are declared to be the indigenous population of Bosnia and all others are just accidental immigrant minorities. Only one thing is missing, the most important one, a state that also hammers this ideology into its subjects. The politicians of the Muslim ruling party SDA continue to follow a different national ideology, namely Islamic ideology. However, they have been a resounding success with European intellectuals, who confuse the nationalist fantasies of some Bosnian intellectuals with reality. Izet Begovic has no objections to this either. After all, it gives his Islamic project a modern figurehead. The Declaration of Independence proclaimed in February 2008 states that the newly proclaimed state is a democratic, secular, and multi ethnic republic. The new flag, in line with this statement, shows six small white stars on a blue background, following the most beautiful EU aesthetics, which come together harmoniously in a lively arc over Kosovo's golden portrait, they are intended to represent the six most numerous ethnic groups that make up the population of the new republic. However, when the citizens of the new state crowded onto the streets to celebrate the event, hardly any of them were carrying the successful symbol of multi-ethnic unity. Instead, the streets were dominated by the red flag with the double-headed black eagle, the flag of the neighboring state of Albania, which expressed the true feelings of the masses in the capital as well as in the countryside. On this day, the Albanian ethnic group, to which 90% of Kosovo's 2 million inhabitants belong, celebrated among themselves, themselves and above all their triumph, separation from the Republic of Serbia. They had not forgotten to whom they owed this victory because even if their economic and political independence is permanently dependent on the economic and political support of the international community, the creation of the republic would not have been possible without the intervention of NATO, i.e. the USA, on whose military backing the new state continues to rely. Consequently, the American flag fluttered frequently from the windows and cars of those celebrating, and posters depicting Bill Clinton, in whose honor a six-story high portrait had been erected in the middle of Pristina years ago, an honor that only Enver Hodja had received before the war, were also very popular. For their part, however, the USA would have had good reason to ask themselves what, apart from the sympathy of the Kosovo Albanians, they gained from the 1999 war, because there are only two, if any, winners of this war, Germany, which carried out its first unauthorized foreign policy action since the Second World War by breaking up Yugoslavia, and the KLA, from whose ranks the new masters of Kosovo come. The clear losers of the war, however, are Serbia and Russia. Pushing Russia out of southeastern Europe may well be in the interests of the USA, but does this also apply to the advance of Germany, and therefore the EU, into the power vacuum created by the breakup of Yugoslavia? If the rules of the Cold War still applied, in which America and Europe stood together against the totalitarian East, the answer to this question would certainly be yes. However, the former fronts have dissolved and the old alliances no longer apply in the war on terror, although Russia is now acting as Iran's protecting power, the successor state to the USSR no longer embodies the universal counter-principle, but is itself at war against Islamic terrorism here, but is once again at loggerheads with NATO there. And Europe, once allied with the USA, is wavering between East and West, Orient and Occident, especially Berlin, where the wall once stood. What advantage the American interventions in Bosnia and Kosovo brought them is undetermined against this backdrop, the gratitude of the Bosnians and Albanians is not a good criterion by which to judge the success of such geopolitics. By which to judge the success of such geopolitics. Nor are the military victory and the successful secession of Kosovo from Serbia the appropriate yardstick for such an assessment. In order to be able to assess the success of the 1999 intervention, it is much more important to answer the question of whether the rearranged Balkans with its new states will enrich the West in the future, 
i.e. whether the new states that have been proclaimed there will be able to continue to develop in the future. i.e. whether the states proclaimed there actually function as states according to the American model of society, the bourgeois republic, or whether they only pretend to be such on paper, while in reality they are people's democracies according to the ideas of German ideology. The USA is remarkably passive on this issue, although the American president defines the new status of Kosovo as a kind of supervised independence, the American government was one of the first to recognize the independence of this paradoxical entity, and George W. Bush justified this inconsistency of American foreign policy solely with the lame statement that the Yugoslav state had simply collapsed. The same passivity had already led to Bill Clinton only deciding to act in 1999, when the war had already begun, so that in Washington it was only possible to administer what had previously been organized in Berlin, the reorganization of the Balkans not according to the Republican, but according to the People's Democratic Principle. A brief look back at the history of the creation of the Republic of Kosovo, the most recent product of such transatlantic cooperation, may illustrate this. The Republic of Serbia, as it existed before the secession of Kosovo, was home to around 10 million people, including a minority of 2 million Kosovo Albanians. In the province of Kosovo, today's Republic of Kosovo, however, the Albanians make up the majority population, as apart from them only around 150,000 Serbs still live there, the other smaller minorities, Bosnians, Guarani, Roma, Turks, Ashkali, Egyptians, together make up just under 5% of the population today, of the previously 130,000 Roma. 100,000 were expelled in 1998 and 1999, a tiny community of barely 50 Jews still exists in Pristina. Those who present themselves in the Declaration of Independence as the democratically elected leaders of Kosovo are none other than the leaders of the former KLA, which once organized the popular uprising of the Kosovo Albanians. This Declaration of Independence was read out in February by Hashim Thesai, the current Prime Minister of Kosovo and leader of the so-called Democratic Party, PDK, the largest party in Parliament, who was the political leader of the KLA during the 1999 war. Already in the early 1990s, he appeared in exile in Switzerland as one of the activists of the People's Movement of Kosovo, LPK, a Stalinist movement of Albanian secessionists inspired by Enver Hoxha and founded after the 1981 student riots, which is considered one of the precursor organizations of the KLA. The KLA recruited its fighters from such left-wing ethnic organizations as well as from a wide variety of rival fascist associations that administered the spiritual legacy of collaboration with National Socialism, as well as from Islamist groups that had already discovered fertile ground in Bosnia for the flourishing of their doctrine of salvation. But how did it come about that these people were put in a position to proclaim a republic? In 1996, without being known by that name at the time, the KLA carried out its first terrorist attacks, which were mainly directed against Serbian security force installations in Kosovo. As a result, the current president of Kosovo, Hashim Thesai, and some of his accomplices were sentenced in absentia to 10 years in prison by the district court in Pristina in 1997 for their involvement in these attacks, which did not diminish the frequency with which the KLA carried out the attacks, on the contrary, this increased. And in spring 1998 the KLA finally turned to guerrilla warfare. However, the counterattacks by the Serbian and Yugoslav armed forces in the fall of 1998 initially led to a defeat for the KLA, forcing it to retreat to northern Albania. Even during this first phase of the popular uprising, numerous war crimes were committed on both sides of the front, with the KLA's conduct of the war in particular allowing conclusions to be drawn about the underlying social and ideological structures. A particularly prominent example of this is provided by the war against the civilian population in the Dukagjan Operation Zone in western Kosovo, an area that stretches along the borders with Montenegro and Albania. The commander of this area, Ramush Haradinaj, was in command of eight brigades and other subordinate units, including the Special Commando, Black Eagles, which became famous for its systematic policy of forcibly expelling Roma and intimidating alleged collaborators. Ramush Haradinaj's career after the 1999 war was similar to that of Hashim Thesai. First, Ramush Haradinaj became the commander of one of the regional police units into which the United Nations integrated the former KLA troops. A year later, he founded a party, the Alliance for the Future of Kosovo, AAK, and became Prime Minister of Kosovo in December 2004. Six months later, 
the International Tribunal for the Prosecution of War Crimes in the former Yugoslavia indicted him and two of his subordinates for ordering the troops under their command to systematically beat, rape, torture and murder for political and racist motives and for personally participating in these acts of violence. In April 2008, however, Ramush Haradinaj was acquitted by the judges of the War Crimes Tribunal due to a lack of evidence. The prosecutors stated on record that they had not succeeded in getting a large number of the summoned witnesses to repeat their statements to the court, as they had been subjected to massive threats. In addition, nine witnesses had already been murdered during the trial, which lasted several years. When Ramush Haradinaj returned to his homeland after his acquittal, he was greeted euphorically by his supporters with the Albanian flag, his subsequent tour of the entire province turned into a political triumphal procession and his acquittal was interpreted by the Kosovo Albanians as a retrospective justification of their popular uprising. But back to 1999, equipped with new and better weapons, the KLA again began attacking Serbian institutions at the beginning of the year. Although the Serbian and Yugoslav armed forces put down this uprising again, the extreme violence used by both sides against the civilian population became the subject of the international media and the UN conference, and in March of this year, NATO, led by the USA, finally intervened in the conflict. As a result of this intervention, the violence between the hostile parties escalated again and hundreds of thousands of Kosovo Albanians fled to neighboring countries, especially Albania and Macedonia. The war lasted almost three months, partly because the USA did not deploy ground troops in order to avoid a direct confrontation with the Yugoslav army. It ended in June with a ceasefire, the withdrawal of all Serbian and Yugoslav forces from Kosovo and the invasion of NATO. The reasons why the KLA turned against the Yugoslav state in the first place seem unclear at first glance, before their uprising, there was no state-sponsored violence or any other kind of cultural, racial or comparable oppression against the Albanian ethnic group in Kosovo. On the contrary, until 1989, Kosovo enjoyed the most extensive autonomy of all Yugoslav republics. However, this autonomy was partially revoked under the presidency of Slovodan Milosevic in the early 1990s, whereupon the Kosovo Albanians proclaimed an independent state for the first time, complete with parliament, government, parallel school, tax and health systems, courts, media, etc., all Albanian dominated. However, this state was nothing more than a shadow state that did not have the power to seriously challenge the sovereignty of the Serb-dominated Republic of Yugoslavia. The president of this entity was Ibrahim Rugova, a popular intellectual who propagated a non-violent struggle for independence, so that there was no reason for the Republic of Serbia and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia to use state force against him. Of course, Rugova's shadow state could not constitute real independence, if that was understood to mean secession. However, the passivity shown by the Serbian Republic and the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia towards this shadow state revealed the weakness of these republics, for a state that capitulates in the face of such an attack on its sovereignty is not a state, or has been one for the longest time. Ibrahim Rugova's independence movement would probably have liked the creeping path to secession, because then he would have led the new state. But the experience gained in the rest of Yugoslavia in the meantime showed the KLA that the Albanians no longer had to resign themselves to a shadowy existence and how they could put an end to it. However, the KLA was also dependent on international support to achieve its goal of secession, although the immediate history of the Kosovo conflict left no room for doubt that the Germans would steadfastly defend the Kosovo Albanians' right to self-determination, it was preferable not to rely on the Bundeswehr as an instrument that could enforce this right possibly even single-handedly against the Yugoslav army. For this reason, the USA had to be interested in the conflict, as its intervention in Bosnia in 1995 proved that it was not out of the question to use it for such a project. Geopolitics vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the assessment of Germany as a partner in leadership, which the US government at the time also supported in its efforts to assert itself as a leading European power, if not the leading European power, formed the strategic background for this possibility. The decisive factor here was the creation of a humanitarian catastrophe. Based on the events in Bosnia, the KLA could count on the fact that the Serbian and Yugoslav armed forces would not be squeamish when it came to defending the province of Kosovo and the Serbs living there. And the KLA did not leave the ethnic cleansing, which had long since become a symbol of horror that aroused world public opinion, to the Serbs alone, nor to chance. 
When exactly the American government made the decision to intervene in a conflict, and what considerations tipped the scales in favor of siding with the KLA and winning the war for them, will be easy for future historians to deduce from the files then available. After the war, Kosovo was occupied by NATO troops and administered by the United Nations. UN Security Council Resolution 1244, which defines the administration of the province until a final settlement is reached, does include the obligation to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Republic of Serbia, and only demands an undefined substantial autonomy or meaningful self-government for Kosovo. In fact, however, the war and the subsequent occupation achieved exactly the opposite, secession. Resolution 1244 subsequently condemned all acts of terrorism and demanded the demilitarization of the KLA-KLA. In fact, however, the opposite happened once again, in order to realize that substantial autonomy or meaningful self-government demanded in the resolution, a police force was needed, for example, and KLA soldiers were recruited for it even during the war. Like Ramush Haradinai and the two co-defendants in The Hague for their war crimes, Almost all previous KLA commanders belonged to the later leadership cadre of the new, ethnically pure Albanian police force, the Kosovo Protection Corps, KPC, which is therefore sometimes referred to as the legalized KLA by more skeptical journalists. For a long time, the KPC was led by Ajim Siku, a Kosovo Albanian by birth, who served as commander of the Croatian army when it invaded Krajina in August 1995 on Franjo Tuđman's orders and drove hundreds of thousands of Serbs from there. In 1999, he was one of the leading commanders of the KLA and a close confidant of Hashim Thesai. After the war, he became the first commander of the KPC and, in 2006, Prime Minister of Kosovo. Now, after the declaration of independence, the KPC is also to be dissolved and replaced by a new, more professional, more democratic and, above all, multi-ethnic police force. Because the international community does not entirely trust the Kosovo Albanians to implement their plans, they are not only to be given a new name, Kosovo Security Force, KSF, but their numbers and equipment are also to be reduced to a seemingly harmless level. It is to command no more than 2,500 police officers and 800 reservists, and they are not to be allowed to have any heavy weapons. The establishment of this new force under the watchful eye of the EU, UN and NATO is also intended to ensure that not only the old extremists will rejoin its ranks. Whether one day a non-Albanian or even a Serb will actually sign up to serve in this multi-ethnic force cannot be ruled out. However, as the CPC has already been installed under the watchful eyes of the EU, UN and NATO, and this was precisely their project, at least in this respect we know what to expect from the new force. After Kosovo's declaration of independence in February, the international community now had two things to clarify, one, how to justify the secession, which allegedly no one had foreseen or even wanted, especially since it contradicts the spirit and word of Resolution 1244, which was supposed to govern the administration of Kosovo since the end of the war, now and indefinitely, two, how the Albanian people's democracy that emerged during the war and post-war period could have been transformed overnight into a democratic, secular and multi-ethnic republic. However, before these rather theoretical considerations, a practical problem arose. Before the 1999 war, the Kosovo-Albanian ethnic group was a so-called ethnic minority within the Republic of Serbia. After the secession, however, they formed the majority in Kosovo, a majority that adheres to the old popular democratic ideology that the ethnic group will be spared the laborious struggle for the minds of the majority with arguments in a dispute of opinion, which is actually a constitutive element of democracy, if it only succeeds in chasing the foreigners off the clod. The consolidated family, clan and tribal structures of the Kosovo Albanians, as they were nurtured and cultivated during the decades of autonomy within the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, provided a suitable basis for such an identity. However, the secession created new ethnic minorities within Kosovo. The most numerous of these is, of all things, the Serbs. The Serbs are now turning the tables on the Kosovo Albanians, whereby they can put forward an additional argument against them, after all, they are not only a minority in the new Republic of Kosovo, but at the same time the largest ethnic group in the Republic of Serbia, which is why they reject secession as simple and equal citizens of this republic, as which they see themselves in full agreement with the democratically elected government in Belgrade.
However, the international community has already enforced the secession by force, against the will of the majority of Serbian citizens, and the Albanian people's democracy is protected by 16,000 heavily armed NATO troops. While secession is therefore de facto irreversible, there is still the possibility of a compromise. As the majority of Kosovo Serbs live in a small area of land exactly between the Albanian-controlled part of the province and the Republic of Serbia, the secession of this area, i.e. its remaining in the Republic of Serbia, would be very easy to accomplish in practice. The state border between Kosovo and Serbia would only have to be moved a few kilometers to the south. This would mean adapting the form to reality, as the Albanian and Serbian parts of Kosovo are already completely disintegrated in fact, i.e. economically and politically. In the remaining part, the Albanians would finally be completely among themselves. Their republic would no longer be secular, but 100% Muslim, not multi-ethnic, but 100% Albanian, but it would finally be a genuine people's democracy. However, although the Serbs in Kosovo are in the same minority position as the Albanians in Serbia before the war in terms of popular democracy, the international community does not want to concede to them what it has helped them to achieve at great expense. This solution would be the simplest, the logic of secession once adopted would not have to be discarded again, and if the preparation of the Albanian secession had claimed thousands of lives, this time no use of force would be necessary, if the international community had to invest billions of euros for war costs, reconstruction and propaganda to finance its ideologically and economically difficult to justify campaign for the right to self-determination for Kosovo's independence, now. Nothing more than a little courage to be consistent would be required. For the new secession, no new state would have to be invented and no new minority problem would have to be solved, and all ethnic groups and religions could happily find their happiness separately from one another. But now the international community suddenly wants to impose multi-ethnicism. While the most obvious demand to grant the Kosovo Serbs the same right as the Kosovo Albanians, the right to secession, is universally condemned as a Serbian provocation actively supported by Russia, the international community is now plagued by a less topical but apparently even more serious problem. International law experts and heads of state fear that the history of the Albanian People's Republic could be seen as a precedent by other ethnic groups. Because secession is lurking virtually everywhere. Spain, for example, refused to recognize the secession of Kosovo, arguing that it did not want to give the Basques the wrong idea. The Czechs, whose state was smashed with this weapon exactly 70 years ago, refuse to recognize it, although they are being pressured to do so by the USA. China does not want to set a bad example for the Tibetans. The Hungarians in Slovakia and Romania already feel encouraged by the example of the Kosovo Albanians, both states refuse to recognize secession, as do Greece and Cyprus. Turkey has recognized it with a wink towards the Cypriot Turks, probably in the confidence that it can deal with the Kurds in its own way. Russia is fighting the secession of the Chechens, but at the same time supports the secession of Abkhazia from Georgia, a NATO ally that broke away from the Soviet Union in the early 1990s, which Stalin once conceived as a multinational empire, the NATO states are of course defending Georgia's sovereignty. It is easy to underestimate the number of ethnic minorities who would rather liberate themselves from an alien sovereign today than tomorrow and who could invoke the Kosovo Albanians in the process. The scenes of potential popular uprisings span the entire globe, from Quebec, Canada, to Transnistria, Moldova, to the Kurds, Turkey, Iraq, and Tamils, Sri Lanka. Two months after the Declaration of Independence, only 35 states had recognized the Albanian People's Republic for this reason, among others, and international law experts around the world are tearing their hair out looking for a way to limit the impact of this precedent. The Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, one of the earliest and most loyal friends of the anti-Yugoslavian People's Warriors of the 1990s, provides an excellent example of the confusion that has prevailed even among the best experts since then. Still drunk on the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Soccer World Cup and reunification, the Germans' year-long party during which they became one people again, the FAZ invented the battle cry, Volkergefängnis, prison of nations, with which it first cheered on the Slovenes, then the Croats, the Bosnians and finally the Kosovo Albanians to war against the multinational Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. At that time, the juridification of international relations was not yet as much a focus of German foreign policy as it was ten years later under Gerhard Schroeder's government, which was one of the biggest supporters of the International Criminal Court. 
Chancellor Helmut Kohl had pushed through the reunification of Germany not through protracted negotiations, but by quickly creating facts, mass mobilization and monetary union. And the then Foreign Minister Hans-Dietrich Genscher was just as impartial in the Balkans. His legal justification for the breakup of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia was the right of peoples to self-determination, because after all, the Slovenes, Croats, Bosnians and Kosovo Albanians could not be denied what had just been granted to the German people. After Croatia broke away from Yugoslavia in June 1991 and declared itself an independent state, and the UN, France and Great Britain warned that recognizing Croatian secession would lead to war, which would soon spread to the other parts of Yugoslavia, Genscher declared that Croatian independence was getting closer with every shot fired. Six months later, he carried out the recognition single-handedly, followed by another six months later, first the declaration of Bosnian independence, and then three years of war. In this respect, Kosovo would not be the first precedent for the FAZ to rack its brains over. But now that the worst is over and no further war is necessary to bring the Balkans into the EU, there is no need to rant and rave and we can allow ourselves the leisure to interpret the facts that have been created in the meantime as positively as possible. The FAZ, whose editors and journalists did not seem to be able to do this with their own brainpower, contracted two professors who at least did their best, and contradicted each other on almost all points. The first to speak was Professor Dr. George Nolte, who not only holds the Chair of Public Law, International Law and European Law at Munich's Ludwig Maximilian University, but also sits on the United Nations International Law Commission, with the following argument. The recognition of a political community as a state is fundamentally permissible under general international law if this community exercises effective power over a specific territory independently of the previous state authority. Insofar as the provisional Kosovar institutions exercise authority, they do so independently of the Serbian state authority. This authority is also effective enough compared to that of some other states to be recognized as state authority. It is therefore irrelevant whether Kosovo has a genuine right to secession in addition to this actual possibility of secession. According to general international law, genuine right is therefore not important at all. The professor begins his argument as a genuine materialist. But is the power to rule exercised by the Kosovan institutions really effective enough? This is doubtful, as these institutions would not exist at all if they had not been created by NATO, the UN and the EU, and they would cease to exist if these were to leave. The Albanian People's Republic is also completely dependent politically, economically and militarily, no longer on the Republic of Serbia, but on the international community. The latter is the sovereign in every respect, but the Albanian people's democracy and its institutions are nothing more than a protectorate, a biotope that would instantly become completely overgrown without the constant and costly care of the international community, i.e. ruled by means of pure power. The effective power of rule here is not much different from that in the areas ruled by the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. However, the politically committed academic is not so much concerned with facts. Rather, he is satisfied with the assertion that the Kosovar institutions, as they are, exercise effective power, because he wants to avoid justifying the recognition of the People's Republic under international law with genuine arguments based on international law. There should be no genuine right to secession, because this would supposedly create the precedent that everyone is afraid of, because a precedent of Kosovo for a genuine right to secession could be interpreted dangerously broadly. He doesn't think that a Kosovo precedent that it is sufficient for a political community to exercise effective power over a certain territory independently of the previous state authority could be interpreted just as dangerously broadly. Or is he concerned with something completely different? Towards the end of his discussion, one gets the impression that the advisory council of the Federal Foreign Office only wants to protect the purity of German ideology from being dragged into the mud by everyday politics. Germany would like to be seen internationally as the guardian of the idea of a world order based on the UN Charter. The credibility of this policy must suffer if Germany leaves the ground of the secure interpretation of UN law without need. It is the political responsibility of Western governments to decide whether they want to make a legal interpretation of international law that can be disputed with good reason the basis of their policy. Or is the recognition of the secession with reference to a supposedly effective power of rule, but without real justification under international law, merely intended to prevent German foreign policy, which is committed to ideology, 
from putting itself under pressure, without necessity, under international law to support any war of secession in the future, even if this does not seem to conform politically. For example, in Georgia, as the professor notes, this is where the second expert consulted by the FAZ comes in to show that such an argument is also suitable for proving the exact opposite. Professor Dr. Dietrich Merswick, who teaches constitutional and administrative law at the Albert Ludwigs University in Freiburg, also initially appears as a genuine materialist, Nolte's argumentation approach is correct. But this approach does not fit the situation in Kosovo. For Kosovo has not yet effectively, let alone permanently, established an independent state authority. Kosovo has neither an army capable of self-assertion nor a police force capable of performing the basic function of the state, the establishment and maintenance of public security and internal peace. However, if Kosovo is not, yet, an independent state due to the lack of independent state authority, then it still belongs to Serbia under international law. Recognition therefore violates Serbia's sovereignty and is therefore contrary to international law if there is no right of the Kosovar people to secession. In exact contrast to the previous argument, the People's Republic should now only be recognized if the Kosovo Albanians can demonstrate a genuine right to secession, precisely because they do not exercise effective power. For if one were to argue as Nolte does and base the recognition of Kosovo solely on the factual secession, then the recognition would not become a precedent for the right of secession, but it would become a precedent for the fact that a part of a territory occupied by foreign troops using military force can be separated from the previous state if the government installed there demands it. But isn't that exactly what happened in Kosovo? Yes, Merswick continues, but ultimately the Kosovo Albanians had a genuine right to secession and justifies this as follows, one only had to show that without secession, the existence of the Kosovo Albanians as a people, or at least their autonomy, would not be guaranteed. And, the previous history could speak for this. If it is true what the NATO states argued in 1999 to justify their military intervention, namely that the Kosovo Albanians were being subjected to violence and ethnic cleansing contrary to human rights by the Serbian side and were threatened with genocide, then the basis of trust essential for effective autonomy was probably destroyed at that time. The genocidal violence of that time thus continues to affect the situation today. If it is true, but even if it were true, this would not solve the previously discussed question of whether an argument based on the fact of military force, whether this force is exercised by the state or by a terrorist organization or by foreign troops, is not suitable for constituting a genuine right to secession without simultaneously setting a precedent. For what if the entire scenario, as was the case in Kosovo, had been staged from the outset? Then the recognition of the People's Republic does not become a precedent for the fact that a part of a territory occupied by military force by foreign troops can be separated from the previous state if the government installed their demands it, but for the fact that an ethnic group only has to provoke the sovereign to resist through an armed uprising of a suitable scale in order to then be rescued by military force by foreign troops and be helped to become its own state. According to general international law, one can therefore choose how one wants to justify the recognition of the People's Republic, only with effective sovereignty, or with a genuine right to secession. And indeed, this legal arbitrariness is used extensively in world politics. In Kosovo, Chechnya and Tibet, the West defends the right of peoples to self-determination at the expense of the sovereignty of Serbia, Russia and China, but the sovereignty of Georgia against the secessionist aspirations of the Abkhazians and South Ossetians. In the East, in Russia, people think the other way round and also invoke general international law. However, this merely proves that international law does not exist, and if it does, then only as the law of the strongest, as a justification for global political arbitrariness, as a cover-up for the relations of force between individual states. Quote, Human rights have always had the misfortune of being represented by politically meaningless individuals or associations whose sentimental humanitarian language often differed only slightly from the brochures of animal protection associations. As early as 1951, Hannah Arendt, faced with hundreds of thousands of stateless people whose so-called human rights were not defended by any relevant political authority, recognized that rights that were not guaranteed as civil rights by a political, i.e. national, community were not worth the paper they were written on. This was to change with the end of the Cold War, the UN was to embody a new moral authority emerging on the scene, the global community. In Europe in particular, the illusion that the UN, as a quasi-parliamentary representative of the global community, 
could establish and enforce binding rules for all, found an enthusiastic following. The idea of an international system without a sovereign was particularly popular in reunified Germany. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the remaining world power, the USA, was to be incorporated into the UN family of nations and its legal framework, thus neutralizing its supremacy. The establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, ICTY, on the basis of UN Security Council Resolution 827 was seen as the first bang for the buck of a salutary juridification of the international system. Initially, it only dealt with the wars in Bosnia and Croatia, 1992 to 1995, but in 1999 its jurisdiction was extended to the military conflicts between Serbian security forces and KLA fighters in Kosovo. In UN documents, Mirko Claren is cited as the source of ideas for the tribunal. In May 1991, even before the outbreak of war, the Yugoslav journalist had already called on Western states to take political and legal action against the agitators and warmongers of the Yugoslav republics with a campaign entitled Nuremberg Now, in order to prevent the war that was looming. His call went unheard in the depths of the world community. It was not until May 1993, when the war was already in full swing, that such an international court was opened for the first time since the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials. The main aim of the Yugoslavia tribunal was to end the impunity of political and military leaders in such conflicts. 161 indictments were brought against heads of state, ministers, generals, military and police officers of the Yugoslavian constituent republics. The worst crimes committed on European soil since the Second World War, as the common phrase goes, should not go unpunished. The former membership of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the United Nations was used to justify the responsibility of the UN Security Council to ensure peace and security in the region even after the possible demise of the state. The fact that the UN contributed in any way to peace and security in the Yugoslav wars of disintegration appears to be a euphemism, not only in view of the fact that the UN safe area of Srebrenica became the scene of the largest mass murder of this war. The crimes were not stopped, but in order to maintain the illusion of a responsible international community, it was not possible to stop at moral judgment, the ex-Yugoslav criminals had to justify their actions to the world. In the 24 years of its existence, the ICTY has repeatedly caused a stir with scandalous acquittals, which have often been criticized as wrong decisions, and not only by lawyers from the former Yugoslavia. The Bosniak commander in Srebrenica, Nazar Oric, under whose supervision Serbian prisoners of war were tortured and murdered, was initially sentenced to only two years in prison. The reason given was that the then 25-year-old had fought for survival in the face of the Serbian territorial gains in eastern Bosnia, in the prison camp he was in charge of, against unarmed Serbian prisoners of war. He was acquitted on appeal in 2010. The Croatian general Anti Gotovina, commander-in-chief of Operation Oluja in the summer of 1995, in which 20,000 Serbs were driven out of the eastern Croatian territories and hundreds of civilians were murdered, was also acquitted together with two co-defendants in a second instance in The Hague. The current Kosovan head of government Ramush Haradinaj was also not convicted in 2008. The former regional commander of the KLA was originally charged with the crimes of the Kosovar freedom fighters under his command, torture, murders, rapes, expulsions, etc., and was not convicted. In 2010, the proceedings against Haradinaj were reopened by the appeal chamber of the tribunal. The judges justified this step with the distortion of the trial through the considerable intimidation of witnesses, who had withdrawn their statements in many cases as a result. The fact that hardly any measures were taken in the first trial before the ICTY amounted to a miscarriage of justice that needed to be rectified. But even in the second round, not enough witnesses could be persuaded to testify against the current prime minister. His influence in Kosovo's clan structures is too strong and therefore the danger for potential witnesses is too great. In 2016, Vojislav Seselj was acquitted, accused of having played a leading role in the recruitment, military and ideological training of Serbian paramilitary units and thus of having participated in war crimes and crimes against humanity. Seselj benefited from the fact that Frederick Harhoff, one of the three judges responsible for his case, was removed from office in 2013 due to bias and replaced. Harhoff had previously spread his anti-Semitic conspiracy theory against the then-president of the ICTY to colleagues in a private letter Theodore Marone, an American lawyer and Holocaust survivor, 
held this office from 2003 to 2005 and then again from 2011 to 2015. From 2011, he initiated a course correction towards less tolerance of incomplete chains of evidence. Danish Judge Harhoff recognized an American-Israeli conspiracy in this enforcement of the legal principle of benefit of the doubt for the accused. This strict interpretation of the law at the ICTY, enforced by their agent Maron, was only in the interest of protecting their own soldiers and commanders from legal prosecution by the UN courts. Fortunately, neither US nor Israeli soldiers can be prosecuted by The Hague anyway, but what do anti-Semites care about such facts? Before this change initiated by Maron, gaps in evidence had been ignored, especially in judgments based on the theory that there had been a criminal strategy on the Serbian side in the Yugoslav wars of disintegration aimed at expelling all other ethnic groups from the eastern regions of Croatia and Bosnia and establishing the Greater Serbia. In order to be able to legally prosecute not only the paramilitary forces actually involved in the crimes, but also those allegedly politically responsible, the joint criminal enterprise was specially constructed by the Yugoslavia Tribunal as a form of perpetration. According to this doctrine, each member of such an enterprise is responsible for the acts committed by the group. The decisive factor is not direct participation in crimes, but membership of a group and thus the supposed recognition of a common criminal objective. The charges against Slobodan Milosevic, Radovan Karadzic and Seselj, among others, were based on this accusation. This definition of the wars of disintegration as greater Serbian aggression, which amounts to the imputation of collective guilt, led to the criminalization of every Serbian military action. If the only goal of this war was an ethnically pure greater Serbia, every politician in office at the time, every soldier, regardless of whether they were immediately involved in war crimes or crimes against humanity, is a criminal. In the judgment against Siegelj, two of the three responsible judges now contradicted this theory on the grounds that it could not be sufficiently proven. In particular, the thesis that all Serbian actors in this war had pursued a common criminal goal was refuted in the trial. They made harsh accusations against the prosecution led by the Belgian chief prosecutor Serge Bram Mertz, who succeeded Carla Del Ponte in 2008. In his indictment, he had followed a very biased interpretation of the events and had obscured the background, namely the secession of both republics from Yugoslavia, in his interpretation of the establishment of Serbian autonomous regions in Croatia and Bosnia as an expression of greater Serbia policy. Furthermore, the accusation that Seselj had supported the arming of the Serbs in Croatia and Bosnia was not valid, as Bram Mertz had disregarded the fact that Bosniaks and Croats were also arming themselves at the same time. Bram Mertz, who shortly afterwards appealed against the acquittal, criticized that it stands in flagrant contradiction to the way we view the wars in Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Klaus Kress, professor of international criminal law in Cologne, described the decision of the two judges as a frontal attack on the work of the tribunal to date. From the very beginning, the indictments of the first chief prosecutor Carla Del Pontes against Serbs were concerned with interpreting the Yugoslav wars of disintegration as Serbian aggression to establish a greater Serbian empire in order to dispense justice on this basis. Many ICTY judges agreed with this historical distortion in their verdicts on alleged Serbian war criminals. Even the prosecution in the Seselj trial did not want to be dissuaded from this narrative, on which almost all proceedings are based, by trivialities such as a lack of evidence. As commendable as it is that in the verdict on Seselj, two judges contradicted the way we view the wars in Croatia and Bosnia-Herzegovina, it remained a late isolated case. Undeterred by the objections raised, Ratko Mladic's sentence to life imprisonment the following year was again based, among other things, on the theory of the Serbian criminal enterprise as a whole. Seselja's acquittal revealed the fundamental problem of the Yugoslavia tribunal, which, unlike courts in a national context, was concerned with more than proving the guilt or innocence of an accused in accordance with Western criminal law. From the outset, the aim was to uncover the historical truth about mass crimes. Once the historical truth about this war, its background and the motives of its protagonists had been established, it had to be reflected in every single verdict, if you follow Del Ponte, Bram Mertz and company. To this end, the Yugoslavia tribunal ruled according to a law that it had itself created. Questioning the determination of perpetrator victim based on the criminal enterprise theory was tantamount to denying the historical truth. 
The legally guaranteed perspective on the war, the story of the events in Yugoslavia told in the indictments and also by many judgments in The Hague, not only legitimized the actions of local actors, such as the expulsion of an estimated 200,000 Serbs from eastern Croatian Krajina and thousands of Serbs, Roma, and Jews from Kosovo. The NATO bombing of Serbia in 1999, which is still considered by many experts in international law and constitutional law to be in violation of international law, as it was neither covered by a UN mandate nor in accordance with the UN Charter, was also to be cleared of the last moral doubts in The Hague. To do this, the Serbs had to be proven to have committed the worst possible crime, they had planned a repetition of Auschwitz and in some cases carried it out. That was as good as it got. For the Germans, Foreign Minister Fischer's Auschwitz cudgel against the Serbs fulfilled two functions at once. On the one hand, Auschwitz loses its specifics, its horror, the German aspect of it is blurred beyond recognition when the Serbs, and soon the Israelis, are exposed as the new Nazis in the name of the European peoples. On the other hand, the fight against a new Auschwitz must silence the last critical voices, every skeptical question, no more proof is needed when talking about Auschwitz. Anyone who demands proof is suspected of wanting to deny Auschwitz. And because Auschwitz is now in Serbia, anyone who doubts this is also denying Auschwitz. Not only the Germans recognize this, but also the victims of the Serbs are aware of this peculiarity of the Auschwitz card. Jasmine Miskovic, president of the Association of Former Camp Prisoners in Bosnia-Herzegovina, rejoiced when the ICTY spoke of concentration camps for the first time instead of prison camps in its last verdict against a Serb, Ratko Mladic, in November 2017. The court thus took the opportunity to clarify once again, before its dissolution in December, what the Serbian crimes were all about. In The Hague, the Serbs were to be exposed time and again as the incorrigible, recalcitrant aggressors who had to be stopped by any means necessary. The question of war guilt was thus clarified and all means were sanctified, from the bombing of busy marketplaces and refugee convoys to the use of uranium-containing weapons. The Hague Land Warfare Convention and the Geneva Convention are the best-known agreements that codified a minimum level of civilization in warfare under international law in the 20th century, giving the protection of civilians a central role. Accordingly, military operations may only be directed against those objects that contribute to the acts of war. The violation of these provisions of international law formed the basis of the lawsuit filed by the seriously injured and relatives of the ten people killed in the NATO bombing of a bridge in Varvarin, Serbia, on May 30, 1999, all of whom were civilians. The nearest military target, a barracks, is more than 20 kilometers away from Varvarin, Kosovo more than a hundred. The bombed bridge was not used for military purposes, nor would it have been suitable for this purpose in the future due to its low load-bearing capacity. The two attacks were carried out in clear visibility for the pilots, there was no advance warning. Whether the attacks were flown by German soldiers is irrelevant. The Federal Republic of Germany became an accomplice by not exercising its right of veto, which each of the participating states had in such operations. The action brought by the surviving dependents was finally dismissed by the Federal Court of Justice in 2006 on the grounds that, under international law, individuals have no right to compensation from belligerent states. Their only option would be reparations, which could only have been negotiated at state level. In fact, while the Kosovo War was still ongoing, Belgrade had filed a corresponding lawsuit against eight NATO states, Germany, Belgium, Great Britain, Canada, France, Italy, the Netherlands and Portugal, at the International Court of Justice in The Hague. This was dismissed in 2010 on the grounds that the ICJ had no jurisdiction in this case, as the State Union Serbia Montenegro was not a member of the United Nations at the time the lawsuit was filed. This reasoning is astonishing in that the establishment of the ICTY was legitimized by referring to the former UN membership of Yugoslavia, which no longer exists, and the resulting responsibility of the UN. However, when the Serbs now had the audacity to want to hold those responsible for more than 400 civilian victims legally accountable, the United Nations no longer wanted to know anything about this responsibility for the former Yugoslavia. Since the hierarchization of the severity of war and mass crimes has proven to be difficult, international courts have since the 1990s referred to a category that elevates the delusion of the world community to a legal principle, the social alarm. Crimes are weighted relative to the horror they have caused in the international community. 
This practice makes the illusion of the righteousness of the world community, the world conscience, as it were, the yardstick for bringing charges and sentencing. A right state of the world is assumed, which is seen to have been disturbed by certain crimes and which only needs to be restored. In order to stage the ICTY as an expression of this pure world conscience, any suspicion that it was Victor's justice had to be dismissed. The principle of world justice can only be upheld if the proceedings are beyond reproach and do not have the slightest political overtone of Victor's justice. The principle of social alarm, however, exposes the Yugoslavia tribunal as just that, a court of the victors. For whose horror was the decisive factor for the judges in The Hague? That of the Serbs over their dead civilians, the bombing of their civilian infrastructure, the use of uranium-contaminated ammunition, to which the significant increase in cancer cases in the affected regions is attributed? Certainly not. How could their suffering have caused horror in Germany, for example, given that Rudolf Sharping knew that Serbian soldiers had grilled the fetuses of murdered Kosovo-Albanian women? This legal weighting of crimes along the lines of alarmism, which had been generated not least by targeted atrocity reporting against a particular warring party, is not the only aspect that casts doubt on the impartiality of the ICTY and its chief prosecutors. In the indictment against Milagivio, the long-standing chief prosecutor Carla del Ponte relied heavily on evidence from military and intelligence officers of the NATO countries involved in Operation Allied Force in 1999. However, these NATO military personnel were not independent experts, but warring parties who, in order to legitimize the months-long bombardment of Serbia, were dependent on Del Ponte's conviction of Milosevic as the genocide against which they had mobilized their societies. Impartiality is not the only principle of Western jurisprudence that was suspended in The Hague. Whereas in Western democracies, the truth is usually only established during court proceedings, the Yugoslavia Tribunal, and the war crimes tribunals that were to follow it, relied on a certain version of the historical truth even before the hearing of evidence, on the basis of which the persons to be indicted were selected, as the circumstances of the conflict were to be truthfully reflected in the indictment. The presumption of innocence, at least as it is usually understood, cannot be guaranteed if certain historiographical theses are to be proven in advance by legal means. Also, the otherwise customary obligation of the public prosecutor as a representative of a democratic society does not apply in such international courts in favor of a moral accountability, for example of the chief prosecutor of the ICTY to humanity. The chief ideologue of the German world community, Jürgen Habermas, justified this by arguing that the core norms of international criminal jurisdiction have such a high level of legitimacy that the legitimacy of those applying the norms can be safely dispensed with. The search for a legitimate representative of humanity to democratically control international criminal courts must, of course, prove to be futile, although the need for such a supervisory body is obvious in view of the claim of these institutions to sit in judgment not only on individual defendants but even on history and to restore world justice. Unlike the principle of justice, however, the law, at least in the sense of the bourgeois constitutional state, is not concerned with my correct state of the world, but with a fair relationship between the parties involved, who are treated as equals and on whom a judgment is passed by the judge in the name of the legal equality of all citizens. A jurisdiction that sees itself as the driving force of transitional justice and wants to carve the historical image of a warring party in stone, on the other hand, degenerates into a political instrument of arbitrariness. At an international level, the ICTY, as well as the Kosovo missions of the UN and the EU, were accused of complete failure in the legal investigation of the crimes of the KLA with the establishment of the International Kosovo Tribunal in 2017. Now, finally, the persecution, expulsion and murder of Serbs, Roma, Jews and Kosovo Albanians suspected of collaborating with Serbia, long glossed over by the Western media as, acts of revenge, is also to be dealt with. No charges have yet been brought, but it is assumed that the former U.S. prosecutor and current chief prosecutor of the Kosovo Tribunal, David Schwendiman, will not shy away from charges against the political elite. The current Kosovan president, Hashim Thesai, who is regarded by the EU as a pillar of its Balkan policy and guarantor of Serbian Kosovan rapprochement, was already accused by EU Special Investigator Clint Williamson in 2011 of being involved in the murder of Serbs for organ trafficking.
It is to be hoped that Schwendiman's announcement that he has learned lessons from the work of the Yugoslavia Tribunal will be reflected in the coming years in the bringing of charges and, above all, in the urgently needed expansion of witness protection for Kosovars who are prepared to testify against KLA leaders. Regardless of the selectivity of the ICTY's prosecutions, many of the verdicts handed down in The Hague may have been in favor of those who had gone unchallenged by Belgrade, Zagreb and Sarajevo for far too long. But this circumstance, as well as achievements in international criminal law that were initiated by the Yugoslavia Tribunal, e.g. the recognition of rape as a crime of torture and thus as a war crime by the UN in 2008 or the first mention of sexual violence against men at international legal level in the grounds for the verdict against the Bosnian Serb Dusko Tadic, cannot hide the fact that the ICTY, due to its constitution, intention and practice, pursued a biased justice and was thus unable to establish either law or justice. This was not the only reason why the ICTY's aim of encouraging critical reflection within the former Yugoslavian countries or even reconciliation between them through a legal review of the wars was doomed to failure from the outset. The rejection of the tribunal in the ex-Yugoslavian countries, mostly, arises from a nationalistic defensive reflex and self-victimization. Everywhere, Convicted war criminals and mass murderers are celebrated as heroes, streets and student dormitories are named after them. Last November, for example, the Sabor, the Parliament of EU member Croatia, observed a minute silence for the Croatian-Bosnian general Slobodan Praljak, and Croatian communities in numerous German cities also organized memorial services in his honor. Praljak, honored as a patriot by Croatian Prime Minister Plenković, committed suicide in the courtroom in The Hague after being sentenced to 20 years in prison for war crimes against Bosnian Muslims and crimes against humanity. Jürgen Elsasser then accused the tribunal of driving fighters against the Islamization of Europe to their deaths under the title, Shame on These Jurists, and Glory and Honor to the Dead General. With his glorification of the Srebrenica massacre as the last military victory of Christian Europe against the once again advancing Islam, he is now preparing to become a better Serb than even Slobodan Milosevic is supposed to have been. According to witnesses, even Milosevic was shocked when he heard about the events and the extent of the violence in Srebrenica. Perhaps Elzasser is honored that Milosevic published his book Kriegsverbrechen. Die Todlichen Lugen der Bundesregierung und ihr Opfer im Kosovo Konflikt personally before the judges in The Hague went to his head. In any case, today he dreams of finally closing the rifts between the Serbian and Croatian war criminals so that he can soon join them in battle. Mladic and Praljak, Serbs and Croats were enemies in the 1990s. Today they are both victims of the New World Order, which the globalist elites are building together with Islam on the graves of the Christian nations. Wouldn't it be time to come together again in defense of the West? Quote, end. Against revisionist would-be Chetniks, right-wingers and left-wingers on a cuddle course with war criminals on the one hand and a Yugoslavia tribunal as the embodiment of world conscience and the moralizing shysters of the German world community behind it on the other, only Horkheimer's longing can be upheld, longing for the injustice that characterizes the world not to end there. That injustice should not be the last word. This longing belongs to the truly thinking human being. Since the spring of 2008, when the USA, the EU countries and subsequently more and more states recognized the de facto separation of Kosovo from Serbia under international law since the 1999 war, the fragmentation of Yugoslavia into seven sovereign states, including Montenegro, has been completed. Immediately before the proclaimed independence of Croatia and Slovenia on June 25, 1991, the then Yugoslav Foreign Minister Budimir Lanker warned with the force of last desperation, what would happen if Yugoslavia were to break up? The basic hypothesis is that states would emerge that would not only be in constant conflict with each other, each of them would also be ethnically shaken. Each of these states would be incapable of being truly democratic and fit for Europe. Taken together, they would constitute a time bomb in the heart of Europe if they had not already triggered a chain reaction on the continent, where 46 potentially dangerous ethnic conflicts are already smoldering. Quoted in Klaus Peter Zeitler, Deutschland's Rall Bay der Vokerechtlichen Anerkennung der Republik Croatien, Marburg 2000, page 116, Lanker was to prove right on two essential points, ethnic upheavals on the territory of the former Yugoslav republics heralded the end of the federal state and also determined the character of the secessionist acts of fighting and murder. The European apocalypse conjured up by Lanker and, at the same time, 
by quite a few anti-Germans, failed to materialize, as did the feared permanent conflict between the main players at the time, Slovenia, Croatia and Serbia. After 1990, secessions only occurred on the territory of the former Soviet Union, which were largely bloodless on European territory, Baltic states, Ukraine, Belarus, and in some cases led to remarkably stable sovereign states. The other European separation, that of the Slovak Republic from the Czech Republic, was even decidedly unspectacular. Slovenia and Croatia have quickly developed into EU members or republics suitable for European membership, in which Serbian minorities can now live again, and Serbia has refrained from pressuring the separatist Montenegro and, even after the international recognition of Kosovo, is pursuing a policy in which radical nationalism increasingly only plays a role as the noisy accompaniment to a pragmatic approach to the standards set by the EU for membership. Even the FAZ, which for many years catered to the specifically German and Austrian hatred of Serbia and its inhabitants, must now concede, Serbia has at least formally made more progress in its rapprochement with the EU under Prime Minister Kostunica, whose increasingly strident anti-European tirades have made him conspicuous, than under his predecessor Jinjic, who was murdered in 2003. 30.04 08. The recognition of Kosovo as a sovereign state prompted Slovenia's Foreign Minister Rupel to praise our Serbian friends, FAZ, April 16, 08, and after the recall of the Serbian ambassador from Zagreb due to the recognition of Kosovo in April, the Croatian government reaffirmed the good contacts between Serbia and Croatia at all levels. With so much detente, one is reminded of the words of the leading German Serbo-Croatian of the first half of the 20th century and social democratic member of the Reichstag Hermann Wendel, who stated in 1921, Serbs, Croats and Slovenes are one people. If the Yugoslavs are not one people, then the Germans are not one either, then Lanker's gloomy prophecy. Market forces, international admonitions, and not least the civilizing effect of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia on its citizens proved to be stronger than the neo-fascism of Franjo Tuđman, the general xenophobia in Slovenia in the early 1990s or Serbian ultranationalism, at least in the three republics mentioned, where more than two-thirds of all former Yugoslavs live. But there was nothing to suggest this at the beginning of the Great Slaughter in 1991 or in the following years. More astonishing are the new insights that have been coming for some years now, albeit for partly diametrically opposed reasons, from the very political spectrum that has given rise to some shrill fears with its desktop murderousness. These FAZ Germans seem to have lost their appetite for national adventures to such an extent that even the end of Germany's Yugoslavia policy was commented on without any euphoria, the secession of Kosovo is a direct consequence of the NATO-led war against Serbia, for which there was no mandate from the UN Security Council, it was a humanitarian intervention in favor of a threatened ethnic group. At the time, it was described as an exceptional case, and so far it has remained so. But this has not put an end to the corresponding concerns, even in states that took part in the armed conflict in the Balkans. What would happen if the Turks were to play the minority card unchecked in this country? After all, international law is first and foremost a right of states, concerned with preserving the existing order. The integrity of the state is a foundation of the community of states. It may in principle oppose separatist aspirations. FAZ, March 26, 08, of course, the FAZ of today has not mutated into the accuser of the Zeitung für Deutschland of yesterday, when Johann George Rias Muller led his journalistic campaign against Serbia. Even today, it still talks unflinchingly about threatened ethnic groups and emphasizes further down in the same text that collective rights of minorities against state sovereignty should be defended as a matter of principle. And yet, since the Turkish prime minister warned the Germans of crimes against humanity in Cologne, the minority card may no longer be pulled out as naturally as it was 17 years ago. Tayyip Erdogan had warned of an impending cultural genocide of the Turks living in Germany, i.e. their assimilation, and had thus spoken the same language as the anti-Yugoslav and anti-Serbian whips in Croatia or, until recently, in Kosovo. And again the FAZ, there is much, possibly too much, talk in the Balkans about minorities and their rights and their alleged or actual violations. Serbs in Kosovo, Albanians in southern Serbia, Hungarians in Vojvodina, Greeks in Albania, Albanians in Greece, sometimes the minorities seem to block the view of the majorities. May 5, 08, 
had German foreign policy towards Yugoslavia in 1990-91 followed these insights, which at the time were almost exclusively expressed by anti-Germans, the country would probably not have been spared gradual dissolution, but a terrible civil war. However, regardless of this, German foreign policy did not simply carry out what the anti-Serbian combat press wanted to tell them to do. It is worth following Wolfgang Port's suggestion and moving away from the assumption, obvious yet wrong at the beginning of the 1990s, that Western Balkan policy is made by the TAS and FAZ, DERS, FAQ, Berlin 2004, page 113. Over the years, it became clear that anti-German criticism of the breakup of Yugoslavia was based on the too long unexamined assumption that the new, fully sovereign Germany would have to repeat the policies of the old Germany, which had collapsed in 1918 and again in 1945. Rias Muller's FAZ, Eric Rathfelder's TAS and many others in the media and politics inflamed the domestic political climate from 1991 onwards to such an extent that the impression had to arise that the executive was merely the executor of public opinion. Although politicians often used the language provided by the media, the policy of recognition based on ethnic criteria was not followed by a militarization of foreign policy, and there was no general German enthusiasm for war, as assumed by Concrete editor Wolfgang Schneider in 1997 in the foreword to the anthology he edited, Bay Andruckmord, Die Deutsche Propaganda und der Balkankrieg. Within a very short space of time, Schneider wrote at the time, the Germans, who had just been the supposed victims of a nuclear war and whose peacefulness no one wanted to surpass, had mutated into a people who believed themselves called upon to look after the world with weapons in their hands. P. 08, at that time, Germany, represented by its public opinion and in one case also by the foreign office, had agitated against Yugoslavia in general and the Serbs in particular in the name of the West, thus gaining ideological sovereignty over the rest of the West for several years with phrases borrowed from its own history. Wolfgang Port summarized the result of this offensive self-critically in 2004, not Germany alone against everyone, but Germany on behalf of everyone, that was the game, opposite page 12. This is also confirmed in Genscher's memoirs. There it says, unity in the European community was an absolute priority if we did not want to revive the old frontal positions from the First and Second World Wars and thus jeopardize the new Europe. In 1991, Germany assumed the role of avant-garde among the Western states when it recognized the state sovereignty of Slovenia and Croatia without consulting its alliance partners, thereby putting Europe and the USA under pressure to act. To deduce from this that there was a pronounced collective will to destruction at that time as a result of reunification and thus regaining its own full sovereignty, and even more so that Germany had once again become a deliberately destructive force as it had been until 1945, was to go far beyond the political reality. Hans Dietrich Genscher in particular, who set the course for German foreign policy towards Yugoslavia in 1990-1991 and thus established a line that would continue to have an effect until Kosovo's declaration of independence, acted less out of megalomania than out of a sense of simultaneous ability and necessity vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. The duty of partnership at eye level, which Bush Sr. proclaimed as the new world order for the European partners in leadership in 1991, was understood by someone like Genscher as the foreign policy freestyle of reunified Germany, which was less a strategic march through than a stumble into the unknown following German intuition, the devastating consequences of which are still not forgiven by the Americans today, the United States, which has unique political and military means at its Disposal, would have been the only international actor capable of imposing a common line among the Allies in the complicated conflict in the Balkans. By failing to provide the necessary leadership for four years after the open outbreak of war in the former Yugoslavia, the US must bear much of the responsibility for the misguided Western response to the Yugoslav conflict. Only in this completely irresponsible and projective way is it possible in Germany today to talk about a disaster for which the West was largely responsible. The quote comes from a book published in 2000 by the Munich Institute for East European Studies entitled The Role of the United States in the Yugoslavia Conflict and the Foreign Policy Room for Maneuver of the Federal Republic of Germany, 1990-1996, page 179. The political consequences of enforcing a comparatively high sensitivity in Germany for the right of a people to self-determination, Ibid page 49, are blamed on those who, not least because they were heavily involved in foreign policy with the first Iraq war in 1990-91, had allowed a then-German-led Europe to get away with it. 
Such semi-official assessments lead to the reverse conclusion that it is the task of American policy to stop anti-imperialist loosening exercises from Germany or Europe before their pacifist contributions, which today are called misguided Western reactions, lead to the devastation of the same German-inspired European anti-imperialism that has threatened Israel for decades also unleashed its destructive power in the destruction of Yugoslavia. This was never a consensus among critics of Germany's Yugoslavia policy, even if until 1999 it seemed as if protagonists with very different opinions were pulling in the same direction. One of them, who had fought against the breakup of Yugoslavia from the very beginning, wrote in 1999 on the occasion of the war against Serbia, For me, it is an anti-fascist reflex to be on the side of the Israelis and Jews as well as the Yugoslavs and Serbs. In fact, I would like to equate the two, both Israel and Yugoslavia are states that were built by the victims and opponents of National Socialism. When these states and the people there are threatened, I stand in solidarity. This is especially true when these people are once again threatened by German weapons, as they were during National Socialism, the Israelis by German poison gas, the Yugoslavs by German bombers. Jürgen Elsasser, Andrei S. Markovitz, eds, Die Fratze der Eigenen Gestcht, Berlin 1999, page 198, if the cerebrum is not in play, yesterday's convulsions must have nothing to do with today's will-driven actions. The connection between anti-fascist motivated solidarity with Israel and no less anti-fascist motivated solidarity with the losers of a civil war, humiliated and despised by everyone, a war that not only claimed the lives of more than 100,000 people, but also a model of peaceful coexistence between peoples who had been enemies for so long, propagated by Elsasser nine years ago has a lot going for it. The ultimately victorious resistance against the Ottoman despotism in the 19th century, which involved enormous sacrifices, also speaks in favor of solidarity with Serbia. Two failed attempts to abolish the ethnic hell in the Balkans by establishing a state that was more friendly to all the people living there also speak in Serbia's favor. In Serbia's favor is the fierce resistance to the Austro-Hungarian invasion in 1914 and the German occupation in 1941-44 and, above all, the almost incomprehensible fact that the population of this country did everything in its power to keep the Jews living there and those who fled there from 1940 onwards out of German hands. So there are some good reasons for solidarity with the Serbs, which is not tantamount to denying the considerable Serbian contribution to the carnage of the 1990s. But today Elsasser prefers to propagate his solidarity with the enemies of Israel as an anti-fascist imperative and probably remains pro-Yugoslav or pro-Serbian because in 1999, the same year from which the friendly quote originates, he came to the very unfriendly conclusion that Serbia, like the enemies of Israel, was a spearhead against the all-destroying US imperialism. He is probably not even aware that he has long been in league with the bitter enemies of the Serbs, who proclaimed Bosnia the second Palestine at the beginning of the 1990s. Someone like Elsasser was used to castigating German foreign policy as imperialist or folkish, and he did so, as was customary until the mid-1990s, by drawing analogies to the German dreams of great power status and acts of mass murder against Serbia and Yugoslavia in the First World War and even more so under National Socialism. This explanatory scheme, which was also often used in early issues of this journal, did reveal a lot about ideological continuities, but proved to be useless at the latest when it became evident that the German backyard in Eastern and Southeastern Europe, which was supposedly being founded, never came into being and that German great power dreams were not based on the establishment of dominions. The last empires collapsed in 1917-18. After that, there was at least one similar entity in the form of the Stalinist Soviet Union, while German National Socialism wanted to conquer the world, but for the most part did not want to administer it and profit from it, but rather to squeeze it dry and either destroy its populations itself or abandon them to destruction through hunger, cold and epidemics. The USA, on the other hand, never had an empire never waged wars of expansion for the sake of consolidating its territory or even annihilation. While opposition to German atrocities can be described as anti-fascist, because the otherwise so vague term in this case always also means anti-national socialist, its extension, or better, transfer to US policy, trivializes national socialism and especially its anti-Semitic crimes. To be anti-imperialist and remain anti-fascist at the same time is only possible by completely emptying the term fascism of meaning. Consequently, Elsasser was already guilty of a misunderstanding in 1999, which continues to this day, 
when he saw Israel and Yugoslavia as being threatened primarily by German bombers and German poison gas. In doing so, he made it clear that he was unable to recognize the truly dangerous German weapon, which in its essence is not substantially different as it was during National Socialism. However, this is not about German participation in war operations, which is at most symbolic, and even then reluctantly, but about the anti-imperialism that Elsasser himself propagates in the form of anti-Americanism, which was turned pacifist after 1945 and given an anti-fascist makeover from 1968 at the latest. A similar blind spot, albeit in reverse, is exhibited by those declared friends of Israel who, for example, stirred up sentiment against Yugoslavs and Serbs in the newspapers of the Springer Publishing House, without even wasting a thought on how close their arguments were to German anti-imperialism and thus to the enemies of Israel. Werner Perker, of all people, the Zionist eater and longtime intimate enemy of Elsasser in the Junge Welt, almost discovered the German miracle weapon when he stated after the Dayton Agreement on the Ethnic Division of Bosnia in 1996, Bellicism is proving to be violent pacifism. Those who still feel the agonizing conflict between ends and means are put in a heightened state of combat readiness by reminiscences of anti-imperialist solidarity. Schneider, edition, opposite page 221, but because the anti-imperialist Perker wanted to save genuine anti-imperialism from the false, he missed the point by a long way. Referring to the German participation in the Dayton process, he pretended that he had seen pacifist violence at work and not the destructive pacifism he had quite correctly diagnosed, which encourages others and not the Bundeswehr to wage ethnic wars for world peace. In the book published in 2000 on Germany's role in the recognition of the Republic of Croatia under international law, the conditions for the pacifist action of German anti-imperialism were formulated as follows, the decision as to whether the Croats are to be qualified as a people and thus as potential bearers of the right to self-determination depends on whether the following criteria are met. It must be examined whether there is a homogeneity based on objective linguistic, cultural or similar characteristics, including historical development, and whether a corresponding political self-consciousness can be established, Zeitler op sit op sit page 70. In the book, Yugoslavia and the Third Reich, by Johann Wescht, published in 1969, it says, referring to Tito's Yugoslavia in similar German diction, the present regime in Yugoslavia does not derive its legality derivatively from the former legal system, i.e. not by way of succession. Its legal scholars identify the state with a certain legal order and thus come into conflict with the doctrine of traditional international law that the legal order can be changed by coups, revolutions and constitutional violations, but the state as an organized community of the people forming it continues to exist unchanged. Not only the notorious anti-peoples of America and Israel are thus once again delegitimized, but even more so Tito's non-homogeneous, linguistically and culturally disparate entity, which, however, cannot be spared the accusation of having been, like the Soviet Union, a zoo of peoples, a reserve, where the barbaric entities of prehistory were not dissolved and humanized, but placed under species protection, as Wolfgang Port put it, Ders, Das Jar Danik, Berlin 1992, page 301. In order to understand the conditions under which and why Genscher was able to determine Germany's response to the West, Samuel Huntington, by recognizing Croatia and Slovenia, this new German policy must not be misunderstood as a break with the Gensherism, still stemming from the Cold War, but rather the Yugoslavia policy from 1990 onwards must be read as its consequent continuation under different auspices. The term Gensherism was coined in the mid-1980s as an expression for the rapprochement of parts of the CDU-CSU parliamentary group around Volker Rua with the social liberal Ostpolitik in contrast to the so-called Stahlhelm wing around the then-parliamentary group leader Alfred Dreger. At the heart of the dispute between the Stahlhelmer and Gensherists was the question of the importance of military deterrence. The Gensherists wanted to develop Germany into a civilian power, Hans W. Mall, in the slipstream of the Americans, which would also act independently of the Americans and NATO. This is the reason why Gensherism gradually became a dirty word among the Americans, who recognized in it the intended undermining of the American policy of military deterrence, the term Gensherism arose on the occasion of recurring missile disputes. It summarized the suspicion, especially of the Anglo-Saxon partners, that Genscher was pursuing a rocking policy, that he was giving in too much to the pacifist-minded German public and making the Federal Republic an unreliable ally. Fawes, 28.04. 92, following this line, 
in the case of Yugoslavia Genscher also deliberately relied on the pacifist, anti-Yugoslavian mood among the population from the outset and pursued his foreign policy by bypassing NATO, which was only brought into play again by the Americans under Clinton in the case of Bosnia and subsequently in Kosovo. Germany's civilian policy towards Yugoslavia went so far that Genscher pacifistically denied the Yugoslav sovereign the right to take military action against secessionist tendencies in his own country, as he emphatically stated in his memoirs, for German foreign policy, the ban on the use of military force to resolve political issues was an important criterion from the very beginning. Everywhere I explained our opinion that nothing, absolutely nothing could justify the use of military force, but that all issues had to be resolved politically, Genscher, Irina Rungen, Berlin 1995, pages 939 and 967. The fact that Genscher obviously still refuses to accept his responsibility for unleashing the war through his policy of recognition can be read in his memoirs, the lessons that can be drawn from the developments in the former Yugoslavia must in any case include adherence to the renunciation of violence, only in this way can the culture of coexistence be preserved or created. Helmut Kohl's words should be taken at face value today at the latest, when he declared at the Dresden CDU party conference on December 17, 1991, one day after the recognition of Slovenia and Croatia, I would also like to say at this point to all those who accuse us of other motives, for us Germans, it is only about the fate of these people, about their future in peace, freedom and democracy and nothing else. Quoted in Zeitler, op sit page 181, Acting in the name of the greater good regardless of losses, the general without the particular, if there is a continuity in German politics, then Kohl named what Wolfgang Port described as the presumably everlasting difference between American pragmatism and German destruction, they, the Germans, do not know the dichotomy that is expressed in the attitude of using a Pinochet as a tool in the fight against socialism, but not receiving the criminal in. Washington for that reason, Ibid, page 294. In the case of the breakup of Yugoslavia, the German Pinochet's name was Franjo Tuđman, as is well known, and Bonn received the Croatian leader more than once. Genscher's successor Kinkel, who was in office from 1992, acted much more cautiously than his predecessor, despite some pithy remarks, the German solo effort was successful in that the European partners felt compelled to recognize Slovenia and Croatia as well. However, it ultimately had no positive outcome because German foreign policy had to exercise considerable restraint from then on. December 1991, the month of recognition, became something of a German trauma. When the controversy over the lifting of the arms embargo for Bosnia-Herzegovina began, it was Foreign Minister Kinkel who declared categorically, in any case, there will be no German solo effort. This assessment of the situation from 1993 was penned by an author from the German Council on Foreign Relations, an association whose presidium included Helmut Schmidt, Hans-Dietrich Genscher, Volker Ruhe and Rudolf Scharping. Even if the talk of a German trauma is itself somewhat paranoid, the conclusions reached by the author in response to the question, is a united Germany no longer the paragon of the West, are astonishing, Bonn is still a long way from defining its national interests. Moral values and not interests determine the public debate. Ibid page 101. Even if it is questionable whether the Berlin of today defines its national interests more clearly in case of doubt than the Bonn of yesterday, it can be said that the end of Genscherism did not come until the Red Slash Greens came to power in 1998. Gerhard Schroeder, basically, with the Kosovo decision in foreign policy, we had to make up for what the conservatives had neglected to do in the 1990s. There was no reflection on the new obligations that this united Germany would have to face. Ders, Ernst Schiedingen, Hamburg 2006 page 84, in the case of Kosovo, there was no absolute military necessity for the Germans, unlike, for example, in the declared alliance case of Afghanistan in 2002. The then US Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was therefore correspondingly surprised by Germany's willingness to participate militarily, which was, of course, hardly more than symbolic, Joshka Fischer was an unexpected and therefore particularly important ally. Dies, Madam Secretary, Munich 2003 page 496, the myth that the Germans had no choice but to make their, ridiculous, Wolfgang Port, 11 tornadoes available for the bombing of Yugoslavia has thus once again been shattered by a competent source. Ms. Albright is able to shed light on what must have been on Joseph Fischer's mind at the time, I found his, Fischer's, assessment of Milosevic particularly remarkable. In a telephone conversation on March 30, 
He said to me, for 10 years, Milosevic acted like the Nazis in the 1930s. First he destroyed Yugoslavia, then Croatia, then Bosnia, and now Kosovo. Ibid. And all this is supposed to have been just an act by a German foreign minister. Fischer in the role of someone driven by anti-fascism, who was actually concerned with something completely different. In 1999, Hardly anyone came as close to answering this question as Frank Schirmacher, of all people, in his FAZ on May 10, perhaps it is true, and the German tornadoes in the skies over Yugoslavia are in fact not bombing the Serbs, but the German Wehrmacht of 1941. One might add, in the eyes of the young Joseph Fischer, the Viet Cong was already fighting against US fascists and the Arabs against Israelis. The fact that a Fischer was able to discover fascism in Serbia at all had a left-wing German anti-fascist history, whose propagandists, ranging from the old KPD to the Spontus or Autonomen, were silent about the specifics of National Socialism in order to fight fascism everywhere and at all times in the name of anti-imperialism. During his time as foreign minister, Fischer made German anti-fascism the raison d'etre of the state, a position that is still most resolutely cultivated today in Werner Perker's daily newspaper. The change of form from Genscherism to nationalized anti-fascism was not a caesura in German thinking, as Samuel Huntington reminded us in his Clash of Civilizations, a book that is also worthy of criticism in many respects and is still dismissed in toto today by ideologues who have never read it, civilization is a cultural quantity, except in German usage. German thinkers of the 19th century made a strict distinction between civilization, which included mechanics and material factors, and culture, which included values, ideals and the higher spiritual, artistic and moral qualities of a society. This distinction has held its own in German thought, while it is rejected elsewhere. Huntington is criticized above all for not presenting himself as a cultural relativist, i.e. for not being an ideologue in the sense of adhering to a wishful thinking tired of civilization that Islam in particular is somehow compatible with Western thinking if one only believes in it firmly enough, the deeper problem for the West is not Islamic fundamentalism. The deeper problem is Islam, another culture whose people are convinced of the superiority of their culture and obsessed with the inferiority of their power. At the same time, Huntington admits, the problem for Islam is not the CIA or the US Department of Defense. The problem is the West, another culture whose people are convinced of the universality of their culture and believe that their superior, albeit diminishing, power imposes on them the obligation to spread that culture across the globe. Ibid. In the case of the Balkan War in the early 1990s, Huntington speaks of an exemplary, fault-line war, by which he means that the cultural determinacy of the fault lines must be recognized by the respective parties to the conflict and their accomplices, because it determines victory or defeat in advance. While the Europeans generally concede the fundamental importance of the dividing line between Western Christendom on the one hand and Orthodoxy and Islam on the other, the USA, in the words of its Secretary of State, did not want to recognize a fundamental division of Europe into a Catholic, an Orthodox, and an Islamic part. After the breakup of Yugoslavia, Huntington must unfortunately be contradicted on the last point. With the advance of the Germans at the beginning of the 1990s, the rationality that embodied the Yugoslav state idea, and which was described by the former American Secretary of State Albright as, the simple premise that every human being is valuable and that one neighbor should not see in the other the Serb, Croat or Muslim, but the individual, individual human being, op sit page 238, has precisely not received approval. Since then, the Germanization of Western thought on the question of culture can no longer be denied. For this reason, Huntington's following statement does not reflect reality, but unintentionally formulates an anti-German utopia, the desired distinction between culture and civilization has not prevailed, and outside Germany it is generally agreed that it would be illusory to want to separate culture from its foundation, civilization, in the manner of the Germans. Criticism of Huntington should begin where he rightly objects to Edward said that not every crime that is declared to be a culture is compatible with the West, which is committed to the individual, but intends to perpetuate and cement this difference, instead of taking a universal stand for the freedom of the individual. The survival of the West depends on Americans affirming their Western identity and Westerners accepting that their culture is unique but not universal. A global clash of civilizations can only be avoided if the world's powerful accept and uphold a global policy that takes account of different cultural values. Quote, end.
From Srebrenica to Auschwitz, only those who approve of the Blood Nation project and do not want to imagine a nation in any other way will get there. That is why the loser in the Yugoslavian Civil War, the multi-ethnic state represented until 1990 by Serbia, which was strongly self-cut in its historical chauvinism and striving for hegemony, had to be blamed for the civil war. Anyone who goes from the 8,000 murdered in Srebrenica to the 1.5 million murdered in Auschwitz is acting projectively. They envy the Jews the inconceivably high number of victims and are determined to find more villainous deeds than those committed by the Germans against the Jews, precisely where any comparison in terms of the quantity in the eliminatory intention of the murder is flawed. Auschwitz was certainly the climax of the German struggle for the ethnically constituted nation. However, this struggle took place in a negative way, in that those declared to be anti-people were identified and largely destroyed according to genuinely ethnic criteria. The criteria of the most meticulous genealogical research for the purpose of complete segregation and extermination continue to exist, seemingly with a positive twist, where the lesson of the Holocaust is that sides must be taken in civil wars according to the criterion of ethnic purity. In the case of Syria, the only Arab country in which Christians were not persecuted under Assad's regime and secular Alevites were able to come to power, the concern for the people, as in Yugoslavia at the time, is presented as a concern for the only right people, with the difference that this time it is not separatism that is being advocated, but the unity of the nation, which cannot mean anything good for those who are not supposed to be part of it. Not even the fact that the Kurds oppressed by Assad have decidedly not joined the People's War has embarrassed German proxy revolutionaries. In Aleppo and elsewhere, it is becoming clear what the Syrian is in reality in the eyes of the European public, a Sunni Arab who also follows his Sunni Arab mission with faith. This means that not only the Alevites, Christians and Kurds, who, although Sunnis themselves, do not want to submit to the Arab Sunnah, have been eliminated from the body of the people, but also those Arab Sunnis who do not want to be counted as part of the Arab popular storm. For the time being, one can only agree with Jonathan Spire's hopes expressed in his Spectator article, written before the intervention of the Turkish army and its affiliated jihadist killer groups, the Assad regime should not be allowed to reunify Syria under its rule. Likewise, the Islamists should not be allowed to establish a jihadist state in the country, and the Islamic State should not be allowed to continue to exist. By strengthening the alliance with the SDF, Syrian Democratic Forces, equipping them and their allies to conquer Raqqa and destroy ISIS in the east, and then allowing them to establish their rule in eastern and northern Syria, these conditions can be met. For a change, the US and its allies have found a clearly anti-Islamist and anti-Jihadist power in the Middle East that has a habit of winning its battles. That's a success that should be solidified. Furthermore, a little Syria ruled by Assad and his allies and another autonomous region in the rebel-held areas is likely to emerge. This would have the advantage that Syria would not fall completely into the hands of either the Assad coalition or the Sunni Sharia faction. There was no other way, neither in 2011 nor afterwards, because the Syrian uprising was from the outset what was always written about it with praise, an Arabellion that had no progress for this broken and bleeding country, in its program. And the little Omrans from Aleppo? Will they be mere pawns of Western geostrategy and thus defenselessly at the mercy of Assad's or Putin's barrel bombs? Not at all. Today, they are the human shields of murderous gangs waiting to be released and ready to continue their lost war not to the last fighter, but to the last five-year-old child. The Omrans are deployed against extremely ruthless besiegers, whose methods include dropping barrel bombs. Contrary to the excited clamor, the West has not been inactive. Western states can and must be expected to do more to help civilians leave the old city of Aleppo and provide them with the basic necessities until then, even if this gives the jihadists an advantage. For months, such demands have been met, at least to a certain extent. Relief supplies have indeed been delivered to the besieged districts, albeit too little, due to pressure from the West. On November 9, 2016, at the instigation of the West, a further temporary ceasefire and access for aid organizations to the combat zone, not just Aleppo, was agreed in negotiations with Russia. The fact that the West has not complied with the demands for recognition of the renamed Al-Nusra Front, once again coming from Germany among others, and continues to fight it together with Russia, can only be in the interests of small Omrans. You have to be a rabble-rouser from the Springer Press to deny that the looming division of Syria into three territories is significantly more progressive than a victory for the United Sunnah in the People's War.
Leftists, including anti-German leftists, love revolution. In other words, they do not see revolution as the act through which society could be improved, human coexistence could be given a richer content, history could be given meaning after all, i.e. not as a means to an end, rather, the form already produces the entire content at the same time. Form and content coincide in the self-sufficient struggle around which all action and thought revolve. There was never more to the slogans once invented by the avant-garde to encourage themselves, such as, permanent revolution, and, revolutionary struggle, it is all mere tautology. It had long been known that this could no longer be used at home when even the Red Army faction signed its declaration of capitulation in the early 1990s. There is no doubt that when the bader meinhof gang began to take the revolutionary lunacy of 1968 seriously, they had nothing more to do with the revolution they were talking about, but all the more to do with themselves, the class struggle, which it wanted to carry into the metropolises in the name of Asian, African and Latin American anti-imperialism, soon spilled over into the prisons, but only reached its climax when it was carried on out of the cells, because from the beginning it mainly took place within the fighting group itself, whose underground members felt all the more connected to the masses outside the revolutionary cell, the sooner the number of supporters could be counted on the fingers of one hand. In the end, all that mattered for each individual combatant was to maintain their revolutionary stance, to see who was the most radical and unyielding of all, and who was the traitor, and finally who would hold out the hunger strike to the last consequence, revolution y muerte. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the guerrillas of El Salvador, for whom the Taz had collected money to buy weapons in the 1980s, threw away their Kalashnikovs, leaving the young revolutionaries, who had not yet caught on, with only the Turkish Kurds at their disposal. The Marxist Leninist Stalinist etc. Kurdistan Workers Party, the PKK, which had been waging its people's war against the Turkish army since the 1980s, had even succeeded once again in luring some left-wing radicals from Germany to the mountains of Kurdistan, there had been nothing comparable since the legendary complicity between German and Palestinian terrorists 20 years previously. Of course, the new generation of German class fighters no longer knew that the PKK militias had been given their military drill in exactly the same area where the RAF comrades had learned to shoot from the PLO, in the Baqa Valley, in Syrian-occupied Lebanon, where, after Israel had chased the Arafat gangs to Tunisia, they now had to share the terrain with Hezbollah, about whose armed struggle they certainly had no idea either. The PKK comrades delivered a proper guerrilla war to Turkey, which cost tens of thousands of lives, mainly on the Kurdish side, but also claimed many lives of the Turkish army and Turkish citizens who did not belong to any revolutionary or military formation. As a considerable number of PKK militias, including their leader, were hiding in Syria and negotiations between the Turkish and Syrian governments failed to produce any results, Turkey finally threatened to invade Syria. The threat worked and the PKK had to disappear from Syria head over heels. As a result, Abdullah Akalan was captured in 1999 and shortly afterwards the PKK capitulated. And so this armed struggle and its sympathizers came to an end, for the time being, as we now know. Revolutionary anti-Zionists always had the Palestinians in reserve, of course. The Al-Aqsa Intifada, which was launched in 2000 when a Jew, Ariel Sharon, visited the Temple Mount, which the Palestinians claimed as Islamic property, continued. But the increasingly caustic criticism of the anti-Germans thoroughly spoiled the fun of the new generation of German revolutionaries, this time siding with Palestinian child murderers in the name of international solidarity, the last battle, it sang in their ears, we are losing. For the radical left scene was splitting, and it now looked as if the anti-Semitic part of Antifa would only be able to muster a minority faction. In retrospect, however, it may seem that some of the defectors to the anti-German camp had merely swapped the Palestinian scarf for the Israeli flag, a deal with a right of exchange that could all too easily be cancelled, as many a freshly baked anti-German had apparently still not got the message. In retrospect, the initially not very conspicuous inclination towards philo-Semitism could be seen as an unconquered longing to belong to a people, even if it was not one's own, but above all in the conspicuously lustful passion for the Israeli armed forces, especially in the already pornographic photos of armed Jewish girls in breast-bearing uniforms, very similar to those posted in the recent Kurdish Solidarity, the desire to fight for the sake of fighting and revolution for the sake of. Revolution shone through again. 
The fact that soldiering and weapons are in themselves despicable things that can only be used in an emergency and with reluctance, and to which a halfway healthy mental apparatus would react with fear instead of pleasure, even this simple humane truth is suppressed in the fetishism of revolution and struggle and then negated, i.e. turned into its opposite. Israel, however, is not a change to communism, as those anti-German leftists who can't stop speculating must constantly do, the Israeli armed forces, which only serve to defend the bourgeois state, the not at all revolutionary political organization that the Jews have created for their self-assertion, can therefore only satisfy the desire for revolution and struggle projectively, and certainly not in the long term. But then the Arabs finally arrived. Their revolution also attracted many anti-German leftists and brought them back under the spell of the old-style popular uprising. The revolutionary impulse, which after a phase of enforced abstinence because the world stage no longer offered it a suitable projection surface, finally found a suitable object again when the rebellious crowd gathered on the streets of Egypt as the autonomists once did on the 1st of May in Kreuzberg. All they had to do now was hold up banners with inscriptions such as, democracy, justice, and freedom, photograph them and share them on Facebook to convince the willing foreign reporters at Jungle World, Taz or ARD that a revolution a la 1848 was underway. It was difficult to see the Muslim Brotherhood hidden behind the banners, mainly because people didn't want to see them, because the happiness of love that had been denied for too long was too tempting. In Libya, it was even young boys with a bandolier over their shoulders, tanned by the African sun, and a trusty Kalashnikov in their arms, who recalled the almost forgotten dream of armed struggle. Who would have known that they might have been tribal warriors and Islamic terrorists who, just a few years later, would establish a province of the caliphate that had been reawakened after a hundred-year coma. When the second round of the revolution began in Egypt, again a popular uprising, but this time preparing a counter-revolution, namely the overthrow of the Muslim Brotherhood, which had come to power in the first round and with which international solidarity did not quite know how to make friends, people immediately fell in love with them again. This time, however, the revolution culminated in a coup, the new bride was the old military, so that the previous balance of power was restored. The desire to fight was thus completely satisfied. Since then, there has been silence in the left-wing and anti-German left-wing press, not to mention the gang war that emerged from the Libyan revolution. Thank God the Syrian revolution still had a few surprises in store. When the Bahamas claimed at the beginning of this revolution that it was not a bourgeois, western or any other kind of revolution that could at least be expected to bring about an improvement, however small, compared to the conditions that existed, but rather another Islamic revolution, in which Al-Qaeda and related gangs would possibly be victorious this time, that this revolution would in any case threaten to drastically worsen the situation for the citizens of Syria, such a gloomy prophecy could of course only be interpreted as counter-revolutionary propaganda or complicity with the Assad regime by those who had already demonstrated their willingness to deny reality. As if there was something to make up for or to cover up, this time the projection work performed its duty more thoroughly and persistently than ever before, the true character of the Syrian revolution still had to be denied even after the proclamation of the caliphate. Anything that does not fit into the revolutionary pathos is simply bent into shape. Accordingly, it was either claimed that it was not the revolution but the Assad regime that brought about the Islamic State with the intention of presenting itself to the international community as a lesser evil and or that the USA was responsible, either because it had intervened in Iraq or because it had not intervened in Syria. The message of these kinds of statements is always that the revolution started so beautifully and would have ended just as beautifully if some sinister powers or foreign policy dilettantes had not intervened or, alternatively, had not intervened, i.e. doomed the good cause to failure by doing nothing, in short, the products of projection had to be defended against the products of reality. Just how delusional this is became symptomatic when the Islam experts at Jungle World finally accused the USA of complicity with the Assad regime because the American airstrikes against IS, which had initially concentrated on Iraqi territory, also hit al-Nusra positions in September 2014. The Syrian Al-Qaeda offshoot to which the revolutionary troops of the Free Syrian Army actually owe their greatest military successes, the aimless intervention of the USA, analyzed the paper's chief. Strategists, was primarily of benefit to IS itself. Following its own logic, revolutionary punditry is thus striving towards a state that the sick person half-consciously fears the most. 
that the world as it appears to him inside the sphere of his head will no longer find any points of reference in the outside world to which the projection work could attach its links in order to bridge the gap between the two worlds in a makeshift manner, which ultimately makes the loss of reality obvious. In the summer of 2014, with the Islamic State IS, offensive, it seemed to have come to this. At first, it was hard to see what the left actually had to criticize about IS. Is this not a proper revolution that is going on? The IS warriors not only look like Che Guevara in the flesh, they also know something about armed struggle, that can hardly be denied. Do they not take the popular slogan at revolutionary demonstrations, fire and flame for the state, at its word? Aren't they smashing the traditional tribal relationships and turning the social order upside down even more thoroughly than anyone in 1968 would have dared to dream? But, oh no, they suddenly said, they didn't mean the slogans that seriously. Another revolution, not entirely unspoiled but still in fresh clothes, was soon to help out of this predicament, just waiting to be embraced by the trustees of international solidarity, the Rojava Revolution. The PKK, the former subject of the Kurdish popular uprising in Turkey, which served as the object of the radical left's revolutionary projections in the 1990s, has had to keep its head above water with revolutionary perseverance over the past 15 years following its escape from Syria and the capture of its leader. While Abdullah Akhalan used the time in his prison cell in the middle of the Marmara Sea to undergo an astonishing metamorphosis from nationalist Stalinist to anti-nationalist anarchist, convincing his followers, who were open to esotericism, that the military defeat he had just suffered had been a human gain. The remaining PKK militias devoured his thin brochures in the barren but supposedly all the more beautiful Candle Mountains in northern Iraq, where, to make matters worse, Masoud Barzani was now leading a successful Kurdish revolution in alliance with the USA and Turkey, less than ten years earlier, when it was still strong, the PKK had fought a small internal Kurdish civil war with its Peshmerga. The PKK obviously found itself in a lost position in every respect, militarily, politically and ideologically. Accordingly, it seemed uninteresting for international solidarity. This changed abruptly with the battle for the city of Kobane. From one day to the next, Kurdish solidarity was back in vogue, and not only did it attract the radical left-wing scene as before, it also had a magical effect on the anti-German, indeed the entire German left, including social democracy and the peace movement, eventually even reaching as far as the CDU. Solidarity demonstrations were organized, solidarity accounts were opened, nightlife for Rojava was proclaimed in the cultural capital Berlin and in Kreuzberg there was Cobain kebab for quick consumption, with a solidarity surcharge, of course. However, the most impressive thing about this was not the extent of the new Kurdish solidarity, but the reasons for it. While the commander of the IS troops attacking Kobane had told the city's defenders via YouTube that none of them would survive this battle, none of the organizers of the demonstrations, no call author or call signer even had the idea of justifying Rojava solidarity by saving the lives of the people trapped in the city. A simple human life was not enough, it had to be at least a revolution, which is why people demonstrated, donated or ate a Cobain kebab, so that no call for solidarity could do without the reference that a progressive and emancipatory project including ecology, feminism and council communism was at stake here, each time. The complete revolutionary esotericism from Abdullah Akhalan's brochures had to be invoked as the motivation for Rojava solidarity. Rojava solidarity can therefore be taken as a prime example of how much a human life is worth in revolutionary times. Of course, the PKK, known for its cult of martyrdom, did not think for a moment about fleeing Cobain. We were truly surprised by how quickly criticism of Rojava solidarity was voiced in Jungle World. Just two months after the start of the battle for Cobain, Felix Klopotek posed uncomfortable questions in an article with the same title, Jungle World 47-2014. These were questions about the legitimacy of analogies between Cobain, Warsaw, Stalingrad or Madrid, as they were used in Rojava Solidarity, or about the credibility of the PKK's metamorphosis, i.e. whether the party is now really against the state and the nation. The questions ultimately culminate in a critique of thinking in terms of the lesser evil, which he had assumed Rojava Solidarity would do if it did not face up to the previous questions. For if, it is argued, the exuberant solidarity is based on substantive positions which, once the right answers to the uncomfortable questions have been found, would no longer be tenable, what would be left? That the PKK would be the lesser evil in the face of IS? 
you can follow the line of questioning so far. But, it continues, doesn't the logic of the lesser evil already imply the abandonment of a general, overarching, binding, one would probably say universalist perspective? If we choose a lesser evil, can't the others choose theirs? From the point of view of Sunni Arabs, 200,000 of whom were slaughtered in Syria and who are being hunted down by Shiite death squads in Baghdad, isn't IS the lesser evil? Wouldn't the choice of a lesser evil lead straight to dead ends, at the end of which the superpowers are already waiting, whether Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Russia or the US, who will eventually play their game? Well, that's the way it works, Mr. Klopotek, the USA is always the biggest evil in the end anyway. But it only gets really bad when left-wing radicals strike back. As is the case here, and what would be the perspective then? Of course, and no question at this point, the self-organization of the proletariat, women and subalterns, as could already be observed to some extent in the Arab Spring, about which the last word has not yet been spoken, just as, to use an analogy, the bloody failed Russian Revolution of 1905 refers to 1917. So we are back to the Arabs, and thus on the trail of the riddle of what the foreign editors of Jungle World disliked so much about Rojava Solidarity that they launched a veritable campaign against it. To let Mr. Klopotek have his say one last time, two or three years ago, there was no shortage of media reports accusing the PKK and its Syrian offshoot, the PYD, of, at the very least, de facto collaboration with the regime of Bashar al-Assad. The PKK is not participating in a common front against Assad, but is being granted a limited separate peace, cantonal self-administration. Why is there no more talk of these reports? Have they been refuted? Is what a large part of the left sees as a haven of stability and human rights in the midst of the merciless civil war not only a product of this civil war, but has, indirectly, contributed to brutalizing it, precisely because the PYD has pushed behind a common, more powerful front against Assad. What is once again formulated here in question form and quasi in passant was finally openly stated in the next issue of the paper, 48-2014, as the main line of attack against the PKK comrades and their radical left-wing sympathizers in an article entitled, Romanticism Harms, by Elias Parebo and Harold Etzbach. Its announcement already reveals, somewhat coyly, the complete nonsense of the criticism, it says, in Cobain, the Islamic State was able to be beaten back, not least due to an impressive wave of international support. Instead of placing the events and solidarity in the context of the complex Syrian uprising, the local left prefers to chase after its own glorified revolutionary fantasies. Apart from the fact that the impressive wave of international support here apparently and nonsensically refers to the Kurdish demonstrations and similarly useless expressions of solidarity in Germany, but not to the US airstrikes, which have really helped the defenders of Cobain, as the PKK commanders have publicly admitted despite their die-hard anti-Americanism, Kurdish solidarity is to be criticized precisely for failing to integrate itself into the complex Syrian uprising, the fact that this actually means subordinate to the Syrian uprising will become clear elsewhere. However, the very choice of words used to insist that an uprising is taking place in Syria, a word that is associated with something good, but by no means a civil war, leaves the uncomfortable questions formulated earlier unanswered and uninterested, and abruptly sharpens the criticism of Rojava solidarity to the point that it has refused to join the Rojava Kurds in the uprising in Syria. As important as the rapid solidarity work for Cobain and Rojava was, the one-dimensional and selective way in which the events are categorized by the German initiatives is appalling in several respects, for example, the call by the new anti-capitalist organization, NOW, and the anti-fascist revolutionary action Berlin, solidarity with Rojava, weapons for the YPG slash YPJ from October 4, instead of talking about the Syrian uprising, just talks about the Syrian civil war in the midst of which the Kurds would defend a progressive social project. In its Rojava appeal, solidarity with Rojava. Who if not us? When if not now, the interventionist left even goes a step further and actually manages not to mention Syria at all, apart from a reference in brackets that Rojava is in northern Syria. This is not only ignorant and lacking in solidarity with all other forces in Syria, it also shows how little interest there is in the background in the Middle East and in Syria. Of course, this is particularly ignorant and lacking in solidarity with other forces in Syria, such as al-Nusra, IS and the Salafist brigades of the Free Syrian Army, apart from which there is nothing in Syria that could achieve anything, 
apart from the general forces of nature or Assad's armed forces, which are presumably not meant here. The soldiers of the so-called Southern Front who have been trained in Jordan since the fall of 2013 would perhaps still come into consideration if they were not armed by the CIA, whereby they are in the service of the greatest evil of all, CF Bahamas 67. However, as far as the interest in the background is concerned, the Jungle World editorial team seems to rely on the disinterest and ignorance of its readers to such an extent that it believes it can foist any nonsense on them, even if it is a little concealed on the disco page. In a subsequent section, it says, the Syrian uprising not only created the space for today's Kurdish experiment, but the people of northeastern Syria themselves were and are also part of this revolution. It seems to have been forgotten that people in Kobane, Amuda and Kamishli have also taken to the streets at great risk since 2011 to join the nationwide protests for bread, dignity and freedom. Nobody started a revolution in Syria because of a shortage of bread, dear people. You may be confusing this with Lenin's April Theses and the October Revolution of 1917 again. There was enough bread in Syria, at least there was more of it before the revolution than now, especially in the rural areas of northern Syria, where most Kurds live, because wheat was traditionally produced in abundance in this area and sold to other parts of Syria. The rest is outright lies. Individual Kurdish youth associations did try to organize demonstrations in the course of 2011, but the PKK used force to stop some of them. Whatever one may accuse the PKK of, the comrades saw one thing clearly from the outset, the Kurds had nothing good to expect from a Sunni revolution, they had to fear it. Consequently, this is also an insinuation, even leading figures of the PYD, such as Sali Muslim, naturally placed the democratic experiment in Rojava within the framework of the larger upheaval in Syria. Of course, the article does not provide any evidence for this assertion, because there is none. But you should take a look at an interview that Sali Muslim Muhammad, who incidentally is not one of the leading figures, but the chairman of the PYD, the Syrian branch of the PKK, gave to a journalist from Kurdwatch.org in November 2011, almost six months after the start of the revolution, a website, incidentally, that was expressly recommended by Mr. Klopotek as a source of information critical of the PKK. Question. There are many voices in Syria calling for the overthrow of President Bashar al-Assad and his regime. What is your demand? Sali Muslim Muhammad, we are calling for an end to the oppressive system. There are some who are calling for the fall of the regime. In contrast, we demand the overthrow of the oppressive authoritarian system. Our problem is not a problem of power. Those in power in Damascus come and go. This is not so important for us Kurds. For us Kurds, it is important that we secure our existence. The current regime does not accept us, and neither do those who may come to power afterwards. This is such a clear distancing from the Syrian revolution that it cannot be misunderstood if it is not to be misunderstood. The Kurds never wanted to have anything to do with the Syrian uprising because they had their own uprising in mind. They acted accordingly. There is a tacit non-aggression pact between the PKK and the Assad regime that has benefited both sides. When the Syrian army withdrew from the north in the summer of 2012 because the units stationed there were more urgently needed elsewhere, namely for the defense of Damascus, the PKK militias that had moved in from the Iraqi Candle Mountains took control of the Kurdish communities in northern Syria. That is the whole secret of revolutionary Kurdish self-government. There were no military clashes between the regime and the PKK. The only opponents the PKK faced in the areas under its control were the competing Kurdish parties loyal to Masoud Barzani, but they had no weapons. In this way, the Kurds were spared from the civil war in Syria, until the Syrian revolution in the form of IS came after them in late summer last year. The PKK was thus criticized in jungle world for the only sensible decision the party has ever made. As I said, this is even more stupid than the whole Rojava kitsch. Apart from the question of who this call is aimed at and what practical success it is supposed to achieve, it is unpleasantly noticeable that it does not derive its justification from a proposal that in turn owes itself to an analysis of the Syrian civil war, but rather operates with a seemingly long-buried historical philosophical axiom that needs no justification. It is apparently enough to decree, because there are still armed democratic forces in Syria, who keep the ideas of freedom and individual happiness alive, to whom European governments withhold all help in order to encourage them to carry on. If this were really what is meant, which is not the case, 
then this, call would be a cynical attempt to maintain the fighting morale of rebel groups that have long since lost, then it would be the ideal marching orders to an inevitable heroic death for a democratic cause, which would certainly not be given to, us, but to unknown, democratic, Syrian fighters who have long since been dismissed as martyrs. The style is familiar and the callers give the compelling hint when they begin, as once in the Spanish Civil War. Some people remember that even then, the majority of the passionate supporters of the Spanish Republicans did not mean, it's up to us, in terms of their concrete armed participation, but rather the organization of solidarity congresses, the launching of appeals and the consolidation of class struggle cohesion with the Soviet power. Between 1936 and 1939, thousands of young men from almost all European countries and the USA, and occasionally even from Turkey in Latin America, went to war without their authorities having sent them an order to enlist. They went to Spain voluntarily and often almost entirely on their own to fight on the side of the Republic against Franco's troops. The significance of the brigades made up of these men, most of whom had no military training, for the situation at the front is disputed, but they were certainly unable to prevent the defeat in 1939. Even during the Spanish Civil War, these international brigades were more important on a symbolic than a practical level. The neutral governments in Great Britain, for example, and even more so in France, which was temporarily governed by a popular front, came under strong public pressure at times due to the highly publicized activities of their citizens, without the intervention on the part of the Republic that many had hoped for. Even more important than this realpolitik aspect of the largely symbolic action was the ideological one. In Germany and Italy, but also in some Eastern European countries, fascists were in power and both the communist and social democratic left were banned and persecuted. It was not only in Europe and the USA that the Great Depression was by no means over. Mass unemployment and a general lack of prospects also characterized the political left, which, where it was allowed to stand in elections, could not boast any spectacular successes and for the most part had no program to combat the misery. Perhaps the most serious factor was the fact that from 1936 at the latest, there could hardly be any talk of cohesion among revolutionaries across party lines. The increasingly bad news from the Soviet Union of prison camps, show trials, death sentences against old revolutionaries, concentration camps and the complete synchronization of public opinion led to the division of the European workers' movement and left-wing intelligentsia into the loudly unwavering and the unorganized doubters and opponents of Stalinism. Spain appeared to many as the way out of inner left disputes and general paralysis. Here an elected left was fighting against Puchists, here the rifts that divided anarchists, communists, social democrats and bourgeois republicans everywhere else seemed to have been overcome, here, despite some irritations, even after 70 years, the alternative was freedom or barbarism. Despite the undeniably barbaric settlements that were carried out within the Spanish Republican camp, despite the intriguing and murderous actions of the internationalists loyal to the Soviet Union against Trotskyists and other dissidents branded as fascists, the international brigades and the hope founded in them for the eventual success of the World Revolution do not simply stand for an authoritarian historical mythology finalized in Moscow, in which the people are the saviors before the working class and the Soviet people before all peoples. Even the solidarity literature, mostly cobbled together in the spirit of Soviet ideology, still partly reflects something of the desperate situation in which workers and intellectuals found themselves in the face of the unstoppably bleeding Spanish Republic. This Spain was not only the country whose freedom had been betrayed by the Western democracies to the fascists, it was also the land of hope, where friendly and courageous people would welcome you, where you could do meaningful work under the Catalan sun and not in the English fog. Finally, since a small part of the facts about the Soviet Union had arrived and could no longer be denied, the project of world revolution also lay in the fog. Barcelona and Madrid supplanted Leningrad and Moscow for a short time until, after the defeat in 1939 and the German invasion of the Soviet Union, everything was back to normal, in some cases to this day. The decision not to go to Spain caused feelings of guilt. The basically banal words of George Orwell, who fought there, were shared by the entire left and a large part of the liberals at the end of the 1930s, they were common knowledge, when one thinks of the cruelty, misery and senselessness of war, the temptation is obvious to say, one side is just as bad as the other. I remain neutral. In reality, however, it is impossible to remain neutral, and there is hardly a war in which it makes no difference who wins. 
one side is almost always more or less in favor of progress, the other side more or less in favor of reaction. It is strange to be confronted with these words by Orwell in 2014 in connection with the civil war in Syria. For in recent years, it seems that the exception in Orwell's rule for armed conflicts has in turn become the rule, and by no means, almost always, but increasingly rarely does one side stand for something better than the competing other. Worse still, for two years now there have once again been international brigades fighting against an anti-progressive, reactionary regime. Thousands of young men from Arab countries and Europe are going to war for the total enslavement of the Syrian people. Often almost entirely on their own, they usually enter Syrian territory via Turkey, whose officials wave them through, and join the transnational jihad, which actually operates in international brigades as opposed to national Syrian militant groups. Compared to the internationalists of Allah, Assad's regime, even in its even more brutal version as a counterinsurgency fighter, does not come off any worse. It is almost impossible to decide between the two on the basis of criteria, if not of progress, then at least of sparing human lives. Only the terrifying vision of a final jihadist victory suggests that there really is something worse than the Ba'ath regime. Over 30,000, probably far more, of these fighters are well equipped and financed and active in Syria. But, to stay with Orwell, what other at least slightly better side against the Ba'ath regime and the internationalists is there? The national Syrian groups that are also fighting against Assad are at least 90% oriented towards radical Sunni Islam and are divided into two factions of roughly equal size, one of which wants a radical Syrian theocracy and the other, which is inspired by the ideas of the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, supposedly a somewhat more moderate variant. Both of their opposition to the internationalists could be summed up in the slogan, Islamism in one country instead of permanent jihadism. Anyone who wants to may see these national jihadists as a lesser evil, because they may not export terror after their victory. However, the majority of these forces are not convinced and are therefore often only half-heartedly involved in armed conflicts with the internationalists. The regime's troops appear to be even more reluctant to do so. The regime is not entirely unrealistically betting that local Islamists will not be able to find a balance with their foreign competitors if only to preserve their sinecures, and that the Islamist resistance will therefore tear itself apart. In view of the increasing Islamist radicalization of the Syrian armed opposition, Western voices calling for support for opposition groups with weapons and trainers or for a no-fly zone to give them a decisive advantage have become quieter in the second half of 2013. No one is able to say any more into which hands arms supplies will end up and against whom they will ultimately be used. The only thing left for Realpolitik to do is to try to keep events as limited as possible to Syria and at the same time prevent one of the three parties from gaining the upper hand in the civil war and then creating facts for the whole country. As it is unlikely that the Assad regime will be able to fully win the civil war, Syria's future is already sealed. Either there will be a country possibly reduced by the Kurdish provinces, in which Sunni Islamist and non-Sunni provinces dominated by Ba'ath cadres will be united under a central government that is barely capable of acting after population transfers have taken place, or Alevites and Christians will be defeated, murdered and expelled with the Ba'ath power or tolerated as disenfranchised minorities in a Sunni theocracy, which would have to conclude an always fragile separate peace with the internationalists. This theocracy, in turn, could develop into an authoritarian and reasonably stable state or, like the Taliban's Afghanistan, into a gangland that is almost impossible to control, and at the same time a staging area for the fighters of the global jihad. Freedom for Syria, as called for in the appeal, is therefore not up for debate, if only because there were and are not nearly enough supporters in Syria, neither in 2011 nor in 2014, to help it achieve a breakthrough through military and logistical assistance from outside. The blame for these bleak prospects has long been apportioned. The West is always to blame, with various justifications. Syrian national Islamists accuse the West of supporting Assad and the internationalists because it supplies them with no weapons, too few or not enough effective weapons. Assad blames the West for the spread of terrorism, due to the supply of weapons and logistical support for his enemies, and in Europe people are already thinking retrospectively about the latest point at which the West should have intervened on the side of a freedom movement that has since been worn down due to its procrastination. 
Contrary to all evidence, people are certain that there was initially a peaceful protest against the dictatorship in 2011, the aims of which are equated with their own hopes for the establishment of a democratic republic. The only thing that is true about this is that at the time, all those involved were protesting against the Ba'ath regime with good reason. The fact that only a tiny minority, but one that was courageously at the forefront, really stood up for a free and united Syria, while the overwhelming majority, even then, wanted a theocratic state of Sunni Arabs and not only wanted to settle accounts with Assad and his followers, but also with all minorities living reasonably unchallenged under the old regime, i.e. The Alevites, Christians, Shiites and Druze, this truth about the Syrian civil war was beyond any Western imagination. Accordingly, there are no democratic rebel factions in the Syrian civil war that would fight for a better Syria, as the appeal suggests. There remains one possible exception in the almost indiscriminate horror, and that is the Syrian Kurds, who have come closer to realizing their long-cherished dream of a separate state. Only they are fighting convincingly against the Islamists of various stripes, if only to control their own settlement area, which has been largely spared from the war thanks to an informal but mutually beneficial non-aggression pact with the Assad regime. Only by protecting it from Assad's bombardments are they militarily in a position to stand up to the Islamists, who are by definition hostile to the Kurds because they are all Sunni Arabs. The appeal focuses on this option, because what can the sentence, every donation helps the groups to defend their territories and create places that enable survival beyond barbarism and thus keep the ideas of freedom and individual happiness alive, mean other than solidarity with the Syrian Kurds. The Kurd struggle is only an option in the Syrian civil war insofar as they are very understandably closest to themselves due to a lack of allies. If they succeed in proclaiming and maintaining their own state along the lines of the Iraqi Kurdish model, this would certainly only help the Kurdish inhabitants, but there is no alternative for the whole of Syria. This also highlights the difference to the Spanish Civil War. Not only in the eyes of its supporters did Republican Spain fight united for a cause with the intention of humanity against an enemy of humanity. The jealousies between Basques, Catalans, etc., which can hardly be absorbed today, were at least silenced at that time, because there could only be a victory on the side of all Spaniards and this victory would not only have been more than a Basque, Catalan, etc. victory, but also a sign that would have pointed beyond a liberated Spain. It is doubtful that the Spaniards were aware of this, but the appearance of the international brigades showed them that their front was not just a Spanish one. The Syrian Kurds cannot be blamed for not taking such a stand. As a very particular group, they probably stand for the establishment of their small province according to criteria that are friendly by Syrian standards. Perhaps it will even be them who, as is becoming apparent in northern Iraq, could be an example for an entire region in Arabia that something other than Islamism or Arab nationalism with its state monstrosities is possible. But this is merely a possible effect and neither a Kurdish program nor a sign from the spirit of the world. Given the lack of any hope for a pacified, multi-ethnic and multi-religious Syrian republic, there is nothing to be said against standing up for the few who are armed and striving for separation from Syria. If they were serious about this, without falling into the glorification of the Kurdish people that was so popular in the 1980s, a corresponding intervention would also be an incitement to a debate on internationalism. The callers did not want to face up to this because they know very well that calling for or approving of one or soon perhaps even several Kurdish states does not fit in with the usual thinking of other Democrats, which is always full of ominous historical philosophy. There are plenty of reasons to mistrust the Kurdish option. A state territory that is designated according to the traditional, but not necessarily real, settlement areas of a very specific group, a population entitled to autonomy that defines itself strictly ethnically according to ethnicity, i.e. possibly also against unwanted settlers, a society that is actually a pre-society organized according to tribes and clans. These are just as little the dreams of a world revolutionary as those of an avowed republican. Not even addressing such limitations, not offensively justifying one's own nevertheless sensible proposal, reflects embarrassingly on the authors of the appeal and its 300 or so signatories. They have made a pact with the world spirit, which, ever since the Soviet Union became recognizable as a completely authoritarian project, i.e. even before 1936, has meant making no distinction between progress and terror. Even with the slogan, the democratic opposition in Syria needs your support, they have not done the Syrian Kurds any good. 
All the adventurers of the European establishment, be they politicians or honorary political advisors such as the tireless Bernard Henri Levy, are constantly reinventing a democratic opposition for the whole of Syria and listen devoutly to the corresponding declarations of Muslim brothers struggling for democratic form, who hold high positions in committees held either by Turkey or Qatar. In order to see their dream of a final triumph over the Assad regime on the side of Sunni Islamism realized. After all, a decision by the West in favor of one of the resistance groups operating in Syria against Assad, as the callers themselves know best, would automatically increase the pressure on Kurdish autonomous regions. However, the fear of being labeled a collaborator of the Assad regime or an essentially Islamophobic traitor to the promises of an Arabellion apparently weighs so heavily that the memory of the Spanish Republicans betrayed by Europe is invoked for reinsurance purposes with a coercive, it's up to us, in order to be seen as part of a large European coalition of the willing. It should be noted, even the few Druze, a minority always viewed with suspicion by organized Islam and terrorized off and on, who settle on the Syrian side of the Golan and are preparing with village guards to fend off the imminent invasion of the Syrian freedom movement with no prospect of success, are not to be wished a united Syria. It would be their downfall. After the collapse of Syria, only Israel would come into consideration as a protective power for them, where Syrian Druze already live in autonomy on the other side of the Golan in 1967. Around three weeks after the start of the Turkish Operation Peace Spring against the territory of the Democratic Union Party, PYD, and its People's Defense Units, YPG, a Pentagon spokesperson announced at the end of October 2019 that, contrary to the planned complete withdrawal, a small number of U.S. troops would remain in northern Syria to protect oil fields from IS and other destabilizing actors. If the world of anti-imperialism were still in order, this withdrawal from withdrawal Tejaspiegel, should have elicited the well-known slogan, No Blood for Oil. This did not happen because the consequence would have been to emphasize the immediate withdrawal of U.S. troops from northern Syria. This time, there was cross-party agreement in Germany to demand the strongest possible presence of U.S. troops in the region instead of their withdrawal. Only the FAZ, in a touch of traditional anti-Americanism, wanted to recognize Donald Trump's intention to have oil fields guarded by his military-like spoils of war, in the Pentagon's announcement, July 11, 2019. However, the newspaper for Germany has also long since taken the general line that the withdrawal of American troops should be rejected as a betrayal of the Kurds in particular and the West in general. Trump's withdrawal policy contains a message that extends far beyond the Middle East, America no longer reacts when it is directly attacked, Iran. It does not retaliate when allies are attacked, Saudi Arabia. And it abandons loyal allies, even if they have just fought for the common cause with heavy losses, Kurds, October 19, 2019. In fact, it is striking that Donald Trump hardly plays the military card even in his Twitter threats and mainly relies on sanctions. Although the military strength of the United States is always in the background as a threatening backdrop, the self-proclaimed anti-Obama president's withdrawal plans follow in the footsteps of his predecessor much more closely than the proclamation of America first or the termination of the nuclear deal with Iran would suggest. Obama's policy of bringing troops home, particularly from Iraq, which he saw as a distancing from the neoconservative 9-11 doctrine of George W. Bush, was a decisive prerequisite for the advance of IS in northern Iraq and thus for the emergence of the Islamic State in the first place. Obama's rejection of the failed neoconservative idea of triggering a democratic domino effect in the Middle East through a militarily enforced regime change in Iraq was also the main motive for the multilateral nuclear deal with Iran, which was supposed to lead to a balance between Sunnis and Shiites based on mutual conventional deterrence. Obama's foreign policy was based on five pillars, ending the war in Iraq as quickly as possible, ending the fight against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban as quickly as possible, securing all nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons-grade material from terrorists and states such as Iran, increasing national energy security through more domestic gas and oil production and promoting multilateralism. At the beginning of 2012, a defense strategy was adopted that focused not only on cuts to the defense budget. In future, the armed forces were no longer to carry out large-scale, sustained stabilization operations, and instead special units were to carry out smaller, time-limited operations, Die Zeit, June 1, 2012. 
One consequence of this new strategy was the significant increase in targeted drone attacks on Islamists and Obama's inconsequential announcement that the use of poison gas in Syria meant crossing a red line. With regard to Syria, which has been rocked by a Sunni uprising, the new defense strategy meant abandoning a major troop presence from the outset, even though the U.S. had set the goal of toppling Assad. Instead of deploying its own troops, local military units were to be supported in overthrowing the Assad regime, while at the same time leading the fight against IS and thus also providing the ground troops for the anti-IS alliance forged by Obama, an alliance that formally included the Arab League and Turkey alongside numerous Western countries. As the Islamist sentiments of almost all the forces fighting against Assad on the ground meant that they were not allowed to participate, the idea was to set up their own force, which was initially mainly made up of deserters from Assad's army under the name Free Syrian Army, FSA. By 2015 at the latest, this loose fighting unit had been disbanded and the name became vacant. However, the establishment of the new FSA, which was also supposed to fight IS on the ground, turned into a disaster. According to American sources, not even half a dozen of the planned 5,400 fighters were recruited. In the absence of alternatives, cooperation with the Kurdish People's Defense Units, the YPG, began in autumn 2015, under whose leadership the Syrian Democratic Forces, SDF, were established, to which a small number of Arab Sunnis, Assyrians and Arameans also belong. In October 2015, Obama sent the first 50 U.S. military personnel to the areas controlled by the YPG in northern Syria as trainers for the fight against IS. Under Trump, the number of U.S. forces increased to around 2,000 soldiers by 2018. At the end of the same year, he announced the complete withdrawal of all U.S. troops from Syria and their having in Afghanistan, stating that IS was largely defeated and that the United States could no longer be the world's policeman. Even then, it was considered certain that Trump's announcement in Syria was due to Turkish pressure to end the alliance with the YPG and clear the way for a security zone along the Turkish border in which neither the YPG nor the Kurdish cadre party PYD would be present. In response to this announcement, Secretary of Defense Mattis resigned, agreeing with Trump in his explanatory letter that the United States armed forces should not be the world's policemen, but that the country should remain the indispensable nation. He added that, not least for this reason, we must show respect for our allies and successfully lead our alliances. At the same time, Brett McGurk also resigned from his position as special representative for the anti-IS alliance, which he had already held under Obama. McGurk, who had already sharply criticized the de facto approval of the Turkish invasion of northern Syria in October 2019, was shocked by Trump's withdrawal announcement. However, he repeatedly pointed out that the presence of U.S. troops in northern Syria was never intended to be permanent, meaning that the alleged betrayal of the Kurds never took place. Throughout, the strategy has focused on enabling local fighters to retake their cities from IS and then creating the conditions for the return of the displaced. From the outset, the strategy also assumed that the United States would remain active in the region for some time after the destruction of the caliphate, including on the ground in northeastern Syria, where some 2,000 U.S. special forces are holding together a coalition of 60,000 Syrian fighters known as the Syrian Democratic Forces, or SDF. From the outset, U.S. diplomats made it clear that this would not be an overt nation-building or Middle Eastern transformation campaign. The goal was to destroy IS and help the local population organize their own affairs after the group's defeat. In short, the U.S. campaign against IS is not and never was an endless war, as Trump condemned in his State of the Union address in February 2019. It was designed from the beginning to keep the United States out of costly entanglements that Trump rightly condemns. These lines come from an article by McGurk that appeared under the title Hard Truths in Syria in the influential journal Foreign Affairs. In the article, which was published in April 2019, the author not only provided ample justification for the fact that Donald Trump had changed the previous temporary Syria strategy with his withdrawal plans, he also derived inevitable consequences for the USA's future Syria policy from this change. He also referred to the dissent that led John Bolton, who is often referred to as one of the architects of the Iraq War, to resign as Trump's security advisor. Bolton had called for a U.S. military presence until all Iranian forces had left Syria and the country's civil war had ended, which McGurk dismissed as hollow saber-rattling. For McGurk, Trump's change in strategy had consequences, which he called hard truths, 
the first is that Assad is not going anywhere. He is a mass murderer and a war criminal, but at this late stage there is no chance that the US or anyone else will remove him from power. Washington doesn't have to accept Assad's rule or engage with his regime, but it should no longer diminish US credibility and prestige by insisting that he must go. A second, related truth is that Arab states will now once again cooperate with Damascus. Washington's resistance to this trend will only frustrate the Arab states and encourage them to conduct their diplomacy behind Washington's back. Finally, the US must recognize that Russia is now the main broker in Syria. Washington has no relationship with Damascus or Tehran, so it must work with Moscow to get anything done. Russia and the US have some overlapping interests in Syria, both want the country to maintain its territorial integrity and not provide safe haven to IS and Al-Qaeda, and both have close ties to Israel. The Syria crisis cannot be resolved without direct engagement between Moscow and Washington, and the US should isolate the Syria issue from other aspects of its troubled and controversial relationship with Russia. Quote, end. There is nothing to suggest that Donald Trump did not recognize these truths. However, there was another one that the ex-special envoy for the anti-IS alliance also stated that he did not want to accept, the US must also accept that Turkey, although an ally of the alliance, is not an effective partner. US diplomats continue to hope that by working with Turkey in Syria, they can break Ankara's drift toward authoritarianism and a foreign policy that runs counter to US interests. Quote, end. McGurk's call not to give in to Turkey's claim to northern Syria resonated with the president, Ankara should be made aware that a Turkish attack on the SDF, even after the US withdrawal, will have serious consequences for the US-Turkey relationship. Quote, end. Apart from the president's loudmouth Twitter announcement that he would completely destroy and wipe out Turkey's economy, there was no sign of any consequences for Turkey after Erdogan's Operation Peace Spring. This is all the more outrageous when you consider that Trump is certainly aware of the role Turkey has played in the anti-IS alliance, summarized by McGurk as follows, in 2014 and 2015, Obama repeatedly called on Erdogan to control Turkey's border with Syria, through which IS fighters and material were flowing freely. Erdogan did nothing. In 2014, Turkey rejected efforts by the anti-IS alliance to protect the predominantly Kurdish town of Kobane in northern Syria from a massive IS attack. Six months later, Turkey rejected alliance requests to close crossings in towns that had become logistical hubs for IS, even after US diplomats told the Turks that it would be impossible to defeat IS if they did not control their borders. In the face of Turkey's intransigence, the United States began working more closely with the Syrian Kurdish fighters, known as the YPG, who had been defending Cobain. Although Washington never identified instances of YPG members crossing the border to fight in Turkey, nor found evidence that the PKK had operational control of the SDF or that US weapons were entering Turkey, US policymakers sought to address Ankara's concerns. The United States limited its military aid to the SDF so that its fighters went into battle without protective vests or helmets and with only limited anti-mine equipment. Washington even sent its best military strategists to Ankara, where they worked out a plan to liberate Raqqa with fighters from the Turkish-backed Syrian opposition. In the end, it became clear that a joint plan with Turkey would require up to 20,000 US troops on the ground. Both Obama and Trump rejected this option, and in May 2017 Trump decided to arm the PYG directly to ensure they could take Raqqa. While the PKK may not have played as restrained a role in the Rojava project as portrayed, this does not change the fact that Turkey is partly responsible for the fact that the US had to rely on the YPG in the absence of alternatives. Since then, US officials have either denied or downplayed the ideological congruence and extensive personal union between the PYD and the PKK, much to Turkey's annoyance. The most recent proof of Turkey's lax anti-IS stance is the operation to liquidate the IS Caliph al-Baghdadi at the end of October 2019, who was tracked down in the area around Idlib of all places, where the Turks, in agreement with the Russians, act as the protecting power of the Islamists, who are often referred to as rebels, in this country. Significantly, it was Kurdish and Iraqi intelligence sources, but certainly not Turkish ones, that played a decisive role in tracking down al-Baghdadi. The only legitimization of Turkish security interests is that northern Syria has always been a quiet PKK hinterland, from which attacks on Turkish territory have repeatedly been launched in the past. Since 2011, 
when the civil war began, the northern Syrian Kurds, who had remained neutral in the Syrian war at Abdullah Akhalan's behest, have succeeded in successively expanding their territory far beyond traditional Kurdish Syrian territory and creating a state-like entity based on democratic confederalism in line with PKK ideology. Under the leadership of the PYD, the YPG sees itself as waging a mixture of war of conquest and liberation, which the commander of the YPG, Maslam Abdi, who is also a senior PKK official, has described as our war, because the jihad terrorists of the Islamic State have occupied our land, plundered our villages, killed our children and enslaved our women. The Kurds have never seen themselves as subjects of the Americans, nor did the Americans assume this. What the FAZ reported on October 16, 2019 about the views of Brett McGurk's successor can therefore still be considered consensual for American policy beyond all differences, while Washington valued the Kurds as allies in the fight against IS, it did not want to support their ambitions for their own state. And that was no secret. The American special envoy to Syria, James Jeffrey, for example, has explained this time and again. At the end of May, he told the Foreign Affairs Committee of the House of Representatives about the Kurdish allies, we have no political future to offer them. The future that America is offering, Jeffrey continued, lies in a peaceful and democratic Syria. Anyone who still shares the thesis that the USA has betrayed the Kurds should take note that the Americans have not abandoned the Kurds, but the supporters of a certain ideological current among them, who have been busy expanding their territorial influence in the slipstream of the fight against IS. It is not only in the case of Cobain, which is of little strategic military importance, that the Kurds have gladly allowed the Americans to save their ideological flagship projects from certain doom. The establishment of a Kurdish pseudo-state on the Turkish border is the weak point of the US strategy, which Turkey so persistently criticizes, because the Americans were actually unwillingly at the service of a certain current that poses a threat to Turkey. In other words, the PKK's Rojava project, celebrated by so many as particularly emancipatory, is only supported by the fact that there is currently hardly anything better to be found in the Islamized region than this ethnic Kurdish project. The Operation Peace Spring was not an outright victory for Turkey, but thanks to Donald Trump it got what it wanted without sanctions, a PKK-free security zone along its border guaranteed by the Russians and Americans, including population exchange, the expulsion of Kurds and Christians in favor of the settlement of Sunni jihadists. The PYD and its people's defense units are now indirectly under Assad's command, meaning that their dream of ethnic autonomy in a nationally liberated zone is probably over. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, who is actually considered loyal, criticized Trump's decision to withdraw troops, saying that it represented the pre-9-11 mentality that paved the way for 9-11, what happens in Afghanistan is none of our business. Trump countered with the stereotypical response that Graham wants to stay in the Middle East for the next 1,000 years to fight other people's wars. He himself wants out of there. The bitter experiences of the USA in Afghanistan and Iraq make Graham's criticism vulnerable, but he has addressed the obsessive nature of Trump's thinking. Brett McGurk summed it up as follows, he doesn't want to be there. He doesn't want to be in Syria. He's very clear and consequent in that regard. With this stance, Trump is undermining his own national security strategy adopted in 2017, which states for the Middle East, the United States has learned that neither aspirations for democratic transformation nor disengagement can protect us from the problems of the region. We must be realistic about our expectations for the region without allowing pessimism to obscure our interests or visions for a modern Middle East. This new U.S. realism, which ultimately only continues what was started under Obama, is also expressed in an Iran policy that marks a break with the policy of Trump's predecessor in terms of form, but is far removed from the idea of regime change in substance. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo expressed this in his Berlin speech on the occasion of the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, it was only a matter of urging the revolutionary regime in Tehran to return to the negotiating table and do something very simple, namely behave like a normal country. Europe does not even want this, which says everything about the civilization-weary state of this community of states. Israel, on the other hand, is well advised to continue to rely only on itself, even, or rather, especially, under a particularly pro-Israel Donald Trump and his modest Iran ambitions. The fact that the United States has given up its claim to be the world's policeman is not, in itself, lamentable. 
The tragedy lies in the associated renunciation of the claim to preserve what the West should stand for as a global regulatory power with world standing, if it were to be determined what the emissaries of the West should convey spiritually, who deal primarily with average tribal people, I believe nothing better could be wished for than the image of the man who has his own judgment, respects the man in everyone else, hates injustice and subjugation, the gesture of freedom.